What makes you a Star Wars fan? Is it the way the stories make you feel? Is it how you connect with the characters? No matter how you answered, you're in the right place. Star Wars Celebration 2023 is finally here. Hello there at Star Wars Celebration! This weekend, London is the center of the Star Wars galaxy for a blowout bash celebrating not just Star Wars, but the fandom itself. Everybody's here for one reason, and that's because of your passion and your love for Star Wars. And we're here to honor you. I love you! The best fans in the galaxy with an inside look at the greatest event in all of Star Wars fandom, live from our stage on the show floor. This is where the fun begins. Yeah! You want panels? Who here wants to see a teaser trailer? We got you. We just experienced the Mandalorian. You want special guests? I think I cried four times. Oh, too cool. We got you. Here in a Star Wars. You want never before seen reveals? We heard the crowd go crazy, so we ran. You better believe we got you. You brought me a world exclusive? So sit back, relax, and pour yourself some blue milk. You never know who might show up or what might happen. This is the way to day two of Star Wars Celebration Live 2023. Celebration Europe. I'm Anthony Carboni. And I'm Christina Ariel. And I'm Kristen Baver. What up, London? Oh, they sound excited. How you both feeling? Did you have fun yesterday? Yeah. I mean, okay, I saw so much cool stuff yesterday and so many cool costumes. I'm very excited about it and being back. And just, oh my gosh, we're at Star Wars Celebration. I know. I know. Yes, we are. And there were already so many amazing guests yesterday. We had Tony Gilroy and Diego Luna up on the stage at the same time. Yes. It was wonderful to have so many people from Andor drop by, people from the Acolyte drop by, and of yes. course, we have more of that for you today. Very exciting. Yes. Highlight for me yesterday, I got to talk to Mon Mothma. <laughs> and I mean, listen, I, I had a great time, uh, but if I'm being honest, if you all could quiet down just a little bit, because me and Gil were out a little too late last night, that's why he's not here. Doing what? I don't know, just like London stuff. What kind of London stuff? I don't know, just like, just like simple legal London stuff. It was all above board. You're not going to tell us, are you? How do you bail a droid out of jail in the UK? <laughs> a lot of credits. All right. Well, now that we feel completely left out, Cam, help me out. How's the crowd out there today? Hey, hey, hey. Welcome to day two of Star Wars Celebration. I'm Cam, your hype guy, here with my favorite people right here, the extended Star Wars family. Who's excited for day two? I am as well. After an exciting day one, we are back to bring all of the excitement to all of you watching at home on YouTube and on StarWars.com. Look at all the fantastic fans out here coming to you from across the globe. That's right, the continents are represented here. Hi, what's your name? Hi, it's Abby. Abby, where are you from? Um, I'm from Wales. You're from Wales, I love that. How does it feel to have Star Wars Celebration so close to home? Amazing. Is this your first one? Yeah, this is the first one. And who are you hoping to see today? Hayden Christensen. Hayden Christensen. <laughs> All right. And look over here, even some more amazing cosplay. Hi, what are your names? Megan. Megan and? Emily. And Emily, where are you from? I'm from Lancashire. You're from Lancashire, wonderful, and? I'm from London. You're from London, that's right. <laughs> England is well represented, as I was saying, along with so many other places around the world. And you folks are in the best seat in the house because we're bringing it all to you. So feel free to connect with us through our hashtag, 
Yes, SWC 2023, we want to see all of the excitement you're feeling at home because we're going to be reading it and giving it all right back to you. Back to you guys on stage. Thank you, Cam. Oh, my goodness, it's looking like a party down there. Do not forget, all weekend long, you can party with us on the hashtag that Cam was just telling you about. Remember, that's Yes SWC 2023. That's right, all weekend long, we'll be featuring your thoughts and excitement on our ticker. And we've got polls too. In fact, head on over to at Star Wars on Twitter right now and tell us what would you rather catch a ride on? A, Blurk, B, Eopi, C, Tauntaun, or D, Abantha. <laughs> Vote now at Star Wars on Twitter. We'll be back later today with the results in a brand new poll. And with that, let's officially start the day. Sounds like a plan. We will be right back with all sorts of guests, surprises, and panels, so stick around. You never know what'll happen or who's gonna swing by our stage here at Star Wars Celebration Live, presented by Star Wars Jedi Survivor. Don't go anywhere. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> Welcome to the Hasbro stand here at Star Wars Celebration Europe. This is Patrick from the Hasbro marketing team. I do have Who's this? So this is Wild Ride and Grogu. Uh, this came out last fall, so he's in stores right now. This is the first Grogu we've ever done who interacts with the Pram, who we know is his main form of uh, movement, of uh, travel. Uh, so he's animatronic, he's got motors uh, in the figure itself, and he interacts different ways, whether he's in the Pram or out. So a lot of fun. And again, available right now. And as you said, the first animatronic uh, of this kind, which is pretty exciting. Okay, that's one. Yep. What do we go next? Up next, we've got uh, going from the higher end to our uh, collectibles. This is Bounty Collection Grogu. So we've got a whole assortment of these uh, here in the booth. Uh, these are collectibles. We've done you know 20 or 30 of these at this point, celebrating all of these adorable, iconic moments that Grogu goes through in now going on you know four seasons of The Mandalorian and Book of Boba Fett. And there is one more, yes, uh, is Grogu, one more. Uh, new Grogu here at Celebration. Let's uh, talk about it. Absolutely. So this is Mix and Moods Grogu. He was just revealed earlier this week, uh, worked on by our team. Uh, he's the first Grogu we've done who can uh, really kind of mix his moods up and match your mood. So he has 20 plus different posable expressions. His eyes articulate, you can see here. His mouth articulates, his ears. Uh, head, arms, so you can put him in whatever mood fits your mood. So, you know, you've got sleeping Grogu here. You can have sad Grogu, happy Grogu, whatever mood strikes your fancy. And he can even hold your hair comb, exactly. according to one of the images. Exactly, that. yeah, exactly. Uh, thank you, Patrick, Absolutely. for talking thank to you. us. And uh, we've got a lot more to come from Star Wars Celebration Live, so don't you go anywhere. guest has been a staple in your film collections. From Indiana Jones to Star Wars and every major blockbuster in between, we promise you'll recognize our next guest. It's the president of Lucasfilm, Kathleen Kennedy. <laughs> So much oh, for joining this us. Great. Really this is great. Everybody looks so good. I walked the floor this morning. I saw all the cool stuff. I didn't have enough time to go back and buy things, but I will. So it is just a sea of fun. people. Sea of people. Sea of people. Did you guys watch some of the Ahsoka panel? Cool, huh? Great reveal. Great reveal. Fantastic. Now, I know this is Star Wars Celebration, but my first question is actually about Indiana Jones, if we'll allow it. <laughs> For 
for you personally, having been a part of Indiana Jones from the beginning, what has this 40 plus year journey been like for you? You know, it's actually, and I think you guys remember how emotional that Harrison got when he was talking about this. It's pretty amazing when you're involved in something that spanned this amount of time. And I think what you'll see is the minute this movie starts, you're gonna feel like you were thrown right back in time. I mean, it is 100% an Indiana Jones movie, and that's how it felt every minute we were making it. So, very exciting. Very awesome. We're, I'm so excited. I know everyone here is very excited for Indy as well. But let's talk about Star Wars, because it is Star Wars celebration. That's what we're here for. Star Wars storytelling has really evolved a lot in the last decade. To you, what makes a great Star Wars story? What makes what, sorry? What makes a great Star Wars story? Oh, gosh, I think there's many things that make a great Star Wars story. You know, the incredible thing that George left us was a, a, a amazing mythology. And it's very expansive, and it has meaning. That was the thing that George said to me over and over again, is whatever you do, make sure it has meaning. And I think that's what resonates with so many of us who love Star Wars, is it makes you feel something. And that's what we try to do with every single story we tell, is we're just trying to create characters that people can relate to and you have some connection to. And when you look out at these cosplays, I think we can say a lot of people have a, a deep, deep connection to some of those characters. They, they want to walk around all day in those costumes. They want to bring them to life from animation. Uh, but you're also evolving the Star Wars storytelling quite a bit. When you're developing new talent to bring into the fold, can you tell us, can you quantify what you look for? You know, I look for people who have something to say. That's the first thing, is when somebody comes in, they have a love of Star Wars, but the second question is, what do you have to say? What are you trying to say in your storytelling? What's important to you? I often find that I'm sitting, I'm talking to people about things that really personally affected them. And they bring that to the character and to the stories, much like you're hearing Dave talk about his experiences in evolving the animation he did with Clone Wars, what he's bringing to Ahsoka and how much it means to him personally. And I think that that's the most important thing with any of the filmmakers we're working with is to try to excavate that. I appreciate that one clap for Dave and then thought that we're gonna respectfully listen to the rest of the answer and then everybody clapping. That was good. Uh, of all the moments you've spent in Lucasfilm, what are some of your favorite tiny, just looking around and feeling like life is good moments? Celebration is one for me. When I look around here, I think life is good. Life is very good. But, but what is it for you, Kathy? You know, I have to say it is celebration. I mean, I remember when I first started this job, George said to me, you haven't been to a celebration yet, have you? And I said, no. And he said, well, you're about to go. And my first celebration was in Essen, Germany. And it was spectacular. I mean, every moment that I walked around when I first ended up on the stage talking to Warwick, who was interviewing me, the whole thing was just surreal. And now it's become something I look forward to. And I know you guys too, and it's, it's incredible to be able to share this with all of you. Now, for the past few years, Star Wars has been primarily on in TV series form, on Disney Plus streaming. We've, of course, had an embarrassment of riches with The Mandalorian, Obi-Wan Kenobi, Andor, all of the animation. Uh, but there was some big news yesterday at the end of the Lucasfilm Showcase panel. Um, we're making, in case you haven't heard, we're, we're making the jump back to movie screens. There were some amazing guests yesterday, but one of the, the surprise guests for me was our own Daisy Ridley. A, a 
a pretty fantastic moment. So, Kathy, I'm curious, why is it important to you to make that jump while continuing with series, but to make that jump back to the big screen? You know, what was great for us in many ways um, is when Disney announced that they were going to move into streaming, to be perfectly honest, none of us really knew what that meant. I mean, I, I, I'd never done a lot of television. John Favreau had never done a lot of television. He and I were talking about The Mandalorian early on, but at the time, a lot of our discussions were around doing movies. And then obviously, the world shut down with the pandemic. So our focus became on television. And what was interesting for all of us at Lucasfilm is we realized what an amazing opportunity to experiment and explore different stories and to do things that we might not necessarily have done in the movie space right away. Because the inclination would have been to just carry on with the saga and not necessarily move in these different directions. And what this has ended up doing, it's, it's created this rich landscape for us now to have new characters that we've developed that we can now look at moving into the movie space. And we can do this thoughtfully, and we can do this in a way that I think we can eventize stories again. And isn't that the most important thing in the movie theater? You want to feel like they're seeing something yeah. huge. So that's what we want to do, and we're, we're as excited as you are to be heading back to the big screen. I don't want to speak for the crowd, but I think they cannot wait. We're so excited to have you here. We're so excited to be back at Star Wars Celebration Europe today, and we know you're extremely busy, so we will let you get back to all of the amazing things that you're working on. Well, thanks, and have a great rest of the weekend. Yes. Thank, you, Thank guys. you so much, Kathy. We literally couldn't do what we're doing without you. Stick around for more Star Wars Celebration Live from London. It's coming up in a moment. Something's coming. Something dark. I sense it. This is a new beginning. For some, war. For others, power. It's been a while. Things have changed. I started hearing whispers about Thrawn's return. heir to the Empire. We have to prepare for the worst. The Jedi fell a long time ago. There aren't many left. it is time to begin again. there were some people here that could tell us something about that trailer. If only we had some people backstage right now that could tell us a little bit about the trailer we just saw. Like say like two people who back in 2008 were just like randomly working on stuff out of Skywalker Ranch, wound up meeting each other, talking, finding out they had a lot in common and I don't know, sort of 
creating an entire television world for Star Wars? Maybe we have some people like that. You've seen them on multiple panels throughout the weekend, but now they're here on our stage to talk about all things Star Wars. You know them, you love them. It's John Favreau and Dave Filoni. Today, lukewarm crowd. <laughs> oh, wow, there's a lot more people here than I ever thought <laughs> would be on the other side of that door. That's right, that's right, that's Trapper Wolf on stage right now. What kind of a partner is Trapper Wolf sending Carson off by himself all the time? Come on. Smart. <laughs> I stayed at home. I had a lot of things to do. Deb and Rick and I were talking about stuff. <laughs> Paul can go off and do that. You know, that's, that's his job. Well, we saw, we saw you in the, uh, in the lounge there, in the employee lounge. I gotta know, it looked like, that looked like it was one of your hats, but does that, is that now Disney archival property, that hat? No, it's not <laughs> one of my hats. Actually, uh, Shauna, our customer, they made that hat for me special. <laughs> so it's a unique hat that I actually don't have. You are right, they have it somewhere in the costume shop. Does that bug you? It, I, <laughs> you know, I got the jacket, so I can't really complain. We all got to keep our pilot jackets. Oh, wow. That season, that was kind of the deal to get us back. Because we were all like, John, we're really bringing the quality of the show down when we're there in the background. <laughs> he really enjoys it, so we got to keep the leather jackets. I stopped just short of putting my dog in it. I wanted to bring Wolfie along and put him in the shot, but I thought it'd be terrible continuity between takes, so we left him out, but yeah. One day. One day we'll get that dog in there. Do you I have, got other wolves. Do you, so. have any, do you have any Paz stuff at home? No, I have... Um, maybe a, maybe a mug that a little... says number two dad? No, no, the one... <laughs> The one I like is the uh, the chainmail but Beskar shirt. Yes, I have I have that, and I have a that where that went. You have that, uh, yeah, yeah. and I have a, a dark dark saber too. I have one of one of them. That's that's impressive. And, and a bunch of pop vinyls too. Those yes. are over there. Yes. They, they have some cool stuff, by the way. They, they got some great yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk. I mean, first of all. Mando season three. You did a little watch along party for people who were here last night of the latest episode. It has been so fun to watch the evolution of the show, the explorations of genre. I love that we got a buddy cop episode, you know, a procedural. I love that, you, that you're exploring this space. How has the show kind of changed for y'all? And, and, you know, how do you kind of work that experimentation into it? Well, well the big change is that we went from a very uh, first-person, ground-level adventure with new characters and new planets, slowly working our way into weaving ourselves into the fabric of Star Wars more as we introduce some legacy characters into the second season. And now with Ahsoka coming out in August, we have a lot of, we're in the same time period. So there's a lot of coordination as to what's happening within that time period. And so we try to keep and preserve the, the, you know, the personality of what the show originally was, but every once in a while, 
the, gal the greater galaxy has to uh, uh, rear its head and affect the way things play out. Yes. And talking about that, there was, a, uh, there was a cameo that was particularly special, I think, to a lot of people here and uh, a lot of people that I work with, and that was uh, Jedi Master Keller and Beck. <laughs> Who is, of course, played by the amazing Ahmed Best. Uh, how did the decision to uh, to introduce Kellerin in as as really the the reason we have Grogu? There, there are two two sides to it, really. One is, you know, what Jedi would be appropriate as we go through, as Dave and I always discuss with, as with, as with Luke Skywalker's appearance, who is in play in the galaxy at that moment and what would make the most sense for the story. And we love to pull in elements that's even outside of canon uh, if it's part of what's uh, part of the Star Wars fabric. And the Jedi Temple Challenge, it made perfect sense for that character who looks after the younglings to be uh, w one of the possibilities. But then the other aspect is, who are you going to cast? And I remember on this stage in 2019 in Chicago, when Ahmed Best came out and got the kind of response that all of you gave him, that's when we also realized that not just the character, but the, but the actor, it would make perfect sense for that actor to be the person who got to do that as well. He's wonderful. He's just so wonderful. and he's. He's such a part of the legacy of Star Wars, and it was just wonderful to see him there. It was a, it was a great moment. It was yeah. a great we're, moment. We're a show that's made by fans and people, everybody who works on the show uh, has to feel the same way about Star Wars as we do, and so whether it's a cameo, whether it's an appearance of a hero that pops in for one episode, or people working on the, you know, behind the camera, there's a, there's a tremendous amount of excitement, enthusiasm, and. And, and certainly Ahmed has been with Star Wars and been a fan for, for you know, longer than most, yeah. yeah. Uh, and talking about sort of weaving these characters in, I mean, we gotta talk about Ahsoka. We gotta talk about Ahsoka. Because I'll tell you what, if you wanna talk about two moments that, that I've been on this stage that have gotten the largest reaction, one of them, like you said, was Ahmed in 2019, but one of them was yesterday morning right here when these people saw Ahsoka, Sabine and Hera in live action in the same place. And Dave, these are characters that you and the, you and the team at Lucasfilm have been, have, been, have been working on, have been working with for, you know, two decades now. It must be wonderful to, to, to be bringing this show to the screen. Yeah, man, it's emotional. I gotta say, I'm just taking this all in. Yeah. I, I've been to a lot of these. I've never seen so many people, and I'm just like, I'm just looking. <laughs> Literally, I'm just like looking, ah. I get emotional, I'm looking at all your faces and, and all the things you do to make this all possible. And I just, I'm, gonna, I'm trying to like commit it to memory and, and just know that I see you guys and, and the variety of people that we have as Star Wars fans is a part of what makes it so beautiful that you, that you come in costumes or just a t-shirt. I, I love how much you put into it. It means so much to me. Um, I don't wanna, because I get it. Like, I really get it. John gets it. If I wasn't sitting here, I would, I, I swear to God, and people say it, and I think we all know, but I would be out there. I've been out there. I appreciate the effort you make just to be here with us. And just let me say that. And thank you so much for supporting the work that I've been a part of and, and, and through Star Wars all these years and these characters and to have them in live action, it doesn't happen. Uh, you know, without you supporting it for all this time and wanting it, I get to do these great adventures with John and everybody else because of that support, and it's a real privilege. So thank you.
I mean, I think, I think that's something, I think that's something that we all feel. I think that's something that we all feel coming off of everything that, you, that you've all been working on for so long is, uh, we, we know how in touch you are and we know how much it means to you to put forth that effort. And I mean, if, if anything, I feel like Ahsoka, like you're saying, is, is such a show that represents that reciprocal relationship, you know? Because the love for Ahsoka from the well, fans. It's a special time because after Revenge of the Sith, I don't think any of us knew what was going to go on. You know, I, the first time I saw Revenge of the Sith was in the SAG Theater at Skywalker Ranch because George Lucas asked me to watch it because we were prepared to make the Clone Wars. But for a lot of people, Star Wars is over. But if you were a Star Wars fan, you know that we used to have a pin that went around conventions that Star Wars is forever. And, uh, you know, I think that as a group of fans and people, that's really proven true because people wanted it. No, no one, I think, understood that better than George, which is why he made Clone Wars, which was episodic. He saw the future of things and streaming and how we would be able to watch things in, in all these different manners. And it's just grown and grown and grown. And, you know, John was a part of Clone Wars. And so when, when oh. John came with this story to make Mandalorians, I'm like, that makes sense to me. He is a Mandalorian. He's got <laughs> my show. And so I was like, it was perfect. And, you know, and then you look at, I, you guys, if you met Leslie Headland, and she's a massive fan that yes. and I've talked to, and I enjoy talking with her, and her, her, her teaser was phenomenal. I mean, how can you not be excited about Acolyte? It's so and, amazing. And, Tony, Tony Gilroy did a version of The Empire that's like the, it's like the most THX awesome evil thing I've yes. ever seen. Like, and so I love all that and that's inspiring. It, we inspire each other. It's a big collective effort at Lucasfilm and I, th I think it's all building in a great direction. Uh, so it's not just one thing we're doing. I'm glad people like Ahsoka, but there's so much out there. You know, like our friend Deb Chow went and made Obi-Wan. How awesome yes. was that? Yes. There. And I get to watch those shows, which is super cool. So there's yeah. no one dimension of this that's, uh, that's just better than the other. It's just all great, and we love it. And, uh, I mean, look at it. This thing has grown. Yeah. I mean, there's a Tauntaun over there. You believe that? Yeah. How, I mean, we just take that for granted now. Eh, it's Tauntaun. But it's like, <laughs> no, it's really cool. There's no, I feel like I'm on set with the video wall back yeah, there. I and know. The set and the, and the, the oh, my I'm gosh. You, I'm going to let you know. I'm going to let you know that if you push right next to the blast doors, well, we've got this, first of all. Yeah, I'm going to let you a little know too real these that days. if you push that white button when you're on your way out, uh, something's going to happen. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. That's the last button you touch when That's... you sell it that way. <laughs> Something's going to happen. That's all I'm going to say. All right, uh, you're talking, pushing it. But talking about, uh, you know, like you're saying, that building this sort of uh, now, it's, it's always been a connected galaxy, but now sort of bringing it to television and to Disney Plus, and we're seeing the Acolyte, and uh, something that I've been particularly interested in is Skeleton Crew. Uh, yeah, because it just, it feels to me like those big, magical adventure movies that were such a genre in the 80s. You know, like, I feel like, like a Willow, like an Amblin production, you know, like a Goonies, something like that, where it's like, my entire family, we would, we would watch those movies over and over together, and they had a very particular tone, and I feel that tone from Skeleton Crew. Is that, was that a particular thing that yeah, you wanted I to see in it? Yeah, I think that's exactly what John Watts and Chris Ford uh, had pitched, which was, you know, an Amblin movie that starts off from the perspective of what's it like for ordinary people in the suburbs, mm -hmm. in the Star Wars galaxy, and launch them into an adventure. And what I like about it is that, and as George always did, there's a, an, an entryway for younger viewers too, but you have to create a world that still feels like Star Wars and that still feels dangerous and could sit alongside of all the other shows. And so it's just wonderful to see things from different perspectives and Star Wars allows you to do that because the world is so full, so rich, so lived in. You could put the camera anywhere and if, you're, and if you're doing your job, you should be able to look at any, from any angle and feel that same feeling that it's authentically Star Wars. Yeah. Well, it all looks very, very amazing, yeah. <laughs> Obviously, we cannot wait to see more. Obviously, we will have to wait to see more. <laughs> I remember on the panel yesterday, uh, somebody said, yeah, and you're gonna be able to see it soon, and Dave said, not so soon, yeah. not so soon. <laughs>
come right back to work next week. I mean, we got so much editing to do and visual effects, but it's fun. Every day we're looking at that galaxy with a microscope trying to, you know, figure every detail out, and it's 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 very fun. The stuff coming in, uh, you know, ILM's doing great work. Uh, we got great wizards making magic happen, so I'm real excited for you guys to see it. I can't wait. Can't wait. Well, we are excited to see all of it. Thank you so much, John Favreau and Dave Filoni. We've got more from Star Wars Celebration Live in just a moment. Please stay right here. Welcome to the Lego stand here at Star Wars Celebration Live. I'm with Michael from the Lego uh, design team, Star Wars design team to be specific. How's it going, Michael? Yeah, uh, busy day. Uh, lots of incredible guests. Um, we're really pleased to see so much, such a big turnout, so uh, fantastic. Yeah, it seems to be a constantly busy stand and we're just currently in one section of it, the build wall, which is a wall where kids, big and small, are actually encouraged to make a mess on it. A very creative mess, we should Very have. creative mess, yes. Come by and you'll get a plate, eight by eight plate, and a map. And you'll get a, yeah, ask, be asked to map out that exact section of this build. Put it up on the wall and be a part of making this beautiful mur mural. Come back and see what it is. I think you might be able to guess where we're headed with it. But uh, we've got another one on this wall we're gonna do that tomorrow and the next day, so. Come yeah. by and uh, have some fun. Yeah, there's a lot of fun going on here, we can see. I have uh, no guesses here, but yeah, like you said, there might be a few ideas uh, being conjured in one's mind so far as to what's going I on here. I think the keen Star Wars fan will, will know what we're doing here. Yeah, well, speaking of keen Star Wars fans, uh, I am one, and I would, I'm also keen to, to, to get involved, to add to this. So are you, uh, are you a patient man, Michael? I'm a patient man, yeah. Are you willing to, to help me? contribute to this beautiful piece of art. How, how patient do I need to be? Like, uh, three days? <laughs> oh, well, um, I'll come back then. <laughs> okay. All right, we're gonna, we're gonna get to it. We'll see you in three days. Michael, down we go. All right, let's get going. Wow. <laughs> been a lifelong Star Wars fan and now has the unique honor of bringing fans their first look at the High Republic era in live action with the brand new Star Wars series, The Acolyte. Here to talk about it is executive producer, Leslie Headland. Walk. That was fashion show worthy. Yeah, I just try to treat everything as if we're on RuPaul's Drag Race. That's kind of like my... Just, just work the runway, work the runway. You, you worked that runway? I thought, what a tough act to follow. Jon Favreau just discovered our gatekeeper and was marveling at being on Navarro again. And then, here you come. <laughs> and you did it. You did it. You, you understood the assignment. Leslie, so good to have you here. Thank you for having me. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you so much. Now, I'm a big fan of The High Republic. I know you're a big fan of Star Wars The High Republic, but you're the first person to take a stab at bringing The High Republic to life in live action with your show, The Acolyte. What's that been like for you? 
Well, it's so exciting. I mean, as somebody that grew up both with, you know, obviously George's films and then the release of the special editions, like for a long period of time, if you're, I mean, I'm not going to age myself, but <laughs> the, you know, the extended universe and, and a lot of that publishing was really the only Star Wars that I had. And so what I love about the High Republic is that it's kind of in the grand tradition of what Star Wars was for the fans for a really long time, which is, you know, both these kind of high concept, beautifully rendered stories, but at the same time, pulpy action and the kind of stuff that, that we always love and, and adore about Star Wars in the live action. So I wanted to, to get to, ha to have the opportunity to bring both of those things together was so, so exciting to me. So from a narrative standpoint, point that was the case, but I have to also say I really loved the challenge of marrying the, um, uh, the aesthetics of what has already been designed for the High Republic and what the Jedi look like in the High Republic and bridging that gap between who they are then and who they are when we meet them in The Phantom Menace. So that was also very exciting. Awesome. Awesome. Great answer. And this is your first Star Wars celebration, and I believe yesterday you were part of the studio showcase and you got brought to stage by a Wookiee Jedi. I did, I did. <laughs> I, I did get brought on stage by a character I created, a uh, Wookiee Jedi master named Kel Naka, played by Jonas. We all know and love. Um, I couldn't pass up the idea of having a Wookiee Jedi in live action. I just like, as soon as it was established in the High Republic that that was a thing that could happen, I was like, get it in here, let's go, action. Yes, please. We love Wookiees, we love Jedi, you know we're gonna love a Wookiee Jedi. It seems kind of like inevitable, honestly, but yes, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I know something about the Star Wars timeline. The High Republic is so far removed from most of the Star Wars we know. I know you talked about the, that connective tissue of the design elements evolving from where your story is to when we get to The Phantom Menace, but what's different about this era that will surprise fans who maybe haven't discovered The High Republic yet? Maybe they aren't into the books and comics just yet, maybe this is their first step into if that larger If this were your world. first step, I, and I hope, you know, if it were, I hope that I do the fans proud because it is such a beautiful, rich, gorgeous world that people should be um, investing into as fans, especially like, um, again, as a fan myself that grew up with a lot of publishing as opposed to media, because we just didn't have any media the way that we do now. Um, I hope that if you watch The Acolyte, it does inspire you to get further into The High Republic, and the publishing phase one was incredible. I, I think it was just astonishing. I think that one of the things that would be helpful to kind of put in perspective is that we're at the end of that era and moving more into George's era of the uh, the Phantom Menace. So my question became as a fan, um, when I initially pitched the show to Kathleen, which was an original idea with new characters and not connecting it to Skywalker Saga or any of the existing characters in the Hierarch Public, what I wanted in to introduce the fans to the concept too was how do you reconcile the Jedi at the height of their power, the galaxy at the height of this age of enlightenment and peace and who George says they become at the top of the Phantom Menace. And to me, that meant, why don't you tell a story about Star Wars from the perspective of the villains, of the bad guys? And if those bad guys are outnumbered at this point, then that means that you get this opportunity to see how the Jedi very subtly go from who they were in the High Republic and the Old Republic and who they became by the time you're watching episodes one, two, and three. That's awesome. And I can tell from the way you referred to phase one that you are a big Star Wars The High Republic publishing fan. I can tell. Are we, do we have any other Star Wars The High Republic fans in the house? Who are also very excited for the Acolyte? I just have to say, I, it is such an honor to be here. <laughs> like, Star Wars saved my life. Like, like I know that we...
it's like, even it, the, the truth is like, we are so spoiled now with Star Wars media. I, 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 know that, I, I know that it can feel sometimes like, well, I like this thing and I don't like that thing. And, and if you don't like the acolyte, that's fine. It doesn't matter. Like the, the reality is, is that Star Wars in and of itself is not just a vast universe full of many different characters, many different eras, but it is always, always, always about the spiritual, spiritual journey of what it is to become who you are. And, 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 and that's why I'm, that's why I am so, so overwhelmed and grateful to be here and beyond overwhelmed and grateful to be allowed as a filmmaker to experience what it is like to actually tactilely make something in this world. Um, that is beyond my wildest dreams. And I, I can't wait to show you guys more. I wish I could. <laughs> we are still shooting, so I can't. <laughs> we're, we're not done yet, so we don't have enough to show yet. But I, hopefully you will be able to see it soon. So too, and we can all we can tell just how much it means to you, how how deeply connected you are to the Star Wars galaxy. And I just want to say thank you so thank much you. for being here. Thank you for having me. It can be a, a bit overwhelming. It's a huge crowd, but it is a lovely crowd. Star Wars celebration is like a big hug, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for stopping by our stage, bringing light and life to Star Wars, to live action, and there's much more to come from Star Wars Celebration Live. Don't you go anywhere. Welcome back to the floor here at Star Wars Celebration Europe, and I am with Simone from Asmodi. Hello, Simone from Asmodi. Hello, Jamie. How are you? Doing good, thanks. How are you? This is a fantastic day for me. Excellent. I'm glad I contributed. <laughs> so, uh, for anybody that uh, is thinking Asmodi, that's a name I've not heard ever. <laughs> Tell us about it. So. Asmodee is a global game company. We have, if you think of like record labels, different studios. I represent Atomic Mass Games. We make miniatures games, but we're also here with our sister studio, Fantasy Flight, that make cards, um, board games. And we're just here um, to share our love of gaming with everyone. Thank you for doing that. I'm interested to know because it looks amazing, everything that we can see at your stand. It's clearly very popular. There's a lot of people here, but we're living in uh, an increasingly digital-based, app-based world, and what you're doing is very old school, if you don't mind me saying, like actual objects, touching yeah. things. We don't do that anymore. So how do you stand out in this digital world? So I think in this digital world, people are missing that connection with someone across the table. This is a time for you to actually focus on a physical thing, but also the person that you're telling the story with across the board is so important. And we found, especially during the pandemic, people really wanted that experience, especially for miniatures games, because you get to spend this time painting, assembling. So it's both craft and game all in one. So this game in front of us is Shatterpoint. What do we need to know about Shatterpoint? We need to know that this is a skirmish-based miniatures game. Um, if you want to think about those beautiful opening moments of any Clone Wars animated series, and the action is already happening, that is the game for you. Um, these come unassembled and unpainted, so you're going to be able to assemble, paint, and create the Star Wars experience that you desire. And how many people at one time can play? Two people, technically, officially, but, you know, we could share. Okay. I believe that you and I could share. Yeah, well, we'll wrap this piece up and then we'll play, right? Yeah, of course. It's on, Simone from Asmodi. So, Simone, um, if somebody's watching this and thinking, well, this is all well and good, Simone, but I'm not really into your miniatures. I like, I like myself some cards. I like card games. Yeah. Have you got something for that person? I, absolutely. We just launched our sister studio, Fantasy Flight, just launched a new deck building card game. You get to play as the a Rebellion or the Empire, and you're basically trying to destroy each other's bases. Mm -hmm. It's called Star Wars the Deck Builder. Very basic. Happy days. Happy days.
He's fought off creatures in the jungle, monsters in the ring, and an alligator on a golf course. Now he's not only the High Magistrate of Navarro, but also an accomplished director behind the camera, which if you ask me is quite the stew, baby. Back for another round on our stage this weekend. Please give it up, y'all, for Carl Weathers. <laughs> never gonna shake your hand like a person. Why would you? Why would Why I? would you? No normal person shakes the way. Listen, that, no, 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 no. 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 There it is, there it is. Oh, it is always wonderful to see you, Carl. Jeez, man, it's so nice to be here. Look yeah. at this crowd. I, I just have to ask a question. What are you all doing here? Come on. Oh, come on, what are you doing here? What's the matter with you? I have no place to go? Oh. From, from all of us on The Mandalorian, we appreciate you. All right? Yeah. I gotta tell you, you uh, seeing the, the growth of uh, the like Mando fandom here, cosplay, Wild. everything, like get exponentially larger every year. It's gotta be wonderful to see. And just to think, they were all just born a few years ago. That's it. And That's here you it. are, you've that quickly because you're out there in that galaxy where the Mandalorian is roaming around. There's something in the water there because you all grow so fast and here <laughs> you are. Oh man, so uh, I want to ask you, speaking of the growth of The Mandalorian, we got to talk about these episodes you've been directing. Yeah, yeah. I got to tell you. I just, I just want to know one thing, because I want to put pressure on the power behind The Mandalorian. Do you want to see me direct more? <laughs> Do I know how to milk it or what? <laughs> You know what we say to that, baby? This is the way. This is the way. This is the way. But I have to ask, you know, um, acting and directing in something at the same time is always a bit of a challenge because you are, you know, you've got so many things, mo moving parts to keep track of. But in this, it's not just the usual moving parts. We're talking about creatures that aren't there, creatures that are there, but they're puppets, entire towns that maybe aren't there when you're shooting, how, what's the process of directing like? Um, every child has a very, very vivid imagination. And if you have your little toy characters and you have a landscape and they're only that tall, you make them move where you wanna make them move and you make them do whatever you want them to do, if it's jumping or climbing or digging, or fighting or whatever. Or if you have the Easy Bake Oven, how many people know what an Easy Bake Oven is, okay? There you go. So you can imagine then you can bake anything and it's probably mud and you don't wanna put it in your mouth, but that's what you do as a director. You have to have that kind of childlike imagination. And you have the benefit on something like The Mandalorian where we have maybe one of the greatest crews and the greatest production group ever. And then you, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you have all this wonderful technology. You start with really good writing and then you have Grogu. How can you go wrong? Can't go wrong. How can you go wrong? Can we get our Grogu's up? Grogu's up. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, I want to talk a little bit about the growth of Grief Karga as well. I love Grief Karga so much, and I love... So do I. Oh. <laughs> he is so much fun, and to see his entrance this season with the tiny little droids carrying his cape... It's so disgusting. I mean, <laughs> what, what an ego a man has to have 
to have little droids following him around, holding the ends of his cape. And that's what I love is everything about Greed, every little detail that you put into him, you can tell exactly what kind of guy he is, where he's like, Haha, it's High Magistrate, I'm just kidding, but call me High Magistrate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, be, be deferential, okay? Or you may wind up in, yeah. you know, the, the prison far, far away somewhere, so... Uh, we're pals, but don't pal around too much. Well, no, no, <laughs> we're pals, but don't you think we're pals, yeah, yeah. okay? <laughs> I can say we're pals. No, they've, they've done, you know, both John and... and and Dave have done such a wonderful job on giving us, oh, yeah. 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 John Favreau and Dave Filoni, okay? Uh, and, and of course, I mean, we'd all be remiss if we just didn't whisper the two words, George Lucas, okay? So we had great, great source material and all of us have been touched over the years by the great Star Wars brand, right? And then, and then we get to capitalize on it in The Mandalorian and have both John and Dave contribute so much of their knowledge about the brand and then create these great scripts and great stories individually for each episode and then have this arc going over the season. So you have an app opportunity, it's almost like getting it bat. Every time you get it bat, you got an opportunity to put wood on the ball, you know? Uh, we're just really fortunate, really fortunate. Yeah. Well, you're also an amazing crew and an amazing cast. And that helps too, right? I mean, absolutely wonderful. Now, I, have a, I do have a very, very important question for you because when we first spoke, and uh oh, he's and, getting really serious now. And not this much is, was known this is about be heavy. the Mandalorian. I asked you if it really came down to it in a fight. Uh oh. Would it be me or you? I mean, look, we know the answer to that one. Carl, we know the answer to that one. I, standing next, standing next to Apollo Creed, I look like a monkey lizard. <laughs> it's all love! It's all love! But I asked you, if it came down to it, who would really win, Din Djarin or Grief Karga? And you wow. said, you wow. said at the time, Grief Karga. I, I know what I said then. <laughs> uh, to say that I was lying might be just being pretty generous to myself. <laughs> I was really over-exaggerating because I've seen Grief Cargo wield those lightsabers and, ooh, <laughs> okay? And also, he's got Grogu on his side with the magic hand thing, right? <laughs> Have you seen what, what Grogu does? Oh, uh, man. You know, and then I have to give some props here, okay? Because obviously the most recent episode that I directed, mm -hmm. right? We had a man wielding lightsabers in a way like that was spectacular. Do you know what I'm talking yes. about in episode four? Yes. All right. So uh, Ahmed did one hell of a job, didn't he? That man, I've known that man for a few years now, and that man can do anything. Well, talk about using the force, bang, right? And using the lightsabers. I, I, think, I'd, I think I'd have to defer to the lightsabers. He I really that. would. Do you remember when Ahmed did that two thing with the kick? I know. That was I know. wild. I know. Well, first of all, the guy is so talented in so many ways. And obviously a martial artist, which you could see, that wasn't like the stunt man coming in to do the action stuff. That was him doing it, you know? We had, we had, it was great. And I mean, you've been, I mean, you've been doing action stuff for so long, you know, how, you know, how tough is it to be doing all of this stuff that Ahmed's doing? And how tough is it for you as, as a director now, being behind the camera, directing the action stuff? Is that a huge change for you? <sighs> Again, you know, I'd like to say something and tell you how great I am, but, but, but in all honesty, you know when you're really great? 
when you can let someone who's great do their thing because they make you look good, right? Ahmed made me look good. <laughs> That's the truth. Well, I'll tell you, all the work that all of you are putting in and all of the fun that you're having too, we can all see it and we all love it, Carl. It's been amazing to watch the journey of the entire series. Before, uh, I know we gotta let you go because you got a million things here, but is there anything you'd like to say to the crowd here before we wrap it up? Wow, yeah. <laughs> I guess I don't need to say anything. They're saying it. Uh, just simply, Yes, this is about Star Wars, celebration of all things Star Wars. This is also about The Mandalorian. That's why we're here, okay? But I have an opportunity and I'm gonna take it. And the opportunity is to thank you all for all the support over the years in all the projects I've ever done that this kind of reception to me is manifest all of that stuff. So I thank you, I thank you, I thank you, I thank you, I thank all of you. From The Mandalorian, we love you! We love you too. Ladies and gentlemen, Carl Weathers! We got lots more to come today from Star Wars Celebration Live. Stay with us, we'll be back in a minute. I'm with Elena from Rhino Shield here at Star Wars Celebration. We are going to talk about foam covers, force resistant, of course. Hey, Elena, how's Celebration treating you? Hi, first of all, nice to meet you. And I'm really enjoying it here. It's my first time at the Star Wars Celebration, so I'm very excited. And yeah, I love it. Okay, welcome. I'm glad you're loving it so far. Uh, so talk us through uh, what you have uh, in store for people here at Celebration and also uh, out there in the wider world as well. I see. So. We are Rhino Shield. We're still quite a young firm. We sell like accessories for phones and like AirPods and like all like for all sorts of gadgets. And we're very like sustainability focused. And so most of our products are from recycled materials. And we just like really, really put like we really emphasize that. And we're a very diverse team too. We're like we have all sorts of backgrounds. We're Taiwanese. We're French. We're German. I'm from Austria. And even Americans. We have all. And yeah, and then we're here today to showcase like our Star Wars collection. We have a lot of collections like Disney, Star Wars, Mandalorian. And today we're showcasing them and I'm happy to show you around. The yeah, world. let's have a look. So which are our celebration exclusives? Yes. So this one here is our very, very like limited edition. You can only get these at the Star Wars celebration. Um, it has this really cool holographic effect. Um, and it's the first time we tried this actually. So this is like the first holographic case from Rhino Shield. And yeah, all of the others you can order online too, but these we have here. And yeah, and these are all solid suits and we have a bunch of clear cases too. And we have them with MagSafe, which is like wireless charging for iPhones, but also for Androids. And yeah, we also have AirTag cases, brand new with Star Wars and some AirPods cases and a very cool uh, grip. You call it a grip, but it's kind of more than just a grip. It can be like a, a like a, a placer as well. So you can watch uh, the Star Wars live stream on your, oh, well, at least it shouldn't break, right? It, it, it works, yeah, it works. We have evidence that they work. They do, they uh, do. Yeah, let's, let's see the grip, please. Mm -hmm. I like the grip. So we actually also have two limited editions for the grip. Um, we have two versions. We have the big grip and the small grip. And this one is a limited edition with the logo. And basically you just pull it out and you can hold it like this, but you can also like put it like this on your like table and watch TV or watch your favorite, watch Star Wars. Watch this live stream. Watch this live stream, exactly. And yeah, and if you don't need it, you just put it back in and it doesn't like bother you at all. And we have it like, you can either stick it on as adhesive version or MagSafe, which is for iPhones. So with the magnetic and yeah. So these are the grips and it comes in like a big and a small one like this. And yeah, these are all very limited edition. You can only get here. 
Right, okay, so you better act fast if you're here watching the stream, which would be strange, but act fast. Um, thank you, Elena. Um, some great products and uh, a great young company as well, you know, friendly for the environment, as you discussed. I've never talked about phone covers for so long, but I, I surprisingly enjoyed it, so thank you for sharing. Uh, thank you for the honor, thank you so much. No, you're welcome. Uh, we have a lot more to come from Star Wars Celebration Live, so stay tuned. Great things usually happen in threes around here. And since our next interview is with three people, it's bound to be incredible. One is a fierce Togruta. The other is a Mandalorian with an art degree. And the third is making their Star Wars debut as the live action version of Hera Syndulla. From the new Disney Plus series, Ahsoka, please welcome Rosario Dawson, Natasha. Natasha Lou Bordizzo, and Mary Elizabeth Winston. something I'm excited yes. you know what you're Ahsoka you can forge whatever you want you yes, go ahead you make a helmet for Sabine you do whatever you would like to do <laughs> love the tools <laughs> hi welcome hey, Ooh. I see a lot of Ahsoka's in the crowd there's a lot of Ahsoka love today I know Sabines at? Where are my Sabines? All right, they all left the building. It's okay. We got you. We got you. I'm the only Sabine. Yeah, yes. we have a lot of Sabine love. <laughs> Rosario. Uh, yes. You love. are Ahsoka. You are. I am no Jedi, but I am Ahsoka. <laughs> Now, you spent quite a few years with the character already. Yeah. First playing her in live action in The Mandalorian season two. Yes. I imagine you've gotten to know her quite well. Yes, very, very well. Yes. And uh, she's left quite the impression on me. It's definitely been, I think, a lifestyle change. I meditate every day. Ming would prefer if I trained every day still. <laughs> but uh, we did a lot of that during it and I'm, I'm looking forward Yo. to it. If, you know, if you guys love it enough, hopefully we'll get a second season and get to do it again. I feel like I, I manifested this role, so I'm just throwing it out there to keep manifesting. Keep manifesting. Keep manifesting. Well, season two. <laughs> you did, I think you brought up Ahsoka years and years ago. I did, in yeah. In an interview, and now here we are. Fan cast, uh, Boss Logic made an image of me as the character, and I retweeted it. It got to the attention of Dave, who saw it and was like, actually, yeah, she does kind of look like her, and kind of kept it back of mind because I was so passionate about it. And then when Mandalorian came up, I got the Skype call. The Skype call. <laughs> No, dun, Natasha, dun, dun. the last time you came to Star Wars Celebration, I think you had recently gotten the Skype call because you had just been announced as Sabine. And you were, I think, three weeks into production at the time. How has your perspective on Sabine Wren changed since those very early days when you got the first script, got the first look at what you would look like in live action? Oh. When I was at Celebration a year ago, I had just started to familiarize myself with the character, so it was very strange, like, celebrating something that I was just learning. And um, we've been through a lot together, Sabine and I, and uh, quite a journey. I think she faced a lot of demons. She faced herself, um, and she overcame a lot and found hope again.
very exciting. And Mary, yesterday yes. we got to see a first look at you as Harrison Dula. You did. A lot of Harris in the crowd. What can you tell us about where we're going to find Hera in her story in Ahsoka the series? Right. Well, as we know, as what we've seen in Rebels, Hera is an incredible pilot, a very maternal figure to her crew. She's a um, space mom. She's space love mom. Her. Yeah, I'm proud, proud to get to play a <laughs> space mom. Um, and so we get to kind of see her advance from there. You know, she's a general, she's a leader, she's become somewhat of a legend um, in that role. And uh, so it's pretty cool to, to play someone that strong and also that like nurturing and um, maternal and, and kind. So it was like quite something to, to step into some shoes that were big to fill because she, she encompasses so much. Um, so I felt very proud to have the opportunity to, to try and do that. Rosario, I'm loving just watching you supporting these two women up here. Just so excited to, to be here all together, so excited for the series. Now, I know you've been with Star Wars for a bit, but Mary and Natasha, I would like to ask you, as you are new to Star Wars, what has been the most surprising aspect of working in this galaxy far, far away? It's not a job. <laughs> it's a lifestyle, it's a family, it's just so much more than anything has ever given me, so I'm just really grateful. Look at this. <laughs> welcoming you to the Star Wars family. Yeah. Very excited. I feel that. You all in the Star Wars family. We're so excited. I mean, I would echo that. It's just being on set and this show and with this cast and the crew, everyone loves it so much that you would think something that at this level might be a bit stressful or people might be stressed out at the pressure of it. And it's the opposite. Everyone's overjoyed at every minute and giddy and happy and relaxed. Um, and I just was like amazed that I got to be a part of that atmosphere. That sounds like the perfect job. Giddy, relaxed, everyone's happy to be there. Rosario, you mentioned the lightsaber training earlier. Did someone mention lightsabers? Oh, I guess, uh, I guess I can say that that was pretty cool. Yeah, I can say that now. I'm so excited when we just saw this trailer that we got to be able to talk about that a little Did bit. Or I can we? No, 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 never mind, never mind. You can talk about whatever you want. Can we? No, no, I'm just kidding. Well, just I mean, kidding. is Dave listening? I think iPhones might have seen it. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I feel like Dave Filoni is everywhere. Exactly, exactly. But you know, it's just to have trained so hard, to have worked so hard with these wonderful people. Um, and can I just say, like, I think the relationship between these characters is one of the things that was so exciting. It was very different, obviously, on Mandalorian and Boba Fett. You got to see a lot of Ahsoka's, I think, loneliness. You know, she's really kind of out there fighting the good fight, oftentimes kind of on her own, or is she? You know, I think there's some really great suggestions um, in this to kind of see actually the comrades in arms that she's actually been, ha you know, working with all this time and to have these relationships that go back so far um, and to have the level of trust that she has with these, you know, different characters is, is just something really special. You know, we love Ahsoka for how steadfast she is, what a true believer she is, for how capable and, and, and you know, just incredible she is, but so are these incredible women that she also gets to work with as well. And I think that protective energy that you talk about, it's not separate, right? You know, with Hera being a leader and a mother figure, that's just protection all in one, you know? And then, I mean, look at that face. Look, Look at, that, at face. that face. Does she not give Sabine? I mean, it was really like oftentimes pinching myself because I'm doing the research, looking, you know, watching Rebels and Clone Wars over and over again. And then you walk on set and it's uncanny. 
the way they stepped into these characters and the essence of, of these characters that they bring to life is just next level. I got it with Dave looking at me when I was staring at them, honestly. I got it. And I know Dave has, has mentioned that. He's brought that up a time or two. <laughs> Now that we've mentioned Dave Filoni a couple times, I feel like he's just gonna appear out of a puff of smoke like in the middle of the forge, but he, whether he's listening or not, whether he's watching the live stream, whether he is just backstage and he's gonna greet us when we come off of here, is there anything particular that you've learned about your characters from Dave Filoni or anyone else in the Lucasfilm Star Wars family that changed how you performed, how you portrayed that character on screen? I mean, I, I hung on every word that came out of his mouth, I think. So I, I think I tried to take everything he said to me. And, and really, I don't think he ever, he never gave any notes that were like, you've got to play it this way. He just, like the way he is, he has conversations with you that are very relaxed and fun. And everything that he would say, I was sort of in mental notes, mental notes, mental notes in my mind. Um, because he's so brilliant, but he's so kind. and. Um, you know, so he's not too strong, strong armed about it. He just is sort of an open book. So you can ask anything at any time. And he's just this well of information. Um, so we talked a lot about sort of like old war films and General Patton and, you know, these sort of generals, these iconic generals of... of and Harrison Dula. She's one of And Harrison Dula. So that was something that was great to, to talk with him about his, his cinematic perspective on that and to try to get to see that through his eyes. Dave quite literally lives and breathes Star Wars. And sometimes when he looks at me, Absolutely. I don't know if he's seeing Natasha or Sabine. Maybe it doesn't matter, but it's just, I'll like bump into him in the hallway and we'll be ha I'll be talking about something random like my dog back in Sydney, Australia, which is where I'm from. And, um, <laughs> oh, thanks. And he will somehow relate it back to Star Wars. And I'm like, ha okay. He, he just, he just Following. is that person all the time. And on set, um, just to have him there as this guardian of everything that we're trying to do. And, and whatever question you have, he has an essay to respond with. So yeah. he's got a whiteboard, he flips it. He's just like, here it is. God bless Dave. Star Wars Encyclopedia. I think, oh, hey. Him having that sort of encyclopedic knowledge of it, it just gives you such a foundation and such a sense of security that you know you're in good hands, you know, and anything that you're going to try is gonna be something he's gonna be able to really appreciate and give notes on. Um, but I think for me, probably the, just the trust that he gave me helped me with my confidence a lot, you know, because he just, he's so collaborative and he just felt, I think we just really connected on how much we just really adore and love this character so much. And so there was just this level of trust that was there. And I think he just gave me a lot of confidence in being able to just sort of step into this role. Um, yeah, he's fun to have on set. Like it was really hard actually when he wasn't on set. There weren't very many moments of that, but like you definitely felt it. Um, and yeah, that was, talking, we would talk a lot. John, I, 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 did, I joked about that earlier, but I, we really, John would be like, can we, can we get back to shooting? Because we're, it's story time, yay, can we get back to shooting? <laughs> no, it's story time. <laughs> That's fantastic. Uh, I know you can't say much about Ahsoka, so could you, before we go, could you leave us with one word to describe the Ahsoka series? I, I, I feel it's majestic. There's like, it's very Ooh. majestic to me. Great answer. Badass. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That could be Sabine or Ahsoka the series, but yeah, we'll take it. We'll allow it. I don't, intense. Like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, intense. all right. We don't pull any punches. I'm just Ooh. letting you guys know. All right. It's well, full on. Be prepared. Be prepared. Well, I am very excited <laughs> to see you all on screen soon. And I know the rest of us are too, right? Yeah. Yeah. Give it up one more time for Rosaria Dawson, Mary Elizabeth Winston, and Natasha Lou Bordizzo. Stick around. Lots more to come today from Star Wars Celebration Live. Don't you dare click away. Christina 
Ariel, and I am here live from the show floor at Star Wars Celebration Live 2023. So let's talk to some friends of mine. Hello, cosplayers of the Old Republic. How are you this morning? Doing excellent. How are you? I'm doing quite well. Can you tell me a little bit about the history of your group? Of course. Uh, we're an unofficial costuming group that covers uh, the Old Republic era, as in the name. We run from uh, the Ricotta era all the way up to Darth Bane. Is there anything that you've heard during celebration or anything in the future that you might be looking forward to? Maybe a few things, but any new uh, potentially Old Republic content is something we're excited for. Well, we also are excited. Thank you all so much for your time and for sharing your amazing work with us as well. I'm Christine Ariel, signing off. Something's coming. Something dark. I sense it. This is a new beginning. For some, war. For others, in power. It's been a while. Things have changed. I started hearing whispers about Thrawn's return. heir to the Empire. We have to prepare for the worst. The Jedi fell a long time ago. There aren't many left. it is time to begin again. having fun? Yeah, get ready for this one. Back in the days of the Clone Wars, our next guest voiced the Mandalorian Gar Saxon. But as most of us know, he did. But that doesn't mean Ray Stevenson can't come back to Star Wars and play another character in live action. And he's coming out with someone else who was presumed missing from animation and is now returning in live action as Grand Admiral Thrawn from the new Disney Plus series, Ahsoka. Give a warm Star Wars celebration. Welcome to Ray Stevenson and Lars Mikkelsen. Empire, is it? <laughs> I can't deny that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, 
this must be so fun for the two of you to have started an animation and be with Star Wars and part of the family for so long and see these characters make this transition. How's it been for you this week? Uh, I have to admit that um, uh, I got the call to do uh, the, the voice for, for Gar Saxon and it was such a, such a blast. I, I had no, no idea what was, you know, what was, I was going to expect. I thought, oh yeah, English guy, he's a bad guy, yeah? All right. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. And, oh, and Danes are too, yeah. <laughs> and, and they, yeah. So bring out the Vikings, right? Here we go. Um, and when I got the call for this, they were so secretive. I thought, Gus, really? When is this set? Is it going to be? I thought it was going to be that. Yeah. Then I got to meet Dave and I said, oh no, we have a surprise. And I was introduced to this character, Balin Skull. I thought, whoa, hang on. So from then on, it's, uh, it's been a roller coaster. There are so many shots in that Ahsoka teaser of your character doing some wild Jedi stuff, man. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. I can't. <laughs> yes, uh, Ahsoka and I go at it uh, quite strong uh, uh, a couple of good times in, in the series. And she's a, she's a powerhouse to work with, of course. But um, getting to, to wield the lightsaber is just the best feeling in the world. And the first, the first time that they handed it to me uh, for the camera test, you, you couldn't help yourself. You make the noise. You make the noise. Oh. Everybody says it. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No, everybody does. <laughs> 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 you, spend, you spend over 40 years of your life making the noise. You can't just stop making the noise all at once. I know, I know, I know. But you, could, you have to stop it during filming. Sure. You know. sure. But can't they just digitally pull that out? What is no. ILM doing if they're not doing that for you? <laughs> <laughs> now let's talk, let's talk, Lars, about uh, the transition into Thrawn in live action. Everybody's our sneaky, our favorite sneaky blue son. <laughs> our favorite sneaky blue son. Yeah. Yeah. He, he yeah. is a character that is wildly loved. Yeah. And has such a long history to yeah. him. Yeah. Tell me what it was like to, to first be approached for Rebels and now to be here doing it again in Ahsoka. Well, I mean, Rebels is, is it five or six years ago? I yeah. think, yeah. Um, when I got approached by Dave for that, um, I didn't really know what that entailed. I mean, how much work was that you know, going to be? And, but throughout having done that, the character came more and more to life, for me at least. Yeah? And, uh, and we just hit it off over the Skype thing. You know? I just immediately felt that connection because he's such a brilliant man. Yeah. And, and he he just loves the creativity that we can provide. In terms of what the character was about, I mean, it, the, there's so many layers to that villainous character um, in a Sherlockian way, you know? Mm -hmm. he's, he's so much smarter than me. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, when I needed to do the transition into this, we had to think, you know, how do we do this? How do we, you know, transition this into live action? Because you can't really just adapt and do the same thing. But we've done as much as the same thing as, as we can, mm -hmm. but adapted it. Yep. Nice. Did you ever think... Did you ever think when you got into acting and performing that a single shot of the back of your head would cause such a huge reaction in people. No. <laughs> no, I had no idea. I, I'm, you know, I live in Denmark. It's a very small country. I think, I think we could all be in here, actually. <laughs> so, uh, in many ways, this is uh, it's mind blowing for me. And, and the, the love that I've been met with today is just.
Oh, yeah, it's what, you know, it's, it, sounds, it sounds so cliche when, when we say all the time that it's, it's being welcomed into a family, but it really, it really is kind of like that, isn't it? It is. It, it yes. really does feel that way. It does feel like that, yeah. And, uh, and I mean, here. even when we did this shoot, I mean, because of Dave's brilliance and, uh, you know, I, I really mean what I said on stage. I mean, I've, I've never been on set with so much passion from, you know, from everyone to try to achieve the best we can with this. And every, every department cares so much. It's not just about their own departments. They're all part of it. And somebody from the maker department sees somebody in construction who's maybe having a bit... Da Are you all right? Would you, do you need anything? There's no division as such. They're so united, so thrilled, and there's such long hours, and, but such amazing talent that's being brought to bear and everybody uh, runs around and say oh the costumes are showing and they want to see all oh, the sets there's a new set on stage doesn't matter what department you're in, you you go and see you can't wait because you're ex everybody was so excited about that yeah and and enthused and supportive yeah i mean it, it's it really is like a lot of artistry at every level and everybody so is so excited to share that with each other you know from everybody that's building props and droids and costumes and everything exactly exactly I, mean, I would go on set and i think who designed this but then you look at the quality and you go like who constructed it and the costumes they're works of art shauna was I, just saying she's, mean, a, she's a genius you, you look really <laughs> cool in that robe man <laughs> like that's a good jedi robe oh my word <laughs> oh yeah like <laughs> There are a lot of variations on Jedi robe, and I love what they say about characters. Yeah, and, yeah. And seeing you in, a, in, a, in like this gray, almost tweedy, you know what I, I know, mean? I it's, know, it's, there was a, you, you're not sure where, he, where exactly he's from, which part of the universe or the galaxy, but he has been part of it for, you know, he's been there as a presence. And then there's this kind of nobility about him. But is he a bad guy? Is he a good guy? There's something else other going on, which Filoni would be, would be relieved, uh, revealed, relieved. Yeah. <laughs> relieved. Well, <laughs> speaking of making Dave nervous, here we go. I got a question. This is what we're going to do. We're not going to give anything away. We would never do that. But we could, for instance, you mentioned, you know, Sherlocky, and you mentioned sort of a, the Moriarty nature of, of Thrawn. If you were to name a couple characters that you took inspiration for, for your performance, and we can do this because we're not giving anything away. Go ahead, just name a couple characters maybe. Uh, okay. Um, it would have to be some Arthurian knight, some knight, some sort of legend, some... Um, quest that may be involved. Okay, okay. But once again, Arthurian, they weren't all good. Exactly. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> so who knows? Who knows? So who knows? I'd say uh, someone along the lines of Sherlock. Yeah. 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 Well, we, yeah. Know, we know what you're about already. Yeah. You, you sneaky guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Well, I'm very excited to see more of your characters. Obviously, we have a bit of a wait ahead of us, but we're very, very excited. And I think it's gonna so be thrilled. worth the wait, y'all. So thrilled, yeah. thank you so much. Ray Stevenson and Lars Mickelson, give it up one more time. Stick around, we're just getting started on day two. There's lots more Star Wars Celebration Live coming your way right after this. Star Wars on YouTube is the premier destination for new and exclusive Star Wars content every week. From brand new trailer debuts to never before seen behind the scenes reveals, Star Wars on YouTube is the channel you need to be subscribed to for up to the second Star Wars news and information. Plus exciting original series like this week in Star Wars. Star Wars Visions Volume 2 will arrive on Star Wars Day, May the 4th. Give me the opportunity to sort of like pay attention to details. And the High Republic show. Where is Burr Yaga? Is he okay? Phase 2 is intense, y'all. That bring fans the latest and greatest from a galaxy far, far away. So what are you waiting for? 
Subscribe to Star Wars on YouTube today. When you, when you fight Ahsoka Tano with a metal pole and survive, you deserve to come out on our stage. Also, if you're making your debut in a brand new Star Wars series, you also deserve to be on our stage. From the new Disney Plus series, Ahsoka, please welcome Diana Lee Inosanto and Ivana Sakno. Star Wars Celebration, I yes. can tell by your yes. face. Yeah. It's uh, incredible, you guys look amazing. Yes, really? you do. Look at this, I mean, you guys are beautiful. This is incredible, the energy, just incredible. Whew. So happy to have you here, so happy to have all of you here too. <laughs> all right, Ivana, I'm gonna put you in the hot, hot seat, right out of the gate. I know, I know you're new here, but I've gotta ask. Can you tell us a little bit about your character in Ahsoka? Yeah, absolutely, as much as Dave Filoni allows today. <laughs> but um, That's the answer we're getting a lot today. I, Secrecy. I, yeah, always. But I, I play Shin Hati, and Shin is a young apprentice to Balin Skull, who you just met on stage, and um, she is very ambitious, um, quite intense, and an incredibly skilled um, lightsaber um, user. I mean, she's incredibly skilled in lightsaber combat. She's a force wielder, and um, you know, I really want you guys to be able to discover her. But I hope that within her as being Dave's creation, her humanity can expand our understanding of that darkness within someone and once again the reason behind it and it's been incredible to see Dave's ability to to expand that understanding of not just lightness and dark being two sides of one story but the spectrum that it's on and what comes in between that so and the complexity in a single character it sounds like well said Diana, we've met Morgan Elsbeth. I have some feelings about Morgan Elsbeth, <laughs> but we won't get into that right now. <laughs> What's it been like continuing her journey from The Mandalorian, where we first met her, to now Ahsoka the series? What's it like continuing her journey? Oh my gosh. Well, first I want to say, when I first did Mandalorian in season two, I didn't even know she had a name. I just knew that she was the magistrate. So when it aired, I was stunned when I heard Rosario say, Morgan Elsbeth, I'm like, I have a name, you know? And everybody was making a big deal like, about Grogu, but I'm like, I'm looking at my husband, I have a name. But being able to continue on this journey on Ahsoka, um, it, it, it's just an honor. And you know, what I love is we're gonna explore a lot about her background, which I am very, very excited. Um, I will tell you that, um, yes, she's cold hearted, but uh, she's absolutely very loyal and dedicated to Grand Admiral Thrawn. And it is, yeah, and it is unwavering, her loyalty. So there's a lot of exciting stuff that will be coming out for sure. Yes, for sure, All right? Awesome. Now you mentioned Morgan's background, but also your background, I think, comes into play a little bit with this role. Uh, Star Wars has often drawn parallels to martial arts, but what has your experience brought to your portrayal of the character? Ah, well, um, for anybody here that does martial arts, I mean, it's something that is part of my heritage and my culture. My, my father's Danny Osanto, and... Woo! 
and my godfather is the late Bruce Lee. And so it is wild because when I first saw Star Wars, when I, I was 11 years old, I remember this moment of watching it with all these fans in Aspen, Colorado, because my dad was doing an international martial arts camp. And by the end of the movie, to see, just like here, this rock concert of people standing up out of their chairs and, and just screaming. I had never experienced that kind of electricity in a room. And I don't think I still have it until today with all of you. Your electricity here, this is amazing. This is, this is incredible, this fellowship of good will and joy. And we, and we all know that Star Wars is about hope, and you guys are absolutely reflecting that. So coming back to the martial arts, yeah, uh, my father, when I was a little girl, then immediately was so inspired, he went and bought these plastic telescope looking lightsabers. But to me, the lightsabers were the real deal in my heart as a child. And he started training me right away with two lightsabers, and it's so crazy. We flash forward to when I did Mandalorian season two and had my fight scene with Rosario that that would play into my future. That is just crazy. So yeah, so there you have it. it. Little did you know you were getting ready for the role already. What's that? Little did you know you were getting ready for the role already. Uh, yeah. As yeah. a child. Yeah. Ivana, how has being part of Star Wars changed your perspective on the franchise and on the saga? You know, I didn't have the joy of having Star Wars be part of my childhood. So I became familiar with it, along with becoming part of this project. But as I, as I started discovering the story, I did so with childlike exuberance and obsessiveness, really. And I did so with really the thanks to my friends who had the, that experience growing up. And I was able to see and understand what it meant to them growing up with Star Wars. And for me, I, I became completely in love with it and it became my world. The way that it translates itself, you know, the force translates into the flow of the universe and how that translates into the lessons that come along with it. So it means, it means a great deal to be part of it. And Dave, you know, I don't have to even explain to you guys what Star Wars mean to him and that really placates itself into the entire crew so it's it's been it's been the joy of a lifetime to be part of it really welcome to the star wars family we are so happy to have you here i know somebody from behind you just shouted that same thing i'm just going to echo it for the crowd what has been the most surreal part of entering this world, of working on this project? What has been the most surreal part? Oh my gosh. Well, I, I think it's just when you get to work with such creative people like John and Dave, that alone is so surreal because before as a fan watching Clone Wars with my kids and to see them in, in person and you know, there to direct us, there to put their input into these characters and to explain those gaps where maybe I might have had questions. I mean, that in itself, I'm going, wow, I'm really working with Dave Filoni and John Favreau. I mean, this is insane. And, and to see Rosario come to life as Ahsoka, oh my gosh, you know, to, to see that this has been manifested and look at it now, we, we have this beautiful show. Um, it's, that's just crazy, you know, crazy good. <laughs> crazy crazy good. in the best way, crazy in the best way. Avada, what's been most surreal for you? I mean, I, as the way that you speak of Rosario, I wanna also, I, I want to confirm and say the same heartful thank you to you because you've been such a, mentor to me on set you oh, carry gosh. such warmth and kindness and really it's it's been it's been such a pleasure you really are a gift to okay, this okay i'm going to start to show. cry here but I, <laughs> listen <laughs> it, I, I i can 
Lars and, and Ray can confirm this, all of us, we have this bond of the baddies. Yeah. We are the bond of the yeah. baddies. And we really, like my nickname for her is Heart and Soul because she thank was you. the heart and soul on the set. You, but yeah. Thank you. The, yeah. You know, as um, Diana said, the surreal part of it really has been working with John Favreau and Dave Filoni. You know, they are, they're, the perfect leaders and collaborators, and Dave is a genius. He is, he is imaginative and childlike and supportive and wise, and being, being part of his world makes you, reminds you of why you want to do it in the first place, along with seeing all of you guys, because you're the reason why the show exists. And, you know, Dave, I know, speaks to the child in our hearts and yeah and seeing you is it's meaningful and it's very surreal truly well i know ahsoka is for sure one of our most anticipated shows collectively in this room i think i think we're, it's all safe to say that yes i can't wait to see what you all have in store thank you so much for stopping by more from star wars celebration coming up in just a moment I'm here with the great Neil Scanlon. You brought some wonderful creatures with you, and I'd love to uh, I'd love to chat a little bit about them. Let's start with BB9E here. Yep, yep. I mean, uh, BB8 was a wonderful thing for us to have done. You know, to make it was a it, it taxed everything that we knew about technology that we had at the time, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then to do an evil version of it was just uh, hey, hey, come on. <laughs> yeah, it was very good. You know what I mean, it's yeah. the yin and the yang. So it, oh, yeah. it, it was great because he was, you know, BB8 so cute, so lovely, and everything else. And there's all it was a temptation to sort of go, what's his camera? This is like, oh, if you love this guy, God. wait until you hate this yeah. guy. <laughs> Absolutely. So, uh, yeah, that's exactly love what that. he is. Yeah, yeah. Tell me about uh, this gentleman in the background. Yeah, I mean, you know, a, a, a kind of, you know, uh, all, all, all living sort of Star Wars, uh, classic character, really. It's a person wearing an animatronic head. Uh, we've gloved his hands in this particular case uh, to sort of just, again, uh, one of the things about... Uh, uh, that we've learned is that if you, um, if you if you don't reveal it, it allows your imagination to engage a little bit. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what his hands look like under there, but neither do you. But you have your version and I have mine. And I think that's a really good part of selling a character. And letting you. So certain parts are great. Yeah, he's an animatronic head. He has a performer in there. Uh, probably lots and lots of uh, uh, mechanical elements in there that could be radio controlled and brought to life. So yeah, he's great. And, uh, you know, again, trying to tap into the real world. Uh, there's something about Star Wars I think which separates it from uh, other science fiction things is that we try to hold on to our real world so that when we look at something like that it's not so far off the scale that you would go well maybe that is an aquatic creature that could walk out so yeah hopefully it fits that bit. I like to think he wears the mitts because he does a lot of baking yeah or boxing <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> and of course we got to talk Ewoks yeah Ewoks I mean you know you know uh, Honestly, you know, it's t you talk about standing on the shoulders of giants, don't you? I mean, Stuart Freebill, and when we got to do this with Warwick, it was again one of those moments where you just go, this is such an iconic character that um, we just have to try and replicate it. So we did the same thing as we did with Chewie. We kind of went back and looked at the old books. We looked at every bit of information we could, and we tried to be as authentic as possible. And, the, and, and one of the great things about this was that Warwick Davis actually helped us build it. He really was an active member in putting the bits together and sort of going, oh, no, I remember this part was like that and that part was like that. So uh, I think, uh, yeah, he represents a, 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 a reproduction of something close to Warwick's heart and to the fans' hearts, yeah. too. So he is what he is. He's, yeah. I, I love an Ewok so much. I love an Ewok so much. <laughs> I just can't. I'm like, I'm like, you know, you know that I'm that age. Yep. I'm that age. Yeah, it's just I, like, oh, absolutely. An Ewok. Yeah, 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 yeah. I get that totally. Yep. This is one croupier. of my favorite boys. This croupier. Yeah. Well, <laughs> scale 
is, is amazing, isn't it? When you yes. reduce something down to such a tiny thing and you give it such a big character that you get this, uh, uh, you know, it's this great mid, this great character sort of booms out, but when you see him, he's tiny. It's wonderful. So little croupier, I mean, you know, used for the scene, obviously, in the casino. He's a rod puppet, so you see these little green rods. Those rods will be have seen, they would see those when we shot. They will have been digitally removed. Canonically, he fights with six sabers. <laughs> you heard it here first. <laughs> Neil Scanlon's standing next to me, so it's true. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> and that's our version of Sabres. <laughs> I didn't say he was good with him. Good at Sabres. I just said he fights with them. <laughs> uh, and then, of course, talking about scale, working with something this yeah. huge. Yeah. What is building that like? Well, you know what? This is, a, this is really simple model puppetry making. It's, it's based on the fact that we know, or we knew exactly from JJ, exact, the whole scene was already pre-described to us. We knew that he would never get out the chair, that he would always sit there, mm -hmm. and we knew where the, 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 the lady that was with him would sit. So we were able to build that. So inside there, to be honest, is the most simple of structures. It's called polystyrene. Mm -hmm. It's a polystyrene sculpt that's been very loosely jointed to allow a group of puppeteers to get inside that sofa or inside that um, couch and be able to put their hands inside any respective part of his body and bring it to life. So, and then we dressed it, and I, I, we can't lift him off because he's part of the, 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 the sofa, as it were, but I would imagine, and as I remember, the costume doesn't even go around the back. Wow. It is a presentational animatronic, if that's the best way of putting it, built specifically for one moment and nothing more, yeah. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. And I, lo I, I love his little vulture buddies too. Yeah, the metal so pecking birds, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, you. A, again, all, all credit to JJ and the fact that, you know, he's so brave as putting that in that opening sequence as Ray zooms by. They are classic, again, Star Wars, aren't they? Throw away moments, mm -hmm. but they kind of stay with you forever, I think. Yeah, send the metal pecking bird. Well, this is amazing. Thank you so much, Neil. My pleasure. Absolutely. Thank you very much. This week and every week, tune in for This Week in Star Wars for the latest and greatest news from around the galaxy with me, Kristen Baber. Check out all the Star Wars news. A new trailer for The Mandalorian Season 3 arrived on Monday night, filled with a slew of Mandalorian warriors. And holy hot, Jackson's back! Exclusive reveals. Star Wars has joined TikTok. I'm sorry, is that a High Republic robe? Special guests. Such beautiful acting that I can't believe it's Michelle. You got me to watch the show. All right. <laughs> it's yeah. really good. This is a different kind of interview than I was expecting. <laughs> we go deep on StarWars.com. And a whole lot of fun sprinkled throughout. Moth Madness! This is in Pennsylvania. Oh, it's so good. They make it look so effortless. Hey! Oh, Kevin, you have so much to learn. For all that and more, join us every Thursday at noon on StarWars.com and the official Star Wars YouTube channel. Years ago, fans first met such memorable characters as Jabba the Hutt, Wicket the Ewok, and Mon Mothma, to name a few. And while we can't assure you that any Bothans died to bring you this panel, we can guarantee you're going to enjoy this look back at one of the best Star Wars films of all time. Get ready, because the Return of the Jedi 40th anniversary panel, hosted by Ming-Na Wen, starts right now. Star Wars Celebration, get to your feet, make some noise, and welcome your host, Ming Na Wen! Amazing! Hello! Amazing! Hi, everyone! Wow! This is, I'm home. <laughs> All right, so um, I, this is my first, what? Thank you, 
thank you. <laughs> okay, so you know, this is my first time moderating, so I'm very excited. Um, you know, you all know what a big Star Wars fan I am. I'm Ming-Na Wen. I play Fennec Shand, and and if you told me, okay, this film. Return of the Jedi came out June 1983, right? I was a freshman, I just finished freshman year of college, studying acting, and I was so excited to see this movie. Um, but if you were to tell me, fast forward 40 years later, that I would be here at the Star Wars celebration in London, in front of you guys, with banners of me as Fennec Shan out there, between Luke Skywalker and Han Solo and Princess Leia, I would be like, you're crazy. <laughs> but here we are, and I'm so excited about this. Um, okay, so what am I supposed to do now? I think uh, I'm supposed to introduce, without delay, oh, wait, hold on. Um, you know what, I'm, 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 I'm feeling, there's a, there's a slight disturbance in the force. Uh, okay, hold on. You know, Luke? Luke? Okay, wait, wait. I think Mark Hamill wants to tell us something. Uh, I want to send my love and very best wishes to all of you at Star Wars Celebration London. It also gives me the opportunity to thank you, because if you're there, you're a fan, and Star Wars fans are the best fans in the world. I can't tell you how much I appreciate your enduring devotion through the years. So have fun, be kind to one another, and remember, the Force will be with each and every one of you, always. Oh my goodness. All right, without further delay, because we only have an hour and we have so many amazing guests, I want to introduce Senior Vice President, Creative Innovative at Lucasfilm, and ILM's Chief Creative Officer, Rob Bradow. <laughs> and then next, we have Lucasfilm's Creature, Droid, and Special of, uh, Makeups Effect Supervisor on all UK productions over the last decade, Neil Scanlon! <laughs> and of course, Vice President and Executive Creative Director of Lucasfilm, our very own Doug Chang! <laughs> So, I remember when I first saw Return of the Jedi and that big reveal, right, about Princess Leia being Luke Skywalker's twin sister. I want to ask you, all three of you, when you first saw Return of the Jedi, what, what was your first impression of it? And, um, you know, whether it's characters or scenes or location, what stands out for you? You want me to start first? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, hello everybody. Um, yeah. No, I, I saw Return of the Jedi when I was a freshman at UCLA, and it was the most mind-blowing experience because by then I was already a Star Wars fan, and they were screening Return of the Jedi at the Westwood Theater 24 hours a day. So I remember being in line at 2 a.m. to watch the 6 a.m. show. And the amazing thing was the film just blew me away. I mean, the speeder bike chase just what, you know, it was ingrained into my brain. But the big takeaway for me was that I realized Star Wars is very expensive because I remember seeing some early sort of concept work from Ralph McQuarrie of Jabba's Barge. And it was such a huge departure in style from what I had seen before from New Hope and Empire Strikes Back that I couldn't get my head around well, how can this fit within the Star Wars universe. But then when I saw Return of the Jedi, it completely made sense. And that's when I realized George was thinking way outside the box. Each of these films have something new in there. And that's the way I kind of, the big takeaway for me on Return of the Jedi is that for all of our new series, all of our new films now, I always try to add that little bit of component of new because Star Wars design is very defined in terms of the box that George created. 
But within that box, there's a lot of freedom. And I love to push the envelope in terms of what that box is. That's a, good, that's a great point. Yes. And then for, for both of you, was part of watching this film, like you incorporate something to what you do now? Oh, yes. I mean, absolutely. I mean, from, you know, you have to imagine, you know, what am I at this age? I'm sort of in my 20s. And, you know, I'm beginning to look at the possibility of, is, will there be, ever be a possibility that I could get involved in this film industry, this thing that I had absolutely obsessed about in my teens? And, uh, you know, I, I go to see Return of the Jedi, and uh, I think the thing I took away from it most was just, I, I consider it should be brave now, but in the day, it wasn't. It's just how many creatures, how many practical elements, how many um, uh, uh, of those moments were uh, that George gave to me. So I was just so... You know, the other films had them, but I think Return just has so much more, and that, that was the thing I took away, was that it was just an absolute treat to see all this work that people had done, that, you know, uh, Phil Tippett and Stuart Freeborn, all of these uh, different versions, and, 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 you know, the brave thing of Jab, all that, all that. Yeah, that's what I took away, that this was, this was, I could still do And look, it, you know, you kind of did something with that inspiration, huh? Slowly. <laughs> I remember just, I remember walking out of the theater having seen Empire Strikes Back and looking at my friends who oh, we all went to the theater, like we were completely electrified, like walking out of a concert. We're like, how long do we have to wait until the next movie comes out? And when you're that young. And we had to wait <laughs> my back parents, then. My parents are like, it's going to be two or three years. And we said, no way, because that's like half a lifetime when you're a young kid. And I remember like getting rumors that there was going to be Ewoks and there was rumors about what was happening. And we didn't believe, of course, that Darth was really Luke's father. So we assumed at that point it was going to be Revenge of the Jedi, was going to turn that on its head. But so we got to argue about that for two years between those films. Wow. Yeah, so many things. I remember tearing apart the making of books and like figuring out, looking at how they fit multiple puppeteers inside of Jabba. Yeah, absolutely. I was, it was yeah. so, I mean, everything about that movie trying to figure out how they flew all those ships, so many layers of compositing, like everything about that movie was so inspiring. And I do want to say one thing, I mean, you know, since we're all here for Return of the Jedi, I mean, I'm sure you guys have heard the sad news um, just this week about the passing of Norman Reynolds. Um, he was such an amazing production designer and he established the look of Star Wars with John Barry, the original production designer. And his legacy has completely transformed me in terms of how I approach film design because he really established the Star Wars look with John Barry and George Lucas. And you know, for me, it's, I think one of the biggest takeaways is that you know, we're building upon these legends and we're trying to sort of create and sort of you know, create images that live up to their, their legacy. And for me, you know, Norman Reynolds was a giant in the industry. As a production designer, he was somebody that I looked up to. And so, yeah, it was really quite sad this week. Yeah, it was definitely Absolutely. a loss Absolutely. for the Star Wars community and all the fans. Um, Now, uh, going forward about that, uh, also the, 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 um, the digital effect tools that were used then as well. Um, Rob, I, I want to find out, like, what was your inspiration for uh, what you do now um, based on the, the advancements and achievements of Return of the Jedi? It, it's very different, right, from the photochemical, I think, uh, visual exactly. effects. Yeah, yeah like I mean, the technologies have advanced at, you know, at hyperspeed, is that the right word in this audience, uh, since then? But I gotta say, the teams that did that work, I don't know if we have it, but um, we, we pulled some of the early previs that was done. We still use previs today using the latest in digital technology, but back in Return of the Jedi, they were also using the latest in technology. Back then, uh, if you wanted a previs out of sequence, you had to shoot it, maybe on eight or 16 millimeter film. You had to have some, and you have to get that film developed and wait overnight for all of this. But this was at, in, in the era of Jedi, and this is real. This is... Uh, <laughs> I think that looks really good. So that amazing sequence <laughs> is the, the Kerner characters, and this is Dennis Murin and a small team of people. Tip could have been in this room. I, I, I think I've seen photos of him in this room. They were using a brand new technology called video cassette decks, which they literally got an early one, shipped in wow. from Japan, so they didn't have to wait overnight for each of these shots. They could cut together the sequence. There's even sound to it. They're doing some of the voices. They're trying out all the ideas that you later see in the movie. And <laughs> in Return of the Jedi, you know, in this era, there were not action sequences like this. Every one of these shots, 
they, they did all this planning without knowing how they were going to do it in the final shot. And then once they had the sequence worked out and George had a chance to buy off on it and the director was involved, <laughs> then they could plan out each shot, figure out how they were going to shoot the elements, layer all the elements together. Now, by contrast today, I don't know if we have today's previs. It's, it's all with the latest digital it technology. It is insane. It's Before you move on, Rob, I want to see this movie. It's a right? good <laughs> I want to go home and do this myself now as like a, my, my 12 year old self. That's amazing. It's fabulous. <laughs> so, um, and, and I feel like uh, Neil, you know, looking at this, right? <laughs> um, Everything was very okay. tactile back then, as opposed yeah. to now where it's more digital. So when... <laughs> I don't think we're going to be able to say anything. This keeps going on. Yeah, Everybody we're, just we're, wants we're to watch ahead. that. Yeah, we <laughs> but, I mean, you there were, was uh, you no way I was going to answer that question while that reel was rolling. I, I know. I think we're going to go backstage <laughs> and finish watching the whole thing. That was amazing. Are you, do you want to show Rob? Your digital version of that? Do you want to see today's? Like, yeah. maybe we have a yes. very short clip yes, from Mando. This, uh, John Favreau gave us permission just to show. This is a little behind the scenes uh, of, of what previous looks like on mo one of the most recent episodes. Just came out a couple weeks ago. So if we have that queued up, let's play that. that. Let, let's play what today's previous looks like. And it's and the it, same techniques. Like you're trying yes. first to work out the story, and then go ahead and roll it anytime you have it, and then you. Um, and then you work out the, the techniques, and in that case, it's, now it's all digital motion control with real actors. Um, and it really helps us as actors to have this to look at. I mean, it's crazy. So, if you, depending on uh, what it looks like on your screen, you might even think some of those shots are the shots in the film, but that's how sophisticated the previous looks today, when this is, of course, how it played in the episode that you just saw a couple of weeks ago. Um, but yeah, but the other clip there is the, is the four quadrants that shows both the creative uh, material that was bought off, which is the equivalent of the Kerner dolls that they did uh, back on Jedi, but then also all the technical planning that goes into that. And then for us, like when we have to do fight scenes and everything, to be able to see it and, and where the angles are going to be and how it's going to be shot, you know, it's like taking storyboarding to this whole other level and it, it just keys everybody in to that one vision and, and it makes the process so much more fluid and, and just helpful. But um, it's a lot of work that goes into that. Although I still like the Barbie doll thing yes. that uh, we were watching before. It's still a good technique. <laughs> but um, speaking of, you know, uh, all this, when, Neil, when you were working like with Jim Henson's uh, studio and, and Lucasfilm, they were two of the biggest um, shops that were working simultaneously to, yep. to do Return of the Jedi. Um, what, what was it that was helping to advance, uh, you know, the art of puppetry and creature fabrication? Because I know I wrote on a Bantha in the Book of Boba Fett, yeah. and it was puppetry and mechanics, yep. and I mean, it was a living, breathing animal to me. But yeah, how I, far has it gone? Well, I think, you know, one has to step back a little earlier than that to say the work of Ray Harryhausen, and, you know, which we, you know, most of us here would consider to be the godfather of visual effects. We, we're all in some way, shape or form uh, inspired by Ray. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, as, as we're coming into this period, we, you know, technology like it is with digital is beginning to move out of animation as being the primary uh, uh, form of putting a character onto the screen and practical puppetry and all of those things are starting to happen. So uh, the truth of the matter is, is we haven't got a, you know, I would imagine that uh, people like Phil and, 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 as I say, Stuart and all those people, they, and uh, ourselves, uh, obviously I'm not here at this time, but I know the people that worked at this time, they hadn't got a clue what they were doing. I mean, it, it was every day was a new day for them, and it was a new material. It was it was a, a time of invention. It was a time of learning from your mistakes, and a, a really innovative and really creative time. And um, I think that that's what you see, and, and that's what we take away. When I look back, uh, I just I find such huge inspiration for them 
for all the things they did, the, how brave they were, how uh, they were able to utilize. They couldn't hide from things. Today, when we do things and I have a problem, I just say, Rob, can you just get rid of that for me? <laughs> and, uh, you know, it disappears. But no, in those days, they had to hide and do all those things. So I think it is a, it is a really fascinating and wonderful period of, of all of these people who contributed, which there are many, many of them, uh, uh, to all aspects of how those characters were brought to the screen. And, of course, I have a dear love and memory from Jim and all the work that Jim did and people like Rick Baker also, uh, who were also pioneering in all of these techniques at the time. Yeah. 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 And even to this day, right, we, we have our Grogu, but it, it's a practical. And, uh, yeah. you know, I, I think it lends itself to that realism and, and a sense of having someone or something there that you can react to. You know, it's both, it, it's great to have both where you have the visual yeah. effects as well as the practical, and, and, and it, it just gives it content. Yeah, and I think it's something that is so unique in many ways and wonderful to the Star Wars stories, the, the film stories, is that the practical effects were, in, in a sense, the only way of doing them at the time, and that legacy has stayed, and we've thankfully held on to that, which I believe is something that we would want to do in the future, if you still want us to. And, um, you know, we continue forward, you know, make it an instant part of it. Thank you so much. <laughs> now, now, before all that can happen, we need the designs, right, Doug? And, and I remember collecting um, Ralph McQuarrie's books and, and all the beautiful designs, um, you know, from Star Wars to Empire Strikes Back. And, and you, now I'm collecting your books and your beautiful designs. Um, I'm just wondering, like, Jabba the Hutt was this character went, that went through many, many versions before George Lucas said, okay, that's the one. For you, what was that, ex what is the experience like to create these Star Wars creatures and then coming to that one moment where you're like, yes, this is the final, this is the final image of this character or this creature. No, I mean, for designs, we do so many designs. I mean, literally hundreds of not thousands before, you know, they're approved. And for character design, it's really tricky. And, and this is something that I learned from George when I worked with him on the prequels. And it started with the Return of the Jedi, where Phil Tippett would actually sculpt these characters. And we literally approach creature design like casting for actors because we're trying to capture personalities. And like George, I remember he said for Java, you know, model it after Sydney Greenstreet from Casablanca. And that became the character archetype for that. And so when we design now for all of our characters, like, you know, for the prequels, I literally, we had a whole lineup on our Friday reviews where we had these little character types. And sometimes we weren't given enough information in terms of what the character was gonna be, but we just kind of threw out ideas. And George would come in and literally look across the lineup as if there are 3D headshots and say, oh, this would be a great sidekick, this would be a great villain, and this would be the hero. And if he didn't have names, at that time, he would actually give them names right there on the spot. And that's where George was brilliant with that. And I'm finding the similar process now with John Favreau, where we'll pitch ideas for characters, and he'll have a very specific actor in mind, like say, you know, let's model it after this person, and we'll try to see if we can capture that essence in a creature form. The only difference was that for Grogu, he didn't have a character in mind. He actually had an animal. He said, make it like a puppy dog. <laughs> and so that was the only difference. But otherwise, we approach creature designs the same way, and there are hundreds of drawings that, that go into the design. And we're, we're looking at um, Jabba the Hutt here, of course. Um, and I remember, you know, seeing behind the scenes where they had to slime him up and, and you know, make him feel real. And I, I'm just wondering, Neil, um, with a huge, massive, remarkable, um, practical creature such as Jabba the Hutt, what, what were some of the... Um, uh, inspiration that you took from this character and, and what kind of experience did you have like in creating a, a large-scale creature like the, the, the sea cows in um, The Last Jedi? Yeah, I think that, you know, what, what uh, is it remarkable about Jabba is that uh, essentially it, it is, it's, it's an enormous puppet, isn't it? And, and it's brought to life by a number of puppeteers that are all working together in one choreographed fashion to make this work. And, uh, you know, that was one of the, 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 the big things, I think, that came out of that, was that creatures were not um, technically designed at the, f at the very uh, be core of what they were. they were. They were to be performed by people, by artists in their own right. 
And um, it, when we had the opportunity of doing the sea cow, I mean, uh, you know, that was a great opportunity. It was also an extraordinary thing that we were going to fly it in on a helicopter, put it on the right on the edge of the coastline. We had a number of hours to work with before the tide came in and drowned everybody. So we needed to make sure that we got it in and we got it. And, and, and then the fun side of that was uh, I, I got the great joy of not only putting puppeteers inside the sea cow, but actually sealing them in there as well. They were in there to stay. Cruel. That is cruel because I'm sure it was cold and it's heavy. <laughs> they went yeah. in through the top of the neck. The neck then folded down and we sealed the neck up and that was it. They, we, they had biscuits and all kinds of things to keep them happy. Are they, are they and, still um, in there, Neil? Are they still in there? They, they, we really wanted to do that. We wanted to just shout cut and literally all just leave. And uh, no, no. So, you know, the inspiration is exactly the same thing. You're, you, you know, whether it's a small character that's on your hand or whether it's a large character, it really won't live unless it's, unless I think some form of it or a substantial amount of it is performed by a, a, a human being, an artist. Yeah. Uh, and that's not to take away from, you know, robots and, and, and animatronics essentially as being a, a performable entity, but there's a soul that we as a species bring to something and that's, yeah. that's really important to the art, that art, isn't it? And then to be able to design the, because I remember, you know, all our puppeteers were so incredible and they had to be so agile and they were in awkward positions a lot of times for hours on end. And, uh, it, you know, you have to try to design it where they can work with it for those hours and, and, and be able to still give it that life. And it's a lot of technical things yeah. that go into making it workable. Yeah, I think, yeah. you know, the, one of the things I always say to people is if you just want to get a, a sensation of what that's like, if you try and hold your hand up for any period of time, just put something in your hand and hold it there, you'll very quickly realize just how physical even hand puppetry is. So, yeah, these people are physical performers who are also actors, who are also artists all in their right. So it's a very, I mean, it's a wonderful job to do. It's an incredible job, yeah. And Doug, um, for both The Mandalorian and The Book of Boba Fett, you know, something I know a little bit about. <laughs> now, the they, Mando took place, like what, five years after um, Return of the Jedi's events. Uh, how did Return of the Jedi influence the overall approach to designing these series? You know, did, you know because you, you had to like absorb some of this but still make Mandalorian and the Book of Boba Fett stand on its own. What's I mean, that was actually a lot of the fun that we had in doing, you know, the Mandalorian and the Book of Boba Fett, was that we could build upon Return of the Jedi. I mean, Return of the Jedi established so many iconic places and sets like Jabba's Palace. And so when we were actually gonna return there for Book of Boba Fett, it was really a wonderful opportunity because I remember watching Return of the Jedi and I wanted to find out more about, you know, what is in that palace? Where are all the other rooms? You know, because it seemed like a terrific set. So we had that opportunity in Book of Boba Fett because we were gonna visit the kitchen. We were gonna visit Boba's bedroom. We were gonna visit the hangar. And so the idea was to really go back and see if we can find any drawings that Norm Reynolds might have done in terms of what that palace was gonna be. And we didn't find that much. So our approach was really taking what we've seen and then building on it, you know, extrapolating the aesthetic from it. And our approach was really to pretend that, okay, we were back in the 1980s, this is what George would have done. He just didn't build it or shoot it, but we were gonna do it now. And it was really fun because we were basically building upon what we had seen and loved so much. And for me, it was very fulfilling to really realize other rooms of Jabba's Palace. And I hope we get more opportunities to do more of that. Yeah. I know, I know I was freaked out when I had to like be in that set. It was surreal. The details of every single thing in there was, you know, spot on. Yeah, there I am! No. <laughs> it's so still surreal. Um, Rob, okay, so with um, the visual effects, you were the visual effects supervisor for Solo, a Star Wars story. Um, yes! Uh, how, how do you, you know, the, the, those flight sequences, you know, when they did Return of the Jedi, it was miniature Falcons, right? It was almost models. And now you're able to do it digitally. So um, what are the challenges and what are the differences in, in, in those two? 
Yeah, one of the really fun things we can do today is make that experience on set even more immersive. So for the Falcon, it was one of the earlier projects where we wrapped a projection screen um, around the cockpit of the Falcon so that the actors could actually be inside the Falcon and see the Kessel Run out in front of them. There was almost 20 pages, so about 20 minutes of the movie takes place inside that little cockpit. So you could imagine if, if that was just done in front of a blue screen, that might be a lot to keep track of for the actors, but in this case, when there's a space monster out the window, they're seeing a space monster. I remember the first time um, we put the cast up in this, in this set, um, and we just had a gray image on the screen. It was, wasn't even really turned on. So as far as they were concerned, it was just gonna be a blue screen or something. They were starting to do the first rehearsal, and I was standing by behind the scenes, and it was Donald Glover in there, and the entire cast, Alden Elbert, everybody was in the, in the cockpit, and they finished this scene, and um, I think it was Phoebe who pushes the hyperspace levers, and when she did that, I go like, um, cue hyperspace, to the guys who are doing the thing, and this is what comes up on the screen, and all the cast goes, whoa! This is unbelievable, This because hyper, they're really going in hyperspace, and somebody goes, are we really going to the planet we're supposed to go to? And we're like, what if, because the cockpit was shaking. So it gives us an opportunity to integrate all of these skills, the lighting, the visual effects, the practical construction of these amazing um, places all together. And, and we're able to build on this, oh, sorry. No, 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 it, it, I, this is really hard work, okay, people? It's not like just going to an amusement park ride. This is, this is kind of hard work. A custom-built amusement park ride just for that day of shooting. Um, it's super fun. And we're standing with people who've been doing this such a long time. Like, I get to, I'm so lucky to get to work with such amazingly talented people at ILM. People like, um, I've gotten to work with Ken Ralston before. We have Dennis Mirren. Bill George worked on Return of the Jedi and still works at ILM today as a supervisor supervising um, shows. In fact, he, he works on Star Tours. Uh, to give you an idea, so he gets to do some of those simulator ride kind of experiences. That's Bill sitting in the middle there. Uh, they're working on a Star Tours ride there with uh, George Lucas. Um, just absolutely incredible. So that design sensibility, Bill George was a mod is a model maker, is a supervisor, has all of these skills, and he and Dennis Muren and others can teach us the, the tricks that were working back then that are still applicable today, and then we can build on those with today's latest technology and you know, artistic experiments. Amazing. Okay, so um, I, I, um, I'm going to uh, now move forward because uh, thank you so much. You guys were incredible. I, I'm mesmerized by all the behind the scenes and all of everyone. But we've got more party people coming in. And uh, so without further ado, we're going to introduce the next group of panelists. You, they don't need any introduction. Please welcome Anthony Daniels of C3PO. Uh, I was hoping for a few more people giving me the, the Ewoks alarm there, but have any of you seen Return of the Jedi? <laughs> oh, well, another time then. Hello. Still have that godlike complex, do you? <laughs> no, from the film. Remember C-3PO? Was, he was considered a god by the Ewoks. Oh, it's against my programming. Oh, that's yes, right. yes, that's right. <laughs> And then speaking of Ewoks, please welcome Warwick Davis! And Wicked! Wicked! Woo! I am so, okay. All right, now things are going to get a Thank little, you. you know, darker. And, uh, before you ask, I'm not going to bow, Anthony, oh. no. Ah! 
Thank you for that lovely welcome celebration. Thank you so much. All right. Well, all this struggle couldn't be without this next gentleman who plays the incredible Dark Force Palpatine, Ian McDermott. <laughs> And last but not least, Billy D. Williams has left the Caribbean! Thank you. Beautiful people, thank you. Oh my goodness, okay, whew. I'm gonna try to not totally geek out here. Here we go. Um, I'm going to, uh, right, these days when we go to work, you know, we don't have to go to the desert. Tantui comes to us, but your first day of shooting Return of the Jedi, and this is for Anthony and Billy D. Um, you were there, and apparently there was a, uh, a, a, a sandstorm, a massive stand, sandstorm the first day of shooting Return of the Jedi. Uh, I was just wondering if you can tell us a little bit about that first day, what you recall. Um, how was it, Anthony, to work in that costume? in that environment? I, I think you're talking about uh, in stage two at L Street. Is that um, one? Perhaps. Yeah. Yes. Um, do, do you remember this? Um, they filled a well, sound I stage. The Millennium sound. Falcon was there, and they filled the sound stage with sand, and that's it. And huge dustbin fulls of sand and full as earth and muck and everything and big propellers that sucked it up into the air. and they shouted action and they started the fans. And from that moment, nobody could see or hear anything. And everybody was just bumping into the scenery because it wasn't around. And of course, it took days to clear the place up after that was sand everywhere in the canteen, all around the studio and whatever. And you never saw it. It was cut. Was it cut? <laughs> wow. Show business. <laughs> Um, w was it tough to be in that costume, or, or has it evolved since <laughs> the first Star Wars? Well, Neil, Neil would know very well uh, that for various reasons, um, oh, I mustn't go into that. Um, there are people listening. Um, it's, uh, the, the first costume was made in 1976 by a terrific crew. It was made out of fiberglass and, and uh, plastic and aluminum, and, and, and me. Look at those sneakers. <laughs> And um, it w was remarkable because after six months, I said, you know, can I rehearse in it? And they said, no, it has to go uh, to Tunisia to be on set. And I saw it two weeks later. And for the first time, and many of you uh, will have heard, you know, it took two hours to get into, into this suit. And uh, I was there for the rest of the day. And uh, it was pretty bad. But, you know, I stuck with it for 40-something years. <laughs> Yes, so it bears its marks, but it's improved over time. And as you were saying, you need to, uh, to make things uh, for the actors, the puppeteers particularly, to be able to do all that kind of thing and, and be comfortable. And you do a great job, I know. So thanks to everybody behind the scenes of that costume. And... So, Billy D, you don't remember about that first day? No? Okay. <laughs> Just wipe out your, wipe that all out. Um, 
Well, Anthony, uh, just uh, to continue with uh, your experience with Return of the Jedi, when you were in the Redwood Forest, you had an opportunity to work with um, Warwick as an 11-year-old at the time. Do you recall meeting and, and, and working with Warwick? Oh, yes. Um, 11? Do you remember? Uh, yes, uh, I do. How was it? Yeah, I was in awe of you. Quite right, too. I'm like, wow, there's... <laughs> because you'd been watching me for how many years? Oh, probably uh, about four years at that point. Yeah. I didn't realize there was something soft and squidgy inside. <laughs> <laughs> it was amazing. It was. Trouble is, uh, most of the Ewoks did, I have to say, look the same. You know, they're strange eyes. They were meant to be animated, weren't they, originally? Uh, animatronic eyes, that didn't happen. But you stuck out for two reasons. You were the, the tiniest Ewok, and you were the only person who actually animated your face. And if we can get a close-up now, because the only thing you could do, not the eyes, do you know where we're going with this? Okay, can we go into a close-up here of Warwick? I don't know, but... Um... Okay, so, the only bit of wicket that still lives is this bit. Uh... It was my actual tongue I could get through between the teeth, which actually, as Anthony says, brought the face to life. You tried that with 3PO, didn't it? <laughs> I it did. freaked everyone out. <laughs> didn't go so well. But you were, you were uh, delightfully energetic, and you were so happy to be there. You were having a great time. Me, I'm whinging away in my suit, and you're frolicking about. Well, all the other Ewoks were old and moaning, weren't they? Yes. They used to call me the ever-ready Ewok, because I just wanted to do more. Everyone would be on tea break or collapsed, and I'd want to do another take. Well, you had to, because you didn't get it right first time. Oh. Oh. Here we go, here we go. <laughs> Anthony, he was 11. <laughs> what an amazing... I mean, you were a big Star Wars fan, even back then. Uh, yeah, I was, yeah. I remember, like, a lot of people here lining up to see Star Wars and uh, missing that showing, getting to the front of the line, they closed the door waited for two hours and went to see the next showing. And at that point, realized that, um, you know, movie making had been changed forever because uh, this had a huge impact on me as a kid. I went home and told my mum the entire story, which actually took longer than the movie itself. Um, <laughs> yeah, but at that point, I was seven. I didn't know when I was 11, I'd have a chance to join that kind of whole um, adventure as a boy. Uh, nowadays, um, Youngsters among the audience, you know, you play video games to live out your characters on the screen. But I was able to do it for real. Battling stormtroopers, uh, you could never have so much fun as an 11 year old. It was amazing. Oh, look at me. Oh, look at you right there. Amazing. So there you can see my dad to the right of me there with the Blue Harvest shirt on. Now, Blue Harvest was the kind of name given to the production so that we didn't get fans like yourself snooping around the set. It was horror beyond imagination. But we also had a, another fake title, didn't we? Revenge of the Jedi. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. I mean, horror beyond imagination was inspired by you, I think. <laughs> they talked oh, to me and said, what was know. it like to meet Anthony? And uh, that's what I said. I can imagine a lot. Uh, people were totally not Cool. There we were in Europe, Yuma, Arizona, and everybody was wearing uh, Blue Harvest stuff and so on, and, and in the Redwood Forest where we were. And, uh, you know, people would come up, they'd be seeing the set from a distance, and they would come to the wire and say, you know, how, how come is there a gold robot in a horror movie? It's a Star Wars film, isn't it? And, yeah, we weren't fooled at all, but it made uh, great memorabilia, didn't it? Absolutely, and they said, those teddy bears aren't scary. What are you doing? And talking of great memory being Exactly. <laughs> Scary teddy bears, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. <laughs> the end of Palpatine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that, that voice, we recognize it so well. Now, Ian, when, when, you, when you were like working on that, that, that character voice uh, for Palpatine um, and, and tra transforming it, you know, that emperor's... What, what were some of the processes that you had to go through to, to find it? Because then later on, you play actually a younger version of the emperor. Yes. Um, you know, I mean, you were Palpatine and then this, you know. So know, between the I two, what, how, how did you balance? It's incredibly confusing going... Because <laughs> I was just a kid when I was playing this 120-year-old, more or less. And then I went back to being my own age, which is really terrifying. <laughs> in the prequels 
And then I ended up not to be dead, to a lot of people's surprise, particularly <laughs> my own. <laughs> and uh, I, yeah, all time. I was uh, very glad to be back, of course, you know. And uh, people said, I don't believe it. He died, he was thrown down that chute, you know, after the Ewoks conquered the world, conquered the planet, conquered the universe. I don't know, I can't follow these things. <laughs> and uh, I said, yeah, because I remember asking George after we completed that sequence, because I don't know if you know this, but in order to throw somebody down, for it to look like that in the movies, you have to yank people up. So I was on a harness for most of a week while they yanked me up in order that I could look as if I was being thrown down eventually by, by Dave. And all Dave Prowse had to do um, George said was to catch my feet as I was going around, you know. Well, he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, but, it, but it was fun. It was, it, was, it was great fun. And the voice, to answer your question, sort of came out of the, of the horrible face. As, as Nick Dudman slowly created this monster, I thought, well, he looks disgusting. He should sound disgusting. So I sort of, I sort of went into that, you know. It's... Uh, it, it, to put it crudely, it was initially, anyway, a voice on the vomit. Oh, <laughs> nice. And, and you know what I mean, just there. And, and one of my favorites. My favorite thing is could you do it with the cackle? Oh, that. The evil cackle. Is well, it possible? Somebody's got to say something amusing. Over to you, Anthony. <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't really. Uh, we love to tease each other. Um, here we go. <laughs> Okay, that's, um, that's my voice finished for the rest of celebration. Now, Billy D, um, Ian was talking about being, you know, tied up and, and doing all this physical stuff. When you were playing Lando Carizian, the suave, you know, just, um, well, I guess he was the administrator of uh, Cloud City. Uh, I'm wondering, what was it like, though, when you came back to do Return of the Jedi, and you had to hang upside down during the Sarlacc scene, where you were being, you know, uh, you were on, you were on that for a while, and then you were like, you know, um, uh, sliding down and being like all that physicality of 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 what you had to do in that scene. Was it difficult? Did you love it? Um, do you I remember? hated it every moment. <laughs> It was hot, I'm sure, and uncomfortable, <laughs> so. Very uncomfortable. <laughs> um. <laughs> I remember, actually, because I was, the camera was on Jabba's uh, barge, you know, shooting across, and we were all under the canopy of the sails, and you, were, you can see the shadows. You were right out there for hours, hanging upside down, on a wire, I think, around your ankle, and blistering heat. Very uncomfortable. <laughs> so you wouldn't do it again? I'm so sorry I missed that part of the filming in my furry suit. <laughs> Can I just say, while we have a hiatus here, how privileged I feel to be sitting amongst such esteemed company of actors yes. and creators here as well. I mean, it's amazing. It Am is. I worthy, really? I... Well, I think we're very pleased to be sitting, even though you played an Ewok, with you. Thank you, Ian. Thank you. But to be absolutely uh, correct here, you, you said as I was waiting a long time in the wings to come on, along with Ian, who had to sit down eventually. We, we were out there. So I listened to you talking about uh, the difference between the digital, one of the differences between a digital character and something that's puppeteered. And basically, I was puppeteering 3PO, and you have had many, many puppeteered uh, creatures, and you have done most of them, haven't you? Yes. Um, they're all in the same way. You're, you're, yeah, anyway. Um, but the difference is that with a human inside, now many digital artists are brilliant at creating a uh, fake humanity, but you, only when you have a soul in there do you get something actually visceral and something that we as humans do feel an animal quality within there. So I love the fact that you honor the, the puppeteers who are generally sweating away behind, behind the mask. Well done. 
Love your work, Rob. Love your work, though. Thank you. Okay. You're so right. That combination, that combination of that human performance with the with the physical performance uh, with the physical puppeting and the digital, Look, the, we can do things that we couldn't do before. And you're so right to highlight the talented artists. Sometimes uh, hundreds or thousands of them behind the scenes getting every frame. You know right. what, though, Rob? I mean, I think you know. I sense a real atmosphere. I think you can come back with a bit of a one on that, can't you? In, in defense of the digital artists. No, it's, a, it's, it's a, no. just a, a very simple Something thing. Something witty and down for me at ILM on the last movie. Eventually, the uh, C3PO uh, panties got a, a. I was going to say a bit stiff, and that suddenly came <laughs> totally not what I meant. The plan. Right here, Anthony gets stiff in the suit. <laughs> can it cope? As you once ma asked me, when I do you remember saying to me, I want these celebrations. So, Anthony, when you, uh, when you put on the suit, does everything go like stiff? Do you I remember saying that? I didn't that? mean to say it, honestly. I wasn't looking for a laugh. It was, um, it was but one, of the <laughs> one of the things that happened was I couldn't do some of the scenes with the whole pants on, so I wore a sort of the top gold bit. And then ILM digitally stitched in uh, the, the pants, as it were, so I could climb up mountains and run through the desert. I'm hugely grateful. <laughs> now, what can't be digitally enhanced or anything is uh, John Williams' scores, right? And, and John Williams, he, of course, adds in so much to the films. And Ian, um, supposed, supposedly, you um, actually watched him in scoring the film at one point. Um, can did. you tell us a bit about that memory? Yeah, it was at uh, the Abbey Road Studios in London, famous for many recordings of great orchestras and uh, great rock and pop groups. The Beatles used to record there. And George said, come along and watch us put the music on. And there was the enormous and enormously wonderful London Symphony Orchestra and London Symphony Chorus. And this is a lot of people. Uh, and John standing in the middle, conducting with a screen and doing tiny bits, little excerpts of the movie at a time. And uh, he'd do it a couple of times. And then he'd come in to the recording studio and listen. And he'd bring the heads of all the departments of the orchestras in with him. And George would say, hey, that's great, John, thanks. Can we move on? And, and uh, John would say, no, certainly not. You know, it's, it's, it's not great at all. It's really imperfect. And then the heads of the various department would say where they thought they got it wrong and how they could do it better. That's what you guys were talking about earlier on. It's a sort of the quest for perfection went on in that very room. And uh, he also, I'm sure most of you know this, apart from being, I think, probably the best contemporary uh, composer around of classical music as well as, you know, for concerts as well as for film scores. He had enormous patience and charm, and he was professionally immaculate. His timing was so exact, but uh, he wouldn't leave it there. If there was a note out of place or there was something that could be improved, he was on it. Wow. We're going to have to work. Yeah. We're going to have to work on your George Lucas impersonation, right? Sorry? We're going to have to work on your impersonation. Yes, I know. Okay. I just, I, I just generalized American. I apologize to all the general Americans, <laughs> especially you, Billy right. Dee. Now, Billy Dee, there's got to be one story of you enjoying <laughs> shooting something in Star Wars. Anything? Come on. <laughs> well, I think you're keeping it all secret because actually Billy D. Williams is going to have a book that will come out soon. Yeah, What's the my, title of the book, Billy? Billy it's D. my uh, autobiography. Oh. Um, what have, it's being uh, published by uh, Kanaf in the, the U.S. And uh, out here in the UK, Otter and Strawton. Is it how you pronounce it? Strawton. Yeah. And uh, it's called uh, What Have We Here? Nice. Yeah. 
So I guess if we want to hear any stories, we will have to wait for his book. <laughs> well, what have, you, what have we here? Portraits of my life. Well, we will definitely. A crazy get life. Can we all wonderful, plug our books now? A wonderful world. Have you world. got a book, Ian? Ian, have you got a book? Have I got a book? No, 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 I can't write. It's a I, can, I can barely read. Um, no, it's not. If you could, what would it be called? It's a wonderful um, whirlwind of a um, it would, uh, extraordinary experience or experiences. Going all the way back to when I started it on, on, in a Broadway musical when I was six and a half years old. Wow. A Kurt Weill musical with La Helena. Do you know those names? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, it was a lot of fun. That's great. That's wonderful. Well, we look forward to it. <laughs> Congratulations on getting a book. And now Billy Dee is also an author. Um, Anthony, Return of the Jedi uh, was the conclusion of the original trilogy. And we all know that um, you've had many more performances as C-3PO in your future. But at the time, did you ever think you were going to play C-3PO again? I'm After terrible. this? It's a, it's a good question, because when we did... You were going to ask uh, what the title of my book was. I, I was going to say that, Anthony. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, do you have a book out? Yes, I do. What's it called? <laughs> it's called I Am C-3PO, The Inside Story. Ah, clever. I like it. And uh, since you ask, Anthony, what my book's called, are you asking that? No. What? Ow. Ow. It's called Size Matters Not. Thank you. And, uh, is it a Yoda? It's a oh, Yoda really, book. it is. Autobiography, yeah. It's about Yoda. Yes, just like Yoda. See what I've done there? Uh, yes. Size very, and all that. Very good. Yeah. Anyway, so you were Doug, asking me a right. question. I'm sure you've done. Um, have you got well, a coffee no, table? No, but um, apparently somebody else wants gone. to have the last word. Okay. And I think it's this scoundrel here. Let's uh, hear what um, Harrison Ford has to say in his greeting for us. Hey, Return of the Jedi turns 40. I'm so grateful the film's held up after all this time, with a lot of credit going to Mark and Carrie and to all of the fine panelists that are with you now. It's you all, the fans, that are the ones that keep these stories alive, and I'm thankful for the opportunities your love of these films has given me over the course of my career. Thank you. Enjoy this year's celebration, and may the Force be with you all. Okay, well, can we just give a huge round of applause to our esteemed panelists? Woo! Thank you. Thank you, Billy, Ian, Warwick, Anthony, Doug, Rob, and Neil. Happy 40th. And I'm excited to announce that Return of the Jedi will return to theaters for a limited time starting later this month. Welcome back to the floor here at Star Wars Celebration Europe. And I am at the top's booth with the top man, Andrew. Don't mean to offend any of your co-workers, but I don't think they heard. How's it going? It's going so well. Uh, it's going so well. I appreciate you calling me the top's man. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a work of art here at the Topps booth. This isn't really a booth, though. This is more of a card shop if you were in Tatooine. So okay. we built this to look in-world, so I appreciate you giving us all the respect it deserves. But I don't know if you've seen like all the cool stuff we've built here, but this feels about as good as you're going to get. I do now feel, now you mention yeah. it, I feel like I'm in a card store on Tatooine, and yeah. I now realize I offended you in my introduction. This is Lots my of hard work. Yeah, yeah. Destroyed in the yeah. A couple of words leaving my mouth. I apologize. So. Uh, tell us, I mean, Topps obviously a lot of history to the company, but yeah. tell us what you guys are doing here specifically at Celebration. Yeah, so Topps is making Star Wars cards since 1977, but we've built a special set called uh, Galaxy, the Celebration Edition. Galaxy's our card art set. And we built uh, a card set based on art from UK-based artists, all exclusive, all original art, built in these cards that you're seeing here, only available at Celebration. And uh, generally we say it's day one of Celebration, day two of Celebration, yeah. but 
You guys say so. volume one of Celebration. Right. There's different volumes each day, right? We try to be cinematic in our approach to everything involving cards. So we have four volumes of cards. Each volume represents a different day of, uh, of sales, but each volume represents a different area of the content. So the original trilogy, the, the sequels, the prequels, and then sort of that Mandoverse that you see now. So four different layers of, uh, of content four different areas of subjects that would be in the cards, and so we're offering four different products. Can we see some cards, please, Andrew? That's what, a, what we're what, here what for. What an amazing segue, Jamie. Would you like to see some cards? I am here to see cards. I'm so do you want to open, do you want to rip a box of cards? Sure, can you, you, want, can you hold the mic? Can I trust you? Yeah, I'm gonna go, I'll see you later. All right. Good. See you later. I've so, got the cards, you've got the mic. So if you open up the box, mm -hmm. this is our collectible packaging. Obviously, it's a magnetic box right. here. How do I do it? Oh. Listen, I'm glad that you I'm don't do a, this. You don't just do... a simple guy making his I'm way through celebration, man. Andrew. Open that. You can see there's our beautiful pack in there. That is beautiful. Yeah. So this is volume two, the prequel trilogy. That is correct. 10,000. So we're looking 2,500. There's 10,000 total. 10,000 of up between all four wow. cards. So in here, what you're going to find is 10 cards. Eight cards are what we call base. Two are numbered parallels, so that the more rare versions. You may even get the actual sketch cards or art cards that the artists use to make the actual cards. So let's hope you get uh, get some luck here. This is the most uh, awkward. Think, bit Jamie, of this is opening. really going well. Oh, can you believe I'm dealing with this kind of stuff here? All right, here we go. Oh wow. Okay. So let's see what we got. Okay. Whoa, that's a good one. General Grievous there. Wow. Anakin Skywalker, yep. circa Revenge of the Sith. Yeah. I got a double Grievous. And that, and that Grievous, by the way, was numbered. That was your one of your parallels. You see how it's purple? Ah, yeah, I see. Yep. Count Dooku. Mesa Windu. And while you're doing this, Yango just Fett. so you know, uh, Galaxy and Galaxy Chrome, this whole series of cards is probably our most popular card set. So that's why we brought the most popular card set to Celebration, which is obviously one of the most fun weekends in Star Wars. Sure, so. sure. Padme, Jar Jar. the one and only Jar Jar Binks, yep. and Qui-Gon of Jin there as well. Beautiful, beautiful. And what's the response to these uh, exclusive sets been like from people visiting so far? I would, I, I would humbly say very, people are very excited. You would. <laughs> I mean, you make something, you make it with your team, everybody puts a lot of hard work and you build this awesome booth and everything, and then people are excited, they buy it and they're excited about the experience, you, you feel good about it, right? So yeah. we feel really grateful that we're here, we feel grateful that you know everybody's so positive about everything we've done, and we're excited to do more. And you mentioned the uh, local artists. Do you want this back, by the way? Yeah, I do. Um, I don't you mentioned the uh, local artists that you commissioned, domestic UK-based artists. Uh, I'm presuming as soon as Celebration was announced to be in London, where you were reaching out to artists. What was the process of choosing the artists that you worked with? We took the artists that best represent these characters, and we kind of picked and chose you know, the ones that would, would most fit for what we're trying to build here. And they were super excited to be a part of it, and then uh, we got them in. Yeah, it was awesome. So everything was hand-drawn. I mean, it's a pretty amazing story. Yeah, no, they're beautiful. It's a, it's a, fun, it's a fun product, so we, 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 we're glad we brought it here. Beautiful looking uh, cards and booth as well. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Andrew, for uh, talking to me. Jim, and thank you. thank you. And if you're thinking, well, they surely can't top that. It must be the end of the stream. I should stop watching. It's not and don't. Our next guests are two great tastes that taste great together. They've been voicing Obi-Wan and Anakin for years now, and they're here to say hello there. Give it up for Matt Lanter and James Arnold Taylor. why he got a lightsaber and I didn't. Hello there. <laughs> Hello there. I think that's why. I think that might be why. <laughs> <laughs> we also love our Anakin Skywalker, don't we? Yes, we do. Of course we do. All right, hello there. Hello, well, hello there. there. Hello there. How are you both? We're <laughs> wonderful. We're at Star Wars Celebration in London. And 
You two are far from first timers to Star Wars Celebration. No, we both have been to many Star Wars Celebrations. I, in fact, I hosted two Star, Star Wars Celebrations on the main stage and had a fantastic time, but nothing like what you all have done now. I love what you've done with the place. <laughs> I've been celebrating Star Wars since I got the gig, so. And probably before. <laughs> and before. Yes, he really is the chosen one because he got to go to George Lucas's private office and see him and hang out with the man himself. It was pretty cool. He's had some wonderful Star Wars experiences. Let's talk a little bit more about that. So now, <laughs> <laughs> great segue. I, I set golf. you up. Yeah. <laughs> now, you've both gotten a chance to work with George Lucas and Dave Filoni. Yes, the other chosen one. The Dave other Filoni. chosen one, yes, the master and the apprentice at one point, but, yeah. you know, Dave Filoni's certainly a master now in his own right. Isn't he, you know? How cool is it? Dave is going to be making a Star Wars movie, huh? The moment we waited for! Awesome! We love to see it. But now you've been working with both of them for quite a while, or you, you did work with them for quite a while. How have all of those years of experience with George and then with Dave changed your perspective on Star Wars? Oh, I mean, it's amazing. So every time we went in to record the Clone Wars, Dave would sit there and, and talk for, it was probably half hour at least. It's amazing at we least. got work done. That <laughs> checks out. He yep. would sit there, aside from laughing, we, we, he would sit there and talk about Star Wars and where the characters were and, and just kind of share his storytelling, which he learned from George. So it was, it was a pretty cool experience for It was us. those moments where we would be recording an episode and he's through the glass and he's on the phone. And then he hangs up the phone and he says, okay, George just said, and we're like, wait a second, George, George, yes. And, the, and it was so great to watch that, uh, to see what he got to learn from the master and what he has taken and made so wonderfully now with everything he's doing. I feel like I've learned a lot about character from Dave. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, it was an amazing, amazing time. Being and a, sketch. Is, He's a great is. artist. So, jo uh, sorry, Dave would sketch characters as we're going. So he would draw little Ahsokas for Ashley and things and then give them to her. Now she's got to hold on to those. Those are worth a fortune now, I'm sure. So. <laughs> I'm sure. I think we have one on the back of our door, actually, over there. <laughs> now, it's the 15th anniversary of the Clone Wars, which I find to be staggering. I can't believe it's been that long. It's amazing. Matt, do you have a favorite moment from making the Clone Wars, either together or just in general? Some of my favorite moments from the Clone Wars are, are moments like this. You know, where we're all on stage, we're all just celebrating the Clone Wars and, and Star Wars in general and uh, traveling with these guys, being up at the ranch um, and, and just, I mean, truthfully, like seeing the joy that it brings on people's faces. People come up to, um, you know, come up to us and, and just talk about it. It was, it was my childhood or, or, you know, some traumatic event happened, but the Clone Wars got them through. Those are the little meaningful things that you don't forget. Um, so along with enjoying it, I mean, it's really, it, it brings people through tough times. And those are the really, really cool things to hear. And it brings people together. It does, yeah. It does. What about for you, James? Oh, I would, I would wholeheartedly agree with what Matt said. I mean, it's just, it's a life-changing experience to be a part of it. You know, I saw Star Wars, I'm, I'm the old man in the room right now, but uh, I saw Star Wars when I was seven years old in a drive-in movie theater, changed my life, never thought that one day I'd get to be old Obi-Wan. Now, I, I think I'm one of the only people, if not the only person here that was actually in the first Clone Wars. So if you see those 20 years, uh, Clone Wars 20, that's because the micro series of the Clone Wars, and I was Obi-Wan in that, that was the first time I got to play Obi-Wan. So. Got some fans of the A micro couple. series. Yeah. Now looking back on all that work that you've both done as Obi-Wan, as Anakin, Sky Guy, <laughs> what are you most proud of as your part of the legacy for these characters who are just larger than life in the Star Wars galaxy? I think that in the Clone Wars, we got to see Anakin a little different than we did in the films. And I feel like George and Dave wanted to take the Clone Wars time to sort of expand the character of Anakin and, and make him a hero that we really, really loved. 
And so when he falls and he becomes Darth Vader, I, I feel like it's that much more sad. It's so much more tragic because you rooted for this guy. You cared for him. And it also adds more to, to his story as to why he turned and the loss of Ahsoka, which is something we didn't know about. Um, so I think all of that, it's, it's been such a joy to, to just add to that character and make him so much more rich than he already was. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean, Hayden and Matt complement each other so much, this character of Anakin Skywalker, and they bring so much to it. And I just, I'm, I'm honored to get to work with this guy on a regular basis. He's an amazing actor, a wonderful friend. And you, we live near each other, and he actually lives on a big hill now just so he can say, I have the I high have ground. The high ground. <laughs> it's not fair. It's true, I have the high ground. And that would say, I would say for me, uh, the, bringing the sass to Obi-Wan Kenobi has been the funnest, yes. I, I love that. So, yeah. I love the sass and I love the way you just slip into the voice there. Yes. <laughs> it's good. It's real good. <laughs> I didn't hear that. We got a shout out. I don't know what We got was. a shout out of some kind, but uh, you're, you're quoting all these wonderful quotable quotes. Is there a line from the show that is less quotable and more haunting because it was really difficult to get out in the moment. You got one? I, well, it, it's not difficult to get out necessarily, but Anakin says something like, and it, I, it, this might not even be verbatim, but something like, uh, I realize more than you know, I, I realize what it's like wanting to leave the order. And that says so much to me. Oh, I can see the episode. I can yeah. see it. Yeah. And it's something that we've never really seen Anakin kind of voice that he sort of is handcuffed. He's kind of felt chained. And he's sort of voiced that to Ahsoka. Um, uh, but yeah, that was, that was such an intimate moment. That I, I loved that moment. It takes strength to resist the dark side. Only the weak embrace it. That's a good one. Now, why is that one haunting you? Well, that episode was haunting for me. So we would get the scripts when we walked in the room. I did not know, spoiler alert, I think it's Star Wars Celebration, it's okay to say. Uh, season five, uh, Satine, I did not know what was gonna happen. So oh. when, when Obi-Wan says Satine under his breath, those were little ad-libs, those were moments that would just happen because it was, it was heart-wrenching to be there and to be a part of that. So yeah, those, are, those moments are haunting because I also think Obi-Wan is a true believer. He wanted to see if he could save Darth Maul. He really believed that there was a chance with Ventress or with any of these people that he could maybe save them or any of these people. You were my brother! <laughs> any of these people, who are you talking about? <laughs> Get over it. Now you mentioned before, you know, just how important the Clone Wars is to a lot of fans out there. People grew up with it, it got them through difficult times. Is there anything you want to say to everyone who has been with the Clone Wars for the majority of or the entirety of this 15 year process, you know, with these stories and with your characters? Thank you all. You all saved Clone Wars. Yeah, all absolutely. of you. Yeah. You all saved Clone Wars. We love you. We truly love you and thank you. Yeah. From the bottom I mean, of our hearts. I mean that. You guys, you guys em embraced the Clone Wars, and, and now we've got seven spectacular seasons of Star Wars content that just adds to the saga and makes it so much more rich. And uh, to be a part of that and to, and to feel the love from you guys and the warmth, it's, it's pretty amazing. And um, yeah, I just think it's, it's great to be able to celebrate, you know, Clone Wars on, on its anniversary and to Star Wars in general. Uh, it's just amazing to be here. Well, that is how we rang in the 10 year anniversary with the surprise of Clone Wars Saved. I remember that quite vividly at, I think, San yeah. Diego Comic Con. Yeah, that, that It was just supposed to be an anniversary panel. We never thought that it would come back, truly. None of us did. So it was fantastic to see that panel. The explosion from everybody there was fantastic, yeah. How emotional was it then for you to also come back and step into those roles again? 
do you want to Well, I mean, for me, I, I never, people ask me this all the time, what was it like to come back? But I, I feel like I never really put Anakin down. I mean, we're, we're always doing video games or, you know, special little projects here and there. And also, I mean, honestly, like, Anakin is a, is a part of me. We've been doing it now for 15, 17, 17 years. 17 years, because we production. started two years prior to it coming out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so I mean, I, I had a Star Wars wedding, you know? <laughs> Shout out. Yeah. Shout out to my, to my wife if, uh, if you're watching back in the States. Um, you know, so it's, it's a part of me now, and it always has been. So I, I never really let it go. Um, but it, it was great to come back and, and be with these guys and be in the booth again, for sure. We were in the same studio that we recorded originally, so it was very magical. I remember the last time we did a scene together was Ashley and myself and, and Dee and Matt. And Dave goes, we got it the first time. Let's just do it again because it's fun to watch you guys. So we did it like two or three more times. And that was the energy of it because we're just really a family. We truly are a family and we just love being a part of it all. Absolutely. I can tell in all the photos that you all take on the convention circuit now. We tend to goof off a little bit. A little. Yeah, a, yeah. Just, a, just a tiny bit. I wasn't going to call it out. But it, you know, speaking of fun, it's always fun to have you two here to hang out with, to talk about Star Wars. We love having you. Thank you so much for everything Thank that you, you do so for much. Star Wars and the Clone Wars and the fandom. We've got lots more to come today on Star Wars Celebration Live. Don't you go anywhere. If you, yes you, like me, are a dedicated follower of Star Wars fashion, then Roosevelt's might be the stand you're looking for here at Star Wars Celebration Europe. Mike is from that stand. Hello, Mike. How are you? Good. How are you doing? Pretty good, thank you. I'm feeling pretty good in this uh, lovely shirt. You're I, looking good, too. Looking even better than you're feeling, probably. Am I able to keep it? Absolutely. It's yours. I mean, you got it on, so it, it yeah. looks, looks perfect thank on you. you. And I made sure to ask you on camera yes. where you pretty much have no choice but to say yes, Jamie. That's you right. Can keep That's it. right. I saw you grab three or four of those ones in your bag over there. So. Yeah, and you haven't checked my pockets yet, either. Nope. Uh, they're big. Um, right, everybody. Uh, there is uh, a lot of uh, shirts here available, uh, but there is one shirt available that is exclusive, exclusive to Star Wars Celebration. In Europe. So, I mean, I feel bad for kind of rubbing it into the people that can't be here, but let's talk yeah. about what they can't have. Well, this is the uh, this is the Ewok Warriors shirt. Uh, like I said, so this is today's exclusive. We have two other ones. We have a Star Wars. Um, it's the Stormtrooper Celebration shirt. That will be tomorrow. And then we have, uh, it's like the Leia Endor camo. So we have that. They'll be here Sunday. But if you swing by a couple hours early the day before, we might just, you know, some might just make their way out from the booth in the back. So, yeah. And this is the first one. Like I said, this is an awesome illustration. It's of all the little Ewok warriors, a little bit more illustrative of the design uh, versus like something like this, which is more of the comic book panel. Super vibrant. This is a droid story. Like you see, soft, stretchy. You can give it a little flex there. You can feel it's super stretch. I've got nothing to flex, but the shirt, yeah, the shirt. If you have something That's to right. flex, the shirt will work for you. Yeah. That's right. And we got a Western vibe yeah. here, which is very fitting for the Mandalorian. That's right. This is Mandalorian. This is called um, Warm or Cold. Bring them in Warm or Cold. So you'll see that stitch, uh, pearl button snaps. Obviously, it fits the Western theme perfectly. So it's the Roper style. So really cool front back. Goes great with, you know, some boots and some spurs in there as well. Yeah, and it is the 40th anniversary of Return of the Jedi, which I know this exclusive is covering, but also we've got an Ewok Endor themed shirt yeah. here. Welcome to Forest Moon. I mean, this one is loud and beautiful. I mean, look at this thing. It is it's wonderful, cute. yeah. So this one, you definitely stand out wearing this. So that your friends will see you coming all the way across the, the, the walkway there. So, yeah. A, mi a mile long walkway, I think. Yeah, That's right. it's, uh, it's especially waiting in line here. <laughs> yeah. There's a, quite a buzz, isn't there? But you are a, uh, we talked about the Celebration uh, yep. exclusive there, today's one, uh, but you are a, a global uh, company, right. so yep. presumably most of these shirts are available yeah, online. Absolutely, it's available online. Yeah, we're, we're ba proudly based out of Hoboken, New Jersey, right, right across New York City, right across the uh, mighty Hudson there. And uh, yeah, we just started shipping to the UK about eight weeks ago, so we're very excited to be here at the Celebration. And yeah, global takeover, we're, we're starting here. 
Speaking of, it does start here. I mean, we've only just opened, and you, you've got a you've got a line. There's a lot of uh, activity yeah. going on here. No, it's fantastic. Everybody's a lot of buzz, and like we like to try. People come down here, can try on a shirt. You know, you see it online. You're, you, you the, it visually it looks great, but you want to feel the quality. You want to just know exactly the size you have. So you walk away with exactly what you're looking for. Yeah, well, again, your stand is very busy, so I think it's best yes. you get back to work, Mike. Back Let's to work, back to work, back to work, back to work, back to work. Thank you, Mike. Thank Please you very sure. much. Mike Please from Roosevelt's. Back to work. All right. Thank you for watching. Stay tuned. Star Wars Celebration Europe 2023 with the Droid Builders Club, and I'm here with my friend Chris. Hey, Chris. Well, hello, Christian. How are you? I'm very well. How are you? How are the droids? I'm tired. I'm excited. I am everything I want to be. This is actually my first one. Awesome. Welcome. Yeah. So Welcome. It's, uh, yes. it's been a dream. All right. Awesome. Well, please show us your booth. Give us a walkthrough. I'd love to meet some of these droids. So we've got some BB's unit, uh, destroyer droid from the uh, first three episodes, uh, some T3 droids. Really excited about having these here. Not many yes. of them, just, not many people build them, uh, and everybody loves them when they see them because it's sort of, oh, where's that from? Where are you excited from? And it, it's a really part of the experience to see this variation of what these droid builders here have been building over the years. Absolutely, and they're absolutely, and there are so many folks who love Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic. I know it's such a great thing, and to have one of these here really does excite us once again it comes to that variation where we're looking at this and once again you've got to think that there aren't actually plans and stuff out of there for, so for all these guys that are doing this what they're really doing is they're looking at the screens they're then judging, judging these and generally building these and to get this much accuracy from what they're doing is just an amazing feat yeah. uh, for what these droid builders actually do this display over here mm -hmm. is all about droid building uh, so what we're here to show you is that you don't need to be a genius mm -hmm. to do this. I wasn't when I first started. I knew nothing, nothing about electronics, nothing about building, nothing about that. There is lots of help from the groups uh, out there, Astromech and R2 Builders, uh, about what's going on. So this one's an example of one that is finished on one side ah. and then not finished on the other. So you okay. can see the internals, you can see what's going on, you can see how all the parts are going together. Of course, we've got our cheeky little pit droids, which are working on all he's this. He's working on it. Yeah, he's, of course. He's working, he's working as fast as he can. Uh, so we've got aluminium builds, just oh, to show nice. different examples of materials that we use uh, for out there. And further down, we've got wooden droids. Uh, so you, once again, because the original ones were all wooden and all, all parts like that that were going on. Now, how long does it take you to go from zero to 50% and 50% to complete? It varies between everybody. Everybody works yeah. at their own pace. Some people are building them for six, eight months. Somebody's building them for three or four years. Yeah. It all depends on what's going on. Uh, it was actually more difficult to build half a droid than it was to build a whole droid, because trying to cut that's things in half and do sure. things like that. Yeah, that's not the usual process. Yeah. So it, it, it's a hard one. Uh, so you can also see that we've got different dome types going on across all of these droids. Uh, so you've got a good section of the R2s, the R7s, the R4s, the R5s uh, throughout this. So you can also see all the different variations of what's going on. Now, talking about things that are sort of made differently, we can't this help but not power. see Lego. Mm -hmm. So our lovely little Lego Sentry droid that's having a wander around here. Uh, completely made of Lego. Uh, we've got a couple of them. There's also a mouse droid, a Lego mouse droid wandering around as well. Uh, so once again, it's just showing that nice little variation in what you can do and the bit of fun that we have within the group. This is R2XL. Uh, I 
I'm Go getting on. the name. I'm getting so I can't help but notice he's a little, a little tall. He is a little tall, and that's because somebody made a small mistake uh, when working out the difference between uh, millimeters and centimeters. Uh, but basically, there is a difference. It would appear uh, there is definitely a small, small difference, uh, and basically they've gone with it. And then what we have is this absolute showpiece. This is, it draws the crowds, everybody loves it. And uh, there's one more slightly amazing part about it. He's not just standstill, he actually drives. He drives? He drives. Uh, so uh, you can actually sit inside of him and he will go around and he will drive. Well, that's fantastic. Woo! Yeah, look at that. Was, I did not see that coming. Hello, sir. Wow! All right, close it up, close it up. No! Back in the box, back in the box. All right, fantastic. Well, we can't beat that. Check out the Droid Builders all weekend long at Star Wars Celebration Europe. Thank you so much, Chris. No Thank you very much, Christian. Wars.com is the only place online that is all Star Wars, all the time. Never trust a pirate. From exclusive reveals and breaking news to interviews with Star Wars luminaries, StarWars.com is the number one destination for the saga we all love. And with an ever-evolving databank of Star Wars information from all eras, crafts, and quizzes, you'll never run out of Star Wars to explore. StarWars.com. It's all Star Wars, all the time. What do we have here? A debonair smuggler, a baron of Bespin, a galactic general, all of the above, baby. What's Give it up for the smoothest cat in space, Mr. Billy D. Nice to have a beautiful woman <laughs> escorting me to a chair. Listen, Thank I you was so once much. told I might belong somewhere around some clouds, but I'd rather be here with you. Look out! <laughs> How are you? I'm okay. 
glad to see you. Nice to see you. Thank you. So I hear that you have a book available for pre-order. Yeah, it's an autobiography. It's uh, called What Have We Here? <laughs> the portrait of my life. Well, portraits of my life. Oh. Well, I really look forward Pretty to reading. Pretty crazy life. Pretty wild, crazy life. If you could tell me your favorite story, what would it be? Well, there's so many of them, I don't know. Um, I li once lived with one of the biggest madams in New York City. <laughs> I feel like that tells a story enough in itself. That's it. Now, what was it like to be able to put a bow on Lando's story in The Rise of Skywalker? Say that again? What was it like to be able to put a bow on Lando in The Rise of Skywalker? Oh, oh it was nice. It was nice to come back and do uh, revisit uh, Lando uh, and working with, certainly working with J.J. Abrams was uh, a lot of fun. Why do you think Lando is still such a cool character 40 plus years after audiences first met him? Because Billy D. Williams played Lando. <laughs> That's true. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Out of all of your Star Wars experiences, what would you say was your favorite? As far as filming, what was your favorite? Well, I don't know. There's so many things, you know. I, I, I always talk about the unsung heroes. The unsung heroes are usually the people who do all of the uh, backstage stuff, you know, all the technical stuff, C, CGI stuff. I used to spend a lot of time talking to those people. I don't like talking to actors. Actors are total ridiculous human beings. <laughs> I think when you're, when you're smooth as you are. I'm not are. all actors. <laughs> I don't know, you just can't match your smoothness. You're, you're that guy. Listen, I saw a Lady Sings the Blues. I know what's up. That was a good one. <laughs> Oh, I love that movie. It's one of my absolute favorites. I know it's not Lady Sings the Blues celebration, but my Aunt Cheryl would get me if I never said anything about it. So y'all are just going to have to deal with it for a second. Now, is there... I just had my birthday the other day. <laughs> 86 years old. You don't look a day over fine. <laughs> you're, you're a sweetheart, thank you. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to Billy. Happy birthday to you. Grazie, grazie. Thank you. Billy, is there anything that you want to say to fans for the 40th anniversary of Return of the Jedi? Is there anything that you would like to say to the fans to honor the 40th anniversary? May the Force be with you. All of you. Beautiful people. one of the greatest moments of my life. I want to thank you so much for stopping by, and I can confidently say that me and the rest of this audience is probably a thousand percent cooler now, just by proxy, and having been in the same room as you. We've got more to come. Thank you very much. More to come from Star Wars Celebration Live right after this.
welcome to the Funko booth here at Star Wars Celebration in Europe, and I am with Angela and Jeff from Funko. Hi, guys. Hi, how are you Hello. doing? I'm doing very well. How's Celebration treating you so far? Oh, it's been absolutely incredible. The energy is so addictive. It's amazing. Best one today. Very good to hear. Now, you have got some Celebration Funko exclusives. They're in yes. front of us here. Take me through what is sitting here on this table. Absolutely. Well, tonight, we, today we have different uh, T-shirt exclusives, Jar Jar Binks uh, exclusive, and then we also have the Droid 2-pack Star Wars exclusive from the original as well. Okay, so we've got some nice T-shirts there, and also very practical and also very nice looking, we have the Armourer backpack. We do indeed. We have the matching Armourer wallet and Loungefly backpack. This is um, exclusive to Star Wars Celebration. We completely sold out yesterday. We're hoping to do the same again today as well. Premium leather, the detail inside, as you can see, is very, very close to the character. The lining, the zip, you have you know more detail here. And with the wallet as well, you have the famous collectible um, emblem there. You've got the armor again there. I mean, look at this detail in here. It's absolutely incredible. What everybody always wants to get their hands on at a celebration is the celebration exclusives. This year we have two. So we have the Droid 2-pack with R2-D2 and R5-D4. And then we have another OG here, Jar Jar Binks. This little fella has been flying off the shelf. Well, he flew off the shelf yesterday and he's definitely going to be doing the same again today. And the detail here that's different is that we've got the How Wood tongue hanging out, haven't we? We do indeed. Well spotted. Very, very well spotted. What have we here? We have Loungefly, which is our premium fashion accessories line. It has been flying off the shelves, no pun intended. Um, but this is our brand new Star Wars collection, and it's currently on sale now here at the convention and online as well. We're seeing a bit of a resurgence with people with the uh, prequel trilogy here, and this Queen Amidala crossbody has been really popular amongst cosplayers and also just fans that have been coming down by the booth. So we've seen this one go in droves yesterday and the same already today. Absolutely. Very nice. And any others you'd like to single out yes, that have been flying off the love, shelves as well? I would love to show you my absolute favourite, yeah. the tattoo style backpack. We have the emblem there. We have the amazing um, lounge ride details on the zips. Check out the incredible detail inside oh, as well. Oh, yeah. I mean, this you can is... see why, and I mean this, nearly every person in here who's wearing a backpack is wearing a lounge fly backpack. It's absolutely this amazing. This is the dark side backpack, your favourite. I don't know what that this says is my about fine. Angela, but... Well, the light side one's nice. also my favourite. And of course, Boba Fett. Well, this one's pretty cool because it's one of the character ones. It gives fans a chance to show off their favourite characters, their fandoms, of which Boba Fett is so many people's. So yeah, this one's been going really well as well. And uh, we've got so many others, but people will need to kind of have a look online or come down here to be able yeah. to see them. And that's the beauty of Loungefly as well. You come in here, or when you shop online, you grab all your favorite pops, your favorite games, your tees, and then you can grab something to actually wear as well, you know? So it's wearing your fandom on your sleeve, which we absolutely love. So all Star Wars bases are covered here. Original trilogy, I can see here with Darth Vader, and we've talked about the prequels, but yeah. Mandalorian season three is running at the moment. So of course you have a lot of Mando. What don't we have? Look at the collection here. It's absolutely incredible. We're so spoiled for choice. Our fans are so spoiled for choice. Ahsoka, such a popular one in top of also uh, Grogu. But yeah, as mentioned, Mando's flying off the shelves at the moment. It's Mando fever. We're in season three. Will we be getting some exclusive season three releases at some point? Absolutely, Jamie. They're right around the corner. We're going to have a whole new series of Mandalorian pop and different products, which we'll be referencing and uh, celebrating season three. Beautiful. Looking forward to that. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Angela from Funko. And thank you for joining us. But don't go anywhere. Lots more to come from Star Wars Celebration Live. From hanging out in the land of make-believe on Mr. Rogers, to battling M. Bison with Jean-Claude Van Damme in Street Fighter, to standing shoulder to shoulder with Boba Fett. For most people, these would be memorable accomplishments, but for her, it was Tuesday. Please welcome Fennec Shan herself, Ming-Na Wen! Keep it going. 
feeling yourself and you got the low battery warning. Well, excuse me, I was feeling myself. <laughs> excuse me? <laughs> it's such a public place. <laughs> I have oh, to. Oh, wow, this is, thank you guys. Oh my gosh, what, what an, a reception. Wow. That's, oh. Contractually, when a Disney legend walks on stage, I have to kneel like that. <laughs> as you should. Yes, as you should, Anthony. <laughs> Mingna, it is so wonderful to have you here. Uh, Thank you for having me here. And oh my gosh, I am at Star Wars Celebration. <laughs> oh. oh my God, and you are such a huge part of it this year. You were just doing the Return of the Jedi panel. I did. I had to be the moderator, and I'm telling you, this is not an easy job, people. It's a very it easy job. It is not an easy, easy job, and I'm going to make it really difficult for you. Good. By not answering any of your questions. Good. We're not breaking eye contact. I'm just going to stare at you like Fennec Shand would, wanting to just kill you. I'm not afraid. I was going to say I'm not afraid of Fennec Shand, but I'm super afraid of Fennec Shand. Super afraid of You should be Shand. also afraid of Ming-Na Wen. <laughs> <laughs> it's got to come from somewhere, right? Yeah. I have absolutely loved seeing the return of Fennec Shand and the expansion of the character. How has it felt to bring her back and bring her into live action like this? Uh, okay, everybody here, I'm hoping you know what a massive Star Wars nerd girl I am, how much I love Star Wars. Baloney says you might be the only person that's as big a fan as he is. Um, I doubt that because <laughs> Baloney is a big fan of Star Wars. Um, I, 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 I'm telling you, the Force was one of my religions, for real. Like, I, I used to pray, and I still do, actually, to God, Buddha, and the Force. Yes. <laughs> I got, you know, I'm covering every aspect of, <laughs> of spirituality. And um, to be part of this, it's, it's weird because I am here, but I should also be where you are, enjoying this incredible celebration. Thank you it's for amazing, just right? reminding me that we're all one. We're one. To, uh, to be walking around shoulder to shoulder with literally Boba Fett growing up as a Star Wars fan, how wild was it to be such a huge, huge part of that series? I mean, Boba Fett's, Boba Fett's right-hand man is no small deal. Oh, gosh, no. Right-hand person, you mean? <laughs> <laughs> um, listen. I owe everything to Boba Fett at this point because Fennec Shan was supposed to die after that one episode in The Mandalorian, and he saved Fennec. Yeah. Ah, yes! <laughs> <laughs> so I am so grateful, and I will always help him, even if he goes a little, you know, wrong about his choices. I'm, I'm, I will set him straight. But, um, I, it's such an iconic character, and I love working with Temuera. Temuera Morrison! Yes. Woo! Oh, He's he, so amazing. He is just all heart, and um, I, I couldn't ask for a better you know, partner in, in, as we build our new empire together. Yeah. Oh my gosh, there's something, there's something about a character that is so like calm and cool and collected that she's always got her feet up and she's eating something and she's yeah. chill, you know? Oh, look at, I'm, look I'm at, in a dress, but look hello! At that. <laughs> look at that, take that armorer! This, uh, <laughs> yeah, there's, there's a bit of Fennec right here. <laughs> so. Yeah, so I mean, it is a character that so many people love. Obviously, we love, we love a bounty hunter in Star Wars so much. Thank you. You know, yes, but I do what, do you, what do you think it is about Fennec Shand herself that people are really connecting with? I, I'm just so happy that they do, but I think it's just because she's a badass, you know? Right? Yeah. She, 
and, um, and she just knows herself and what it takes to survive and what it, t she can maneuver, she is like a fennec fox in a way. Yeah. You know, she's a loner, but if she needs to, she can partner up. She's flexible and yet, if you mess with her, she has no problems taking care of business. Absolutely know? not. So. She, that's right, those, I said to glue those down before ming -Na came to stage. I said to glue them down. What are before you gonna say? What are you gonna say? You're a Disney legend and I love you. Okay. <laughs> uh, you brought up sort of the thing, like the names of Star Wars characters are always wonderful because they inform you a little bit about the character. They're sort of these Dickensian names sometimes, right? When you first saw the character of Fennec Shand and you were sort of reading what it was, what were your sort of inspirations and who did you want to bring to the character? Well, I thought it was only one episode. Mm -hmm. So, I wanted to make her as memorable as possible. And um, Maria Zandoval, who's the hair stylist for the show, um, she and I came up with this idea of creating sort of like fennec foxes, you know, um, the, the ears of, yeah. of the fox, because she's always listening. She's always got her eye on people, right? She's always watching and she's listening. And, and then um, the tail of the fox. So she came up with this brilliant braiding system in her hair. I don't know how the assassin has that much time to braid her hair, but she does. <laughs> She's got like um, braiding droids, okay? That's what we figured out. And, uh, and so we, we put all these details and then she put in some of the orange detail um, that went with the uh, outfit. Um, but then she comes back. Yeah. And now we're stuck with this really elaborate <laughs> two-hour hairdo. <laughs> so we had to simplify it a little it is, bit. It's such a, I mean, the visual language of Star Wars is always striking. And I think Fennec just has such a cool silhouette and such cool armor. Yes. And, yes. But, and I also love that she's the sort of person where she walks in, she's like, my stomach is robot now. What are we doing today? Like she it, was a little freaked out at first. A little freaked out, but But not. then she's just like, you know what? Yeah, I could live with this. Yeah, yeah you know, is, abs of steel. Stomach right? is robot. What's yeah, up? Yeah, <laughs> But you know what I do love is when I see the fans, and there were so many of you that cosplay Fennec. So thank you so much, because there's one right there. Oh, my gosh. Look at you. Yeah. You look great. I mean, that is not an easy outfit to wear for the whole day. And I know a lot of you others have amazing outfits, but oh. it, may, it just makes me so happy. It's got to it's gotta be wonderful, right, to, like, to see that and to be connected to it, you know, growing up every day and praying to the Force. Oh, and now you're seeing, like, all these kids are dressing up as your character. Yeah. It's wonderful. Yeah. It's yeah. such an amazing thing. It's so crazy. <laughs> I don't know what's happening half the time. I mean, it, it, it's, it's sort of surreal. Yeah. Like, to see the banner of Fennec alongside some of the OG, star, you know, like I think there's one that a fan posted where I'm between Luke Skywalker and Han Solo, you know, and I'm just, so what's happening? Right there in the mid, what? Aww. <laughs> yes, wait, hold on. Oh, <laughs> so, I mean, honestly, Coming here as such a fan uh, and hosting that panel, what was it like to just get to go step by step through Return of the Jedi with all those greats? Oh my goodness. I mean, Return of the Jedi is celebrating its 40th anniversary. And to sit there with Billy D. Williams, right? Warwick Davis, Ugh. Anthony Daniels. He's fine. And, oh, yeah. And <laughs> Ian McDerm uh, Mc uh, McDermott. I mean, I'm telling you, it's. It's so surreal, and I just wanted to sit there and listen to their stories and, you know, talk about what it was like to, sh to shoot that. Yeah. I, I was watching the bit where they were showing the previs for the, the speeder chase. Yes. Which is always so funny to see those little toys and models and how they put it together. Yeah. And it's, it just reminds you how much it's... You know what it reminds... It's handicraft, yes, you know? Yes, but it also reminds you that all, all, the, the kid in us should continue to always live on. You know, the child in us should never, ever be lost 
because that's what keeps you young. It's what keeps you having fun. It's what keeps you like passionate, you know? And that's what Star Wars is about. I think the connection that we all have and that inner child in us is just thriving and surviving. Uh, you, when there's, you know, life gives us ups and downs but it's just wonderful to, to hold on to that hope and to that love of being a kid, you know? Yes, yes. Uh, it, yeah, it's so wonderful seeing all the families out here today with all their kids getting into it, dressing like Fennec Shand, coming out here together. It's wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us here on the stage, Thank Ming you, And for being such a big part of this celebration. Ladies and gentlemen, one more time for Ming-Na Wen. Stick around, more from Star Wars Celebration Live in just a moment. tell you a little story. Batu, the entire outer rim really is lawless. You will see our truth. The first order is forever. Stormtroopers came in, threats were made, but our friend would not back down. Surely we can count on you now. Wow. Watch the master work. These relics. Their power is real. Something terrible has happened here. I'm gonna need your help. Received your distress call. The council did. If every world had a hero like you, my existence would be considerably less stressful. Uh oh, four troopers headed your way. Give them hell, partner. Uh, you made it! All in one piece! Oh, wonderful. is a director, producer, and actor. And he's also part of a very small, very exclusive club of actors in Star Wars that have played both digital and live action characters. You may know him as Snoke, or as Kino Loy and Andor. He's behind those doors right now, but as we all already know, there is only one way out. Please welcome Andy Serkis. Wow. <laughs> One way out! One way out! One way out! Well done. Amazing. Now, Andy, this is your first Star Wars celebration, it but is... you already fit right in. I love it. I'm going to come back every year. You heard it here first on the internet. We all know that's going to be true. <laughs> Thank you so much, though, truly, for, for being here with us. We're so excited to have you here at Star Wars Celebration Europe, part of the Star Wars family, first as 
Supreme Leader Snoke of the First Order, and most recently as Kino Loy. What was it like? I know. Everybody loves both of those characters. What was it like for you coming back to Star Wars in a non-digital live-action character for Andor? You know, it was, re it was really funny. When, when Tony Gilroy first talked to me about it and I, and I was offered the role, I was really worried about taking another Star Wars role because there had been so many theories about Snoke. So, and I just thought, oh no, people are going to start thinking that somehow Kino Loy is related to Snoke or, you know, that, that he is some sort of weird uncle of it as well, I don't know. It was just like, I was really concerned. And then I thought, oh no, I mean, the writing was so beautiful and the character, and I mean, that was the great thing about Andor is I'm sure you all appreciate the, the crafting of the series, the writing, the structure, that every single character has such a complex psychology and emotional journey and, and it's just, and, 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 and I think that's why it was so popular. And, and so I could not refuse this, this character that, that comes in and it was, you know, I was told, you know, we're going to keep you a secret and, and, and I was relieved about that because I'd spent such a long time with Snoke deflecting all the different theories, you know. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so no, so it was, it was really great and I was, I, I, lo I really loved the character and, and was, was, was delighted to come back. Oh, thank you. We love you and we love Kino. How did you approach playing the, the character of Kino Loy after you said, I absolutely can't refuse this offer from Tony Gilroy? Um, I, I, what I wanted to do was to really work out who Kinoy, uh, Kinoy, Kino <laughs> was before he, um, before he went to prison. Because it was just like, what, what is it about this man that, what I loved about the journey of the character was this man who actually was very principled, who, who was prior to being incarcerated in Narkina 5, was maybe you know, a, a, a union leader of some sort or stood up for his fellow workers' rights, had purpose, was driven, had a family, was, you know, absolutely knew who he was. And then once he's in prison, all of that is taken away from him. He's desensitized, he's dehumanized. He doesn't know who he is anymore, so he just goes to looking after number one, looking after, you know, and, 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 and that felt to me a real kind of way into the character. And then of course, when he's united with, with Cassian and or, and he is reignited into the idea that he can galvanize people and he does have the ability to, to think of others and serve others, that that became his redemption until his moment of self-sacrifice, knowing all along that he was Spoilers. not going to make it, you know. <laughs> yes. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Spoilers again, but I think that your, your singular line I can't swim, was just the, the biggest heartbreaker of a line for me in the whole series. And there are a lot of heartbreaking lines in this series, but that one just cut me to the core. Yeah, I, when I read it, I was like, what? <laughs> I can't swim? You're joking. I was like, <laughs> I was like <laughs> <laughs> what did you say? Snoke can swim. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, it's just like, so anyway, people have been asking me what's going to happen to Kino Loy. I'm just leaving it at that. There you go. There you go. I, I love that you have a tremendous headcanon for Kino and his whole backstory, and it's very rich and it's a lived in life. But did you draw on any real life inspirations as you were working to build that character? Well, yeah, actually, in actual fact, the whole notion of being uh, someone who is principled uh, beforehand was really related to, to my, my, my late brother-in-law, who was, in fact, a union shop steward and act, act actually did stand up for a fellow workers' rights and was very, you know, very much admired for that. So, so I did, I did well, you know, I did base it on someone real. Yeah. That is so lovely and thank you for sharing that. You also brought uh, an amazing intensity to this performance. Uh, I just felt like it was penetrating through the screen. It was just like you were in the room with me every single scene. How do you come down from something like that when you're, when you're doing a role like this and it is just, you are at an 11? I mean, well, the thing is, I mean, and that set was an incredibly intense set to work on. It was, it was I mean, it was a beautifully designed set, at, but you really couldn't escape anywhere. I mean, it was, it, you really were with everybody else trapped on that set 
And of course it was... The method acting. It was, yeah. <laughs> and of course it was COVID times as well. So it was really difficult. And, th and some of those walkways were, you, you know, they were like, they were like COVID test tubes, basically. You know? <laughs> we were just lined up and, but, I mean, masks on, quickly taking your masks off for the take and then back, you know, so it was, it felt, and then, and then being barefooted and then those paper suits, which do really desensitize you. And when you're doing this for weeks and weeks and, and, Le and Kino is just such a, you know, he's, he's like a coiled spring. So it was, it did keep you on edge for, for, for a lot. And so those moments where he flashes were, were kind of semi-genuine sort of moments of kind of, you know, get me out of here. And when, when he starts to realize things are going wrong and that there is a possibility that they will never escape, it was, it was something that we were all feeling, you know, it was, it was quite incredible. Yeah, and there's a lot from the performance that comes across just, you know, in your, in your face in very subtle ways. Uh, and in your speeches, in the way you speak, in the dialogue, but also in that wonderful monologue in the last episode, with you, not the last episode of the series, were you surprised by the fan reaction to Kino Loy in general, but also to that moment where Kino Loy is giving the monologue from the, the heart of the prison and he's rallying everybody to find that one way out? I, I mean, it really did, for me, that was a, that, that piece of writing, again, going back to Tony Gilroy and his genius, um, you know, to, to actually take a character on that arc and then give him that kind of rallying call, um, which is not, which is not, doesn't have the confidence at first, which doesn't, you know, he's lost his mojo, really, until, until he is inspired by, again, by Cassian to do it. And he suddenly, it's like, he remembers, he sees himself. And that and that that moment, then it starts to build, and then and then he, you know, you you see you see a man kind of regaining his consciousness and, and regaining his ability to, to 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 bring people together, and that and that was really gratifying to play, and it was a very emotional scene to play as well. Yeah, it's transformative for Kino from when we meet him to to where we leave him, and I will leave it at that. I know no more. I'm sure you know more than I do, perhaps. <laughs> Since we're all friends here. Right? We're all friends here? Yeah. And I promise you will not be thrown into Star Wars prison if you answer this next question. Did you take anything from the Andor set? Well... <laughs> that's we, a yes. No, I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, steal, I didn't steal anything. Um, <laughs> although I was very... Borrow. Did you long-term loan anything I from was, the Andor I was, set? I was, no, but we were all given our cell numbers actually, which are on the doors, you'll see them. All of, all of the actors who played the characters, uh, you know, in, in, that, in, that, in those scenes were given their cell numbers, which was, which was really lovely to take. It was a really lovely memento. And we were all allowed to take home our sliders and flip-flops, which, quite frankly, you had to have been <laughs> immediately because they were so disgusting. <laughs> so you binned the sliders, yeah. you kept the number. What have you done with it? Did you put it up? Uh, yeah, it's, that's outside my, my, uh, my loo at home, actually. Yeah. <laughs> that is the perfect place for that. <laughs> wonderful. Now, is there anything you want to say to all of these wonderful gathered fans here today, here in this room, and watching live from home at your first Star Wars celebration? Look, I... <laughs> yeah, get on program. No, I, I would like, I, I would, I would like to say that it is, you know, I, I came into this as a fan. I grew up, of course, with the movies and loved it. But my biggest inspiration was actually my my my, my brother is a super mad fan, and I, I when I was offered Snoke, I, I just couldn't wait. He was the first person I told. And the passion that he has is like the passion that you all have. And that, to be on the receiving end of that from you guys is, you know, it just goes to show a, a, a mythological, a mythological, you know, canon like this is just fantastic to be part of as an actor and to be, to be a storyteller within because this, this mythology is so profound and it means so much to so many people. And, and I realize that, that, that to have the opportunity of not, not only coming 
to it once, but twice from a completely different perspective, seeing the world from, from, from a, you know, a, a, a despotic leader uh, a, a, who is capable of such utter horror and destruction, and, and from a kind of lowly worker who finds himself, to have that opportunity and, to, and for it to be appreciated and shared with all of you and everybody out there who, who watches these films and loves this mythology, it's just an enormous honor. And it's you guys who, who make these films and these TV series continue to be what they are. It's all about you, so thank you. Thank you. Well said. And the stories may be fiction, but the emotions are real and the passion is real. And we're just so glad to have you as part of the Star Wars family. Uh, did you have a favorite part about your role in Andor? Uh, my favorite part? Um, well, it, it, you know, it probably was that. The, 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 well, there were two, two scenes. There's the scene where, where, Ke where Kino really does flash for the first time when he realizes that they're not going to escape. Because it was, like I was saying, it was like a real outpouring of, of kind of, we're never going to get out of here. You know? <laughs> and it was sort of like, for real. Um, yeah. Um, but, but then, of course, the, the, the build-up to the escape and then, and then the final moment on the bridge as everybody was jumping up. You know, the moment of I can't swim really was, was trying to find a way which... It, there's a way of delivering that which would make it sound very kind of cheesy and, and sentimental, and we tried to play against that. And I, I was very fortunate to be working with Toby Haynes, the director of that particular... of th that arc, who who gave me the opportunity of exploring different ways of, of, doing, of doing that, well, that scene and that line. And so it was, it was, uh, that, was, that was really thrilling to have that opportunity. All you want as an actor is to, to have the opportunity to, to fail by being in an environment that is safe to explore and, and, and push yourself. And, and when you have someone who creates that atmosphere, that's, that's wonderful. So, so that, was, that, was, uh, that, was, that was great. I'm just picturing you now, like at home, in your your bathroom now that has the sign on it. But before that, just practicing the I can't swim, I can't swim, I can't swim, and probably on program as well. Yes, did that take some some practicing to get that growl just right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, when 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 of course when Cassian comes into the prison and we're introduced to the floor, the level you know level level five floor. You know, I really wanted him to be an obnoxious bully, and 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 so I so I, I you know I, I I just thought he's just got to sound like he goes through this every day. There's prisoners arriving. He doesn't care. He he's just he's just going to get them through the door, get them working as quickly as possible. All he cares about is filling his quota for the day. That's it. End of story. And that so I just wanted him to be, you know, not the not your best friend, basically, you know. But by the end there, you and uh, Cassian, well, you and Diego, I imagine, behind the scenes as well, but for sure, Kino and Cassian are, are quite the duo. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Diego, as you all know from watching, is he's a formidable actor and a brilliant scene partner, and we had a ball playing those scenes together, and I really, I really loved, uh, you know, sparring with him on, on, on set and playing off of what he was giving me and what, what I could give him, and it, 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 he, he's... You know, not only, of course, was he an actor on the piece, but he's also part producer on it, and so he, he had a lot to deal with and, and was constantly reworking, and he, he, was, he was just a fabulous person. He's a really honorable, decent human being. He really cares about this, so, so it was great to work some, opposite someone like that. You can tell that everyone working on Andor cares very deeply. We just had Diego and Tony yesterday. Uh, you have been a phenomenal guest, Andy. Well, we're going to swim on out of here so you can either stage dive into the crowd. That would be their preference. <laughs> you can lead them in an on program or one way out, or you can simply walk backstage, you know, where. Well, I think we should put it to the vote. Who wants to go on program? Okay. On program! I love you too, and one way out, 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 one way out. All right, 
Stick around. We've got lots more from Star Wars Celebration Live coming right up. I'm very excited because I'm here backstage with Neil Scanlon. You're getting ready for the Creature Cantina panel today. Yeah, we are indeed, Jep. Yep, yep. getting you, closer. And you, uh, even though you have a lot of important things to do, are letting me see what it's like to get into some of these costumes. Absolutely, bits. yeah. Fiona here is uh, supervising dresser, fabricator. <sighs> This is what it's about, so you get a sense of... Um, those, so yeah. these are Unker Plot's hands, right? This Indeed, would... Unker Plot's hands. Oh, yeah. these are heavy, Neil. Yeah. yeah. All right, wait. Yeah. These are, this is a silicone material, uh, which is, 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 is heavy, you know, yeah. and, um, uh, and you, you can you imagine that... Um, I got a feet. I got a feet. <laughs> you know, and then on top of here, there'd be a big muscle suit, and then you would be wearing a big prosthetic, you know. So you can you can begin to get a sense of the kind of physicality of what it's all about. Wow. Yeah, yeah. For 12 hours, this is a lot. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Oh yeah, yeah. But it, they move in a certain way. They do something that other materials that we have wouldn't be uh, as successful as. So, yeah, there you go. Yeah, so, um, yeah. thank you, darling. <laughs> have a wonderful panel, Neil. I will. Thank, thank you. you. All the best. <laughs> This is a lightsaber. Only Jedi's carry that kind of weapon. Are you ready? Then let's begin. It's your father's lightsaber. This is the weapon of a Jedi Knight. An elegant weapon, but a more Civilized day. I am a Jedi, like my father before me. This lightsaber is my life. Abilities in life, such as death and taxes, and like death and taxes, you must accept that at some point or another, you're going to have to face them, which, despite my best efforts to decline this interview, I was forced into it, unlike our next guest, who says yes to portraying C-3PO in literally anything and everything he can. Here now to kill time until our next guest shows up, Anthony Daniels.
We've run out of music. I'm sorry, there's, uh, there's a sound problem somewhere. Um, sorry, is there, is there an issue with sound? Is it, are, are you sound or what? Oh my goodness. Oh, fine, because there's somebody... I He's harassing the crew. I'm, I'm getting audio and it it's... It only took 30 seconds until he started harassing the uh, crew. I'm getting... There is an audio feed that's crossed over for some alien life form. Well, I'll go work on that. I'll cool, go cool, cool, cool. Uh, do you want to see, see a gift that the crew gave me this year? What? I, I'm hearing... It helps keep my stress levels down. This is... This is look, this is me. This is me. It's got my name. It's got my name. And there! I am everywhere! Anthony, yes, Daniels. That's the important bit, okay? Yeah, hello, good for you, yes. You having a good time? Yeah, I do lip read you, yeah. Are you having a good time at the back? Excellent, excellent. So, um, here I am, Star Wars Celebration Live. Wow. Wow. Just because you don't have any more workbook doesn't mean the rest of us doesn't have, don't have places to go. Let's come on, come on. What? 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 what come on. This? Where? Are you allowed on? Are you, what are, are you, you doing here? Are you allowed to wear that jacket in public? <laughs> yeah. You could have made a little more effort. I'm dressed like one of my favorite characters. You're dressed. Anybody but a droid. Grandmother, look at that. Okay, um... Come here! Okay, all right. Come here. Am I safe? Come here. Come uh -oh. here. You know I love you. You know I love you. Come here. You know I love you. Come sit. Touchy-feely already. Come yes. sit. Yes. Just watch him. Can you keep your eye on him? Because he, he gets a bit carried of... I mean, he wanted to be an actor. He wanted to be a star in a movie like me. And he ends up what? No, I said I wanted to be a star in a movie like Harrison Ford. <laughs> but you were in the movie. I was in the movie. <laughs> but you, uh, listen, we have talked before about how C-3PO was literally my favorite Star Wars character of all time. All time. I, I, I have a, a small 3PO shrine in my home, tasteful. Don't worry, it's not an Anthony Daniels shrine, it's a 3PO shrine. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, they're not glued down and you're not the first to what, notice. What have I found? <laughs> this is amazing. Oh, wow. <laughs> they, I think technically only Emily Swallow is allowed to hold those for that okay. long. Okay, um, so, so anyway, so, uh, so why, why is uh, 3PO your... your well, I think, I, I think I've told you this before, I was a, uh, I was a very nervous kid. I was, um, I, was, I was small for my age. I was always very worried about rules and about everybody being treated fairly. And I, Whatever changed? I mean, look at you now. You, I mean, you're just so... Oh, I got taller. Tall. I got taller than you, and now I have you power. It's no. called growing up. It's called growing up. So, so we, you were a bit scared as a kid, and the 3PO made you feel okay? 3PO, I, I think, for a lot of people uh, who are particularly people who are neurodi neurodivergent in some ways, as I am, uh, we recognize a lot of ourselves in droids and in their particular idiosyncrasies. And I remember thinking to myself that when everybody was, everybody was kind of yelling at C-3PO or making fun of C-3PO, on one level I did understand that these were comedy bits, but on another level I said, he's just trying to look out for his friends. He's just trying to keep them safe. He's just trying to let them know the rules so they understand what they're doing, you know? He always wanted the best for people, and when they turned him off, I was like, let him have his say. Everybody gets to have their say. <laughs> and my mom... <laughs> you know, normally, normally you talk a load of rubbish. <laughs> but today... I grew up watching you. <laughs> I was going to be nice, but today you're talking sense. Because one of the things I have learned at events like this is several people will come up to me and say, you know, 3PO, when I was a child, 3PO was my kind of go-to sort of friend because people don't understand me and they didn't seem to understand 3PO. And yet 3PO was really kind of a hero figure in a big movie. And that made me, the kid, feel okay. And suddenly I'm on stage with you and you're saying the same thing. I know, I know. And we're, we're celebrating this year the 40th anniversary of Return of the Jedi, a very big 3PO movie, I think. Or 40... <laughs> now, I think I've, I've always told you, I think for me, 
the best 3PO movie is Rise of Skywalker because you get so much to do. And, and I love that 3PO gets to make that sacrifice for his friends. But obviously, when people think about 3PO, there are a lot of big scenes from Return of the Jedi they think about. Yeah, uh, one of my, I, I actually was watching uh, Return of the Jedi uh, a couple of nights ago in preparation for coming. Are you doing here. it the way you normally do it, where you go to your scenes and then you fast forward? Uh, and then hundred percent. Yeah. yeah. I, I, <laughs> you know, all that rubbish with, with Warwick and with Ian and all that. Who needs that? Yeah. Yeah. Get to They're the meat fine. of the thing, and thank goodness for the fast forward button. And I realized that one of my fa favorite, but least favorite moments was in the Millennium Falcon, where the uh, I'd been exploded in Cloud City and gradually got put back together. And they said, you have to stand there on one leg in the suit, holding the other leg while saying, do you remember that? Yes. yes. I mean, that, um, yes. what was it? Um, oh, <laughs> pretend that's a leg. Okay, use your, use your imaginations. Let them run wild. So I'm there, and in that costume, I'm standing on one leg, with that hidden behind my thigh from the camera's point. Could you come and be you the wall? You still got it. You yeah, still got yeah. it, baby. That's you, good balance. Could you come and be the wall? Come and be the wall? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You're, you're, you're the wall. Uh, uh, no, no, the wall was that side. This side? Have you seen the movie? Yeah. For heaven's but sake. But I fast forward through your parts and I go to everybody else's. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Pretend this is a very heavy prop leg, because it was a prop leg. So you're the wall, so I had to, do, do not move. This is a trust. I'm team. trying to make it easier for you. You're a little older now than you were when you did the scene. <laughs> <laughs> so now imagine the camera. I'm, and on action, I came away from you. Look, look, look at me now, but don't go away. I would never. Um, you, you said don't let go, but I don't think you really want that. No, okay. Um, <laughs> uh, what was it? Um, I'm standing here in pieces, and you're having delusions of grandeur. That's it. That's a good bit. <laughs> uh, but of course, my, my uh, favorite scene, uh, you, you, did you have anything else to say? Well, Brad, anyway. Well, actually, uh, because Anthony, it was if you the don't, time. Anthony, if you don't mind, uh, delusions of grandeur reminded me. There's somebody I know that wants to meet you. Uh, it's, he's sort of my adopted son. He's part of the crew here this year. Uh, his name is Gil. He's just getting started in Star Wars. Oh. Uh, and he was. I are you? Big fan. Big fan. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, I, I love you, Daddy and Marie. Right. Uh, there are some steps here. Are you uh, part of the droid that can do steps, like R two D two suddenly could do steps and fly no. and everything? No, but I can do any camera work. Well, it's a pleasure to meet you. Oh, can I shake you your? Um, can I shake? Uh, uh, which bit of you can I shake? Okay, I'm going to shake. Not that one. Not that one. Not that one. Oh, 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 oh! Okay. That, that was right. very exciting. So, um, d so I want to know. Yeah. How you, do I get? Yeah. Do you want to know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what language are you speaking? Uh, I'm it's sorry. It's a very strange dialect. Can I speak slower? <laughs> I'm speaking English. And tell me something. Are you the replacement for Andrew Carbuti here? Uh, I mean, Are you the next generation Kabuti? I am trying. Wow, betrayal. Oh, pipe down. Betrayed by you, my own son. I saw, I saw his eye on me. It looks like a scroll. You only have a credit for a Weather Channel show. What? I gave you everything you have, you ungrateful child. Hey, I learned from the best. <laughs> <laughs> It's a pleasure to meet you. I've now got to go back and look after the big child over here before it gets really chicovian. Right. Nice to see you. I'll see you at the next celebration, and we will do it without Andrew Carbuti, okay? Thank you. Turn my own son against me. Mm -hmm. He doesn't need you. What's it like? You palpatine, you know, my boy. You know, one of the things um, that became apparent was that uh, some of the human members of the cast would say in interviews in uh, the, the early Star Wars days, you know, so what's it like to be upstage by a couple of droids? 
well, tonight you hit it, honey. <laughs> but I'll tell you, when you're a kid and you watch some kids, for, for a lot of kids, it's not people getting upstaged by droids. It's, it's like, okay, good, it's droid time. <laughs> Excellent. Here come the droids. Here come the droids. And I love so many droids. And also, you're here. <laughs> <laughs> I'd forgotten how cheap you are. <laughs> it's been how many years since I last saw you? Gosh, we, yeah, whoa, buddy. We saw each other last year. Yeah, I tried to forget. Let's, uh, my mistake. <laughs> I had my can memory wiped. Can wide. we get a medical team waiting for Mr. Daniels backstage? <laughs> He's having what? an episode. Why do I do this? <laughs> this is my last day here. Yeah. And I end up with this. <laughs> no, listen, we love Anthony Daniels on this stage, don't we? We love 3PO. Um, no, and when I, when I started doing Star Wars stuff, you were, you, were uh, you know, like I said, a big hero, and you were, you were very nice to me right off the bat. What changed? About, with you being nice to me? I don't know. Come, why can't we go back to that? <laughs> Let's go back to the old days. Okay. Hello, what's your name? It's Anthony. There's a TH in the middle. You have to say it. Anthony? Yeah. Oh, that's so cute. That's my name too, Anthony. No, you're Anthony. Yes, because I'm British. Yes. <laughs> you should see. That, normally when we do these in America, everybody sides with me. It feels weird, feels weird to be on the other side of it. It's the... the well, it's why... I never thought Star Wars Celebration would have a heel, and I certainly didn't think it was gonna be me. <laughs> but it's why Star Wars Celebration has come back to England. In all honesty, so much of, you know, Kath, Kathy said in the beginning of this celebration that they think of Pinewood as their production house. They think of Star Wars as being just as British as it is American. And what do they think of you? They definitely know that I'm all American. They don't think I'm British. But I'll tell you this, uh, it's got to be nice for you to, be, to ha be having this event back here, where you're from, where, it all, where it's all from, where you were shooting so much of it. It's called no jet lag for once. Thank you very much. <laughs> Apart from the traffic, which we all know is crazy around here. And the, anyway, so, but I am- He's gonna do weather jokes next. Keep it going. Keep it going, baby. Keep it going. <laughs> uh, I could do train strikes. I could do the road works around here. I mean, we could go on forever. Well, let's, we? instead, let's go, back to the, let's go back to the Return of the Jedi panel. And was there anything that anybody brought up today that you had been like, oh my gosh, yes, this was a moment. This was something that I hadn't thought about that was such an important part of the experience of making Return of the Jedi. No. No. Because <laughs> he remembers the 3PO parts. <laughs> but I, I, I did remember watching the thing, the, the, the fun I had doing the Ewok storytelling uh, scene. Do you remember? When, uh, um, Kuchana, no, what was it? Kuchana mafuatas, Kuchana mafuata, Korue manu, to, uh, Princess Leia, Wase Wadma Artu. Now, what on earth does Wase Wadma mean? What was Princess Leia doing to Artu? And then, Michian Jedi, Obi Wan Kenobi. And then, uh, Us Darth Vader, and Chenko Vaskimo, and uh, Obi Wan Kenobi, Imanu Machu Vedekon Yumnum. I mean, you know. So, so, some people have their yum nums here already. So tomorrow, bring out your yum num, okay? <laughs> no. Uh, you hold the record for the most performances in Star Wars. <laughs> and the least performances in anything else. What keeps you coming back to 3PO? Because oh, obviously, you know, obviously it's a thing, you're at a point, you don't have to come back if you don't want to. 
right? So what keeps you coming back to this and playing this role and being in these, in these projects? Money. Yeah. <laughs> Listen. <laughs> Welcome to the most honest stage at Star Wars Celebration. <laughs> <laughs> All right, serious answer. Serious, serious answer. answer. Um, because I, I nearly didn't do The Empire Strikes Back, because shooting episode four, the, A New Hope, hadn't been a bundle of laughs. And, you know, subsequently it wasn't great fun. I wasn't really part of the whole thing. So when they came and said, we're making another film, I had to really think, do I want to go through this again? The costume, the, the anonymity, the whole, the whole thing. Yeah. Um, I've written a book, by the way. It's called I Am C-3PO, The Inside Story. It's available here. It's and literally I, it didn't and, come and, out and this I, year. And I you don't even have anything to promote. And it I didn't explain, come out this year. I explain all this about it. And then, so I'm thinking, do I want to be in another Star Wars film? And I thought, well, it is a job. I'm an actor, and actors need, need work. And then the really, and this is true, I realized how fond I had become of 3PO, that he, he almost needed, you know, you were talking about vulnerability earlier. Yeah. And somehow, that right from Ralph McQuarrie's original uh, picture that uh, so hooked me, because it had a forlorn, uh, wanting face, I realized I'd become very connected with 3PO. And kind of, I couldn't let him go on on his own, could I? I had to be there. Yeah. Good. And here we are, all these years later, and 3PO is still, he's in every film. He's been in, he's been in most of the TV projects. He is one of the most recognizable pop culture characters probably ever. And, and he, uh, it should not have all been given to you, but here we are. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, uh, he's, he's not only been in TV projects and films, he's been in all sorts of commercial products. I mean, many of you will have seen the breakfast cereal, which was almost inedible. <laughs> um, I think it was made for droids. And, uh, and is this part of your shrine here? This is, this is not part of my shrine. This was a gift from the crew. Uh, they gave this to me as soon as they told me you were coming. And it what are you keeps, doing with keeps, it? Keeps me calm. Keeps me calm. They say, Anthony Daniels is coming in five, and I go... That is so rude. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is, I mean, look, these characters wind up on all kinds of, yeah, wow. not. Look at that. I think that's rude. Put it yeah. away. <laughs> it is pretty rude. Uh, what do you, I know you have a little bit of a 3PO shrine in your house as well. You've divulged that. You keep 3PO stuff. Not anymore. No. No. I really? Wonder, there might, at the end of this year, be a grand auction. Really? Should I have said that? <laughs> so, I do, I do have... Uh, I've got, the one thing I have retained is my <clears throat> Lego C-3PO. I was going to say, you really love that Lego 3PO. I really do. And, and that Lego 3PO loves me. That's... Impossible, Anthony. I dust him regularly. <laughs> in the nicest possible that way. That is, you are hearing your own voice reflected back at you, Anthony. <laughs> so you're keeping the 3PO, the Lego 3PO, because I know, like, literally, I've been on Zoom calls with this guy, and the Lego 3PO is right behind. Like, it's clearly your favorite 3PO thing of the last 40-some-odd years. It was a gift from the producers of the Lego Yoda Chronicles. And, uh, oh, wow. Gift, you know, to be treasured. So, but you're, the rest of it's going, huh? You can bid. Yeah. <laughs> I'm good. Okay. <laughs> is, that, is, that all you're, is that all you're gonna say about that right now? It's all in the planning Well, yes, there will be announcements in the news, I guess. Okay. okay. What, what, what do we got? He's got 10 pounds on something. 10 pounds, okay. Any advance on 10 pounds? No. You don't even know what he's auctioning yet. <laughs> I'm auctioning this. Man, this, man is this. A con man. <laughs> 100, okay. We'll work it out. <laughs> so, uh, let's see what else we got here. Uh, record performances, blah, blah, don't blah. Don't you love somebody who's so clock. well prepared? Why don't I just... No, I'm prepared. I'm just like... I mean, it's not like... I'm looking for the question that's going to set you off the least. Because sometimes you go on it, a ramble. It's... 
you think somebody else has written this, all he has to do is read it, and he can't even do that? I mean, I've done my homework, do you know yeah. what I mean? So, uh, it's very, but do, why don't I read? No, I don't have my specs with me, so I can't. Do, no. Go. This is actually, this is a good one. Does it keep you up at night knowing there's a whole crew of actors in Hollywood playing droids in Star Wars TV projects not named Anthony Daniels? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, he's fooling, he's it, fooling. He's it, playing puppy dog. Don't, don't bid on anything he has and don't believe the puppy dog eyes. No, but you actually, uh, when, you're not, when you're not performing as a droid directly, you are a droid trainer. You are a droid, you put people through oh. a droid boot camp. I, I had great fun on uh, Return of uh, the Rise of Skywalker, rather, because um, the crew came to me and said, you know, you're not in, in this scene. We have these wonderful waiter droids uh, who are wearing these weird costumes for the first time. And we did a boot camp on how to be a droid waiter. And it was huge fun because suddenly I was on the other side of the camera, if you will. And a terrific team of six um, actors who'd never really done this before. Uh, we worked out how to, um, to slightly isolate the movements, how to keep the nose up in the air, but the design were all like head waiters with a snotty attitude. <laughs> but the real drama came how to carry a tray of drinks uh, through the party like this, you know, so they can't see, and they're carrying a tray of, a tray of liquid, and you could tell, and I'm trying to keep the, the crowd artists, who are yeah. all beautifully dressed, away from them so they didn't bump into each other. And what a, what the, an incredibly they, wild thing to be like the expert on. What, a, what a, like a wildly specific thing, right? Like if you need somebody who is going to act like a droid in a movie, there is one person that can be called to train. Is that, a, is, that a, is that a skill you ever imagined you would have growing at up? At least it's a skill. And what would they call you for? <laughs> Mostly to keep you in line, if I'm honest. <laughs> but that's a str it's a strange thing to be like a world expert in. It, it, well, I wouldn't claim to be an expert. It was just I was there at the time. I, I was available. Uh, that's probably I, more I did, true. <laughs> <laughs> I did it for fun, and the guys were great. But here's the trick about carrying a tray. If you're dressed as a waiter droid in a Star Wars movie, you don't drop it because your hand is Velcroed to the underside of the tray. <laughs> And that's the sort of trick you can play at your own home movies, okay? <laughs> when? What a weird thing. Um, and I am available for hire for your home movies. We're starting the bidding at 10 oh, pounds. Yeah, 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 there you go. More than 10 pounds. <laughs> 10 pounds. Not you again. You already spent your 10 pounds, honey. Get on with it. Right. Careful. He's got somebody that's going to come around to collect. I've seen it. Uh, last year, you... Uh, kind of showed me the experience of what it was like to wear the 3PO costume. I did. You were so brave, and you were so bad at it. Uh, of course I was. It's terrible. It was, it's, it's a very intense thing. Uh, it's very claustrophobic. It's very limiting. Uh, you know, field of, vision is, field of vision is bad. Motion is horrible. And to emote, yeah, the hearing, I couldn't even hear you five feet away from me. Um, it was very, very intense. And obviously there have been some changes that have been made as technology gets better and you get different and different 3PO suits. Is there one thing about the suit that's gone away that you are so happy it's gone? Or is there a least favorite part of wearing the suit now that you have? Interesting question. The, the, the favorite thing about wearing the suit is taking it off. <laughs> I had no idea until I, oh, I can't believe I'm gonna say it. I had no idea until I read your book. Oh, what book was that? It's called IMC 3PO, The Inside Story. And it's probably available now to buy online. And um, reading that book, I had no idea how intense the support system for you had to be with things like the standing and leaning board. Like in between takes, they can't just take you out of the suit because it was so hard to remove. And so they've literally got you leaning on a stretcher. There's somebody like feeding you water you're like, they're opening a spigot in the back of your head for your sweat to come out. It seems like really, really intense. And that's why I was such a good droid teacher on uh, Rise of Skywalker, because I knew what those guys were going through. I knew which bits needed uh, itching if, if somebody, if something were, you know. Which bits need itching the most? Not the one you're thinking of, honey. <laughs> well, listen, I... Uh, Is it over? Yeah, you know Am I, I need going? to do it. 
please, release me. Let me go. <laughs> I thought you were going to do one thing, and then you zagged. <laughs> that is my way. Well, are, are we saying goodbye? We are saying goodbye. Is it for the last time? Is it? Is it? Is it? Well, please? if you and my son have anything to say about it, it probably will be. But I hope not, because you do know that speaking to you is always one of the highlights of celebration to me. Because you were one of my big heroes when I was a kid, and uh, you know I've grown out of it. But three <laughs> PO has been an amazing, amazing uh, uh, force and presence in my life, as it has to, I'm sure, many, many people here. And it is always wonderful having you on stage. Mr. Anthony Daniels, everybody. We've got more from Star Wars Celebration Live in just a moment, so stay right here. Anthony Carbuti. I'm at the Ladro stand and this is the most nervous I've been in my alleged career because I don't want to break anything. Carla, uh, there's some precious uh, things happening here. You're product manager for Ladro. Uh, talk us about the relationship you have with Star Wars, with Lucasfilm. I do have right. Pinky. Um, well, this is a really, really, really special collection for us. Uh, we started to work with Lucasfilm kind of like five years ago. So this is the whole collection, but um, well, last year we were launching at the Star Wars Celebration LA, the Darth Vader. It was a 504 limited edition that was sold out super quickly. So we thought that for the 70th anniversary of a Spanish-based handmade porcelain brand, we wanted to create something really special for the Star Wars fans. So here we have a 70 units limited edition Darth Vader, this time in gold. So um, it's a really special piece for us, and we hope like fans like it as well. Yeah, the Gold Lord of the Sith. Now, the reason why you have 70 units is because it's the company's 70th anniversary, right? Exactly. Just exactly. 70 available. So uh, I was, would say this is the hero piece of the Star Wars collection, but it's the villain piece, of course, being, right. being Darth right. Vader. It's kind of, uh, we were working in the light side so this was the entrance of Yadro in the dark side and that's why it's super special for us and it's very important to know that these are handmade pieces so many people work on them and probably takes like a month to make one so it's everything is made by hand wow. nothing is made by any machine so that's make them super special and sensitive so that's what makes Ladro stand out because there's a lot, lot of Star Wars statues out there, you know, yeah. busts uh, available. So it's the handmade element that makes Ladro stand out, right? Right. I think it's a really emotional product. That's that's the main thing about this brand. So oh. we're happy to work on this super um, special um, thing. Yeah. Uh, now, there's a character in the Star Wars universe that doesn't get very much attention. So I think we need to write that wrong right now. Grogu, behind you here. Tell us about the Ladro Grogu. Well, this cutie mm -hmm. came up uh, a month ago as well, and it's been a really successful piece worldwide. So we are presenting it today as well. And I, I can say that he's been in many photos today. So then let's say that he's very special for us as well. Yeah, he's the rock star. Thank you, Carla from Ladro. You're welcome. Enjoy the rest of the celebration. Thanks for coming. Oh, you are welcome, and thank you for watching. But stay tuned, lots more to come from Star Wars Celebration Live. <laughs> The day is not over. Oh, goodness. Oh, no. It's the running of the Wilro Hoods. I'll make this quick then. For the last 10 years, 
Neil Scanlon and his creature shop have been made response have been responsible for creating some of the most memorable aliens, creatures, and droids we've ever seen. No! I'm too late! Now it's time to take a peek inside his workshop to see how the magic is made. The creature cantina panel starts right now. Curse you, Wilro Hoods! <laughs> Once again, I'm Brian Herring, and this is the Creature Cantina panel. Now, you saw what an incredible place that is to work, and it really is so much fun. And that's mostly down to the people who you get to work with, because as I said, they're all so talented. And I'd like to introduce you now to our fearless leader, the master of monsters himself. Please welcome Mr. Neil Scanlon. <laughs> Oh, that's pretty good, isn't it? That's great. Thank you. Uh, well, look, first thing, thank you so much for coming to this show. It really is amazing, and, and there's quite a lot of you here, which is really encouraging. Um, before I talk a little bit about uh, the, the sort of evolution of what's happened in those last 10 years that Brian's spoken about, um, I want to talk actually about you. Um, yesterday, uh, at the end of the, the uh, opening ceremony, I thought I'd take a little walk around. And I have to say, in that short walk, I saw three uh, acts of real kindness. And what I want to say is that right now in this room, there is just so much love and warmth that makes you probably the most special group of people that I know. So I want you to give yourself a round of applause and don't ever, ever lose that spirit. It makes you unique. Absolutely. A round of applause for you. Come on, come on. Absolutely. Incredible. Yeah, incredible. So, Brian was really, uh, it was a fabulous little history there, Brian, of where we're at. And I think what I'm here to say really more than anything is not take you through processes or any of those things, but to tell you a little bit about how we've grown up over those 10 years. When we first started, we never thought that we'd do more than one movie. It was just going to be one movie, we would come together and we would disappear. However, and we all know, that's not the case. So what we did is we built a workshop, we filled it full of machinery, and in a rather nomadic and rather sort of haphazard style, we put together a workshop in order to do Force Awakens. Then guess what happened? The next movie came along. So we kind of moved the workshop a little bit and we adjusted it a little bit, but you know what, it didn't really change very much. And that's really very true, quite frankly, of up until about a year and a half ago. And a year and a half ago, we were in discussions with Lucasfilm about their future, and as you know, what an exciting future that is. And Candice, who is the head of Lucasfilm, said to me, Neil, we're gonna have at least two projects happening at the same time, and possibly a third. And I think what, realized, what I realized at that point was that we just really had to rethink how we were gonna do things, how we were gonna to work together, if you imagine, and I have to say it, no one's getting any younger, me included, um, that it, we're, we're a group of people that have worked for eight years and we really haven't opened up those doors or re-looked at ourselves and said, how do we open this industry to the future, to the people that will carry this fabulous career uh, and uh, uh, job, as it were, forward? So we kind of reinvented ourselves and we looked at how we could uh, look to modern technologies, look to how we made things, what was that method? If you imagine the way that we make things at the moment is a little, a little like a baton race. One department hands the baton to the next and they go on and on and on. Well, that's fine if you've got the time and you've got the bandwidth, as they say, to do that. 
But that's not great if you want to bring new people into the industry who've not had, you know, 10 years, 20 years of experience. So we did exactly that. We started from afresh. And with the sponsorship of Lucasfilm, they built us a new beautiful workshop at Pinewood. We kitted it out with all the most modern equipment that we could. We relearned, or sorry, we learned some of those technologies. And we went out into the outside world and we started to talk to people who were just coming out of further education and invited some of those people to come and join us. One, because they had skills and te te uh, understandings of technology that we didn't, so we could learn from them, and they could quickly learn from us. And so this year, uh, we have, uh, in a sense, done, I think, uh, we have reinvented ourselves, as I said, and we now begin our creatures all at the same time. We can build them digitally, we can look at every aspect of them digitally, across the entire craft range that Brian mentioned, and then when those creatures, uh, when that creature is ready and we're all happy that we're going to make it, we can then turn to 3D printing processes, we can go to CNC methods, and even the sort of soft fabrication world, we can use uh, pre-cut patterns and laser patterns that allow us to bring those things in-house, build them as though they were a kit. So uh, all that is really me saying that I think what's so exciting about all of this is that having traveled this journey all my time, I would hate for not to feel that this part of the film industry, which I think is absolutely a stalemate of the visual effects world, shouldn't carry on for many, many years to come. And hopefully uh, there will be people out here or maybe even people in the audience that get, you know, we are a much, much more modern uh, 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 world where we can uh, embrace those technologies. And uh, yeah, you don't need to have worked in the industry all that long to be able to come and contribute to us. So if anybody's thinking about that, then absolutely, now is the time. Yes. Fantastic, Thank you. fantastic. Thank you now, to come and be part of your team is obviously a massive honour, and it's, it's, a, it's, a real, it's, it's, it's a real thrill, Neil. But I'd just like to bring out some of the other key yes. members yes. of our yes. team. And so please give a great big celebration welcome for Fiona Barnes, Matt Denton, and Derek Arnold. There's a lot of them, isn't there? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, if you could just go along the line and just introduce yourself and just sort of give a quick um, explanation of what your role is within the department, please. Hello, my name's Fiona Barnes. I am the <laughs> fabrication supervisor for CFX department. I work with a fabulous team of fabricators taking concepts through to being on set with them. In the workshop, we uh, work with the rest of the department, developing them, figuring out if they're going to be puppets, if there's going to be a person in there, an animal in there. And then after that process, which sometimes takes quite a while, we take them on set and we become their carers. We look after the people in the suits or the animals in the suits or the big rigs. We make them look good on set, but we also look after the people inside. We deal with a lot of sweat. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Very true. <laughs> My turn. Okay, my name is Matt Denton, and uh, I suppose on a daily basis you'd find me mostly at a computer. When I'm in the workshop, I do the electronics and coding, uh, which goes inside of these incredible animatronic heads that are built by our incredibly talented mechanical department. In fact, Neil was a mechanical a guy on the bench many years ago. Um, so I get given these heads, and then I get to put a little computer inside of them, and effectively see them come to life for the first time, which is really, really nice for me because the, the guys that built them haven't even seen them move yet. So I get that, but on top of that, when I go on set, I also get to have the privilege of getting to um, drive little round droids sometimes mm -hmm. yep. and uh, perform puppets and creatures. Uh, and in fact, one of the creatures that I got to perform was Six Eyes, which Derek happened to be inside of. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, my name's Derek, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm the, I think I'm the eye candy of the workshop. Uh, my job is to look good so that on a Wednesday when people get bored, they look over at me and they say, I can be more productive. Derek's good to know. <laughs> For my sins, uh, I started off as a suit performer back in uh, Force Awakens. Uh, and just stayed and annoyed Neil long enough for him to hire me and now I work with Neil uh, and the showrunners and the producers and my job is uh, to cast and rehearse 
and be on set for all of the puppeteers, suit performers, and work with the directors and the ADs to make sure that what they want and what we've talked about from the beginning gets performed on set because I have that experience. Okay, so with those suits, you've been inside those. What is it like to be inside one of those creature suits? Uh, I always say to new suit performers, go to your happy place. You've, you need to find your happy place real fast. It's a massive sensory deprivation. You can't really see, you can't really hear, and if you are hearing things, it's fed through a mic, there's not a lot of oxygen, and you're usually covered in about six to seven inches of just foam around your body the whole time. Okay, so to give you an idea of what that looks like, we're gonna bring out one of our suit performers here, and we're gonna Brian, dress them Brian, from head to toe. I'm sorry to interrupt, but uh, I have to say, yesterday I went for a bit of a wonder, and I came across a couple of cosplayers yeah. who, uh, said they'd like to come and join us on stage. So could those two people that I bumped into yesterday come up and be part of this? <laughs> OK, <laughs> then. Give them a great big round, round, round of applause, welcome. ladies and gentlemen. Here they come. <laughs> sorry, sorry to do that. Oh, OK, that's what we're doing, isn't it? <laughs> OK, there we go. Hello. If you could just come over to this side for me. Thank you very much. I'll start with you. <laughs> OK. Uh, hello. Hi. <laughs> uh, what's your name? My name is Marissa. And where have you come from, Marissa? From the Netherlands. And is this your first celebration? Yes, it is. Okay, fantastic. Now, um, I think we'll probably... We'll, um, suit performer? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Why so, not? Yeah. yeah, okay, right. So, um, <laughs> okay, so, okay, right, she's off. Okay, right, so, um, so okay, 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 so Fiona... <laughs> so, okay, so Fiona and Neil are taking Marissa off to... Um, to, 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 get her, to get her ready for this. Oh, yes. so, so, okay, oh, okay, this is what's happening then. Um, <laughs> Classic. <laughs> so, thanks, Neil. So, uh, uh, hello. Hi. Hi. Uh, what's your name? Dino. Dino, nice to meet you, Dino. Where are you from? Germany. Germany. Any Germany? Anyone from Germany in? There we go, lovely. Okay, and uh, is this your first celebration, Dino? Uh, it's my sixth your celebration. Your sixth celebration. Right, okay, you're an old hand at this then. That's fantastic. So in that case, you're going to do our puppetry for us. So should we just have, mm -hmm. a, have a little look at what we've got under this, yeah. un under the old uh, cloth here? So over here, we've got one of our animatronic heads from our department. Look at that lovely fella. <laughs> and uh, so inside of this head, there's probably about 20 to 30 motors. Every has, head has one, and each motor would move like a lip, for example, something like this, or the jaw or the nostril. In fact, I'm going to plug him in and hope that it works, because you never do live <laughs> demonstrations sure, yeah. on stage. <laughs> what you certainly shouldn't do is get people out of the audience and try and dress them up live on stage. <laughs> but we'll talk about that later. Uh, so I'm just going to put this on. Do you know? So let's see. We've got it. There we go. Look, look. So I'm, by moving this, I've got the mouth going and the eyes going. I can blink. Now, you might have seen this before. This is kind of like a radio control transmitted find on a plane or a car. I'm sure lots of people have seen them. We customize them slightly. We've got these extra sticks up here, one on there. And then there was also a computer in the head, which makes puppeteering much easier. So just by moving one control, you get lots of things moving together. So actually, it makes our job a little bit easier. But it's making a lot of noise. It does make an awful it lot of noise. Whoever's in that head, Marissa? Yeah. Marissa. yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but you, I mean, you can't hear. Uh, let's see if we can. Can we? Can we? Go to your happy place. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because in, you were in six eyes, weren't you? How many, how many servos were in six eyes? The six eyes was nearly 60. 60 yeah. servos. So yeah. just going off in your ear like that. Okay, so um, in that case, so we'll get you to do that then, Dino. Have you got any, uh, have you got any puppetry experience whatsoever? No. Perfect. <laughs> Great. Okay. Um, in that case, we're going to need a crash course. Yeah. Um, oh, okay. okay. Uh, yeah, why not? Um, in that case, to give Dino a crash course in animatronic puppetry, we'd like to welcome to the stage one of the only four performers to reprise their role from the original trilogy to the sequel trilogy. It's only Nine Numb, Mike Quinn. Hey. Oh, he's brought a friend. Thank you so much, my God. Keep it up. Yeah! Okay. Thank you. Okay. Oh, that's fantastic. Love you. Lovely to see you, Mike. Oh, you bought your friend. I did bring my lovely, beautiful friend. Very good. We met at the bar very, last night. Oh, very yeah. nice. So, would it be possible to, for you to give Dino a really quick crash course You're kidding. off stage in <laughs> animatronic performance? Hi, Dino. Hi. I'm so sorry. Now, actually, <laughs> congratulations, because you are like the center of the Star Wars universe right now. So, 
So you're going to be working uh, this head. You're going to be puppeteering this head, okay? My condo. So we're going to take you backstage okay. and get you all set up. How's that sound? Awesome. Let's Fantastic. Do it. Give him a round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Have some fun. Have some fun. <laughs> See you later. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So, while we're waiting for our yeah, suit performer to be back ready to go. In fact, they are. Here they come. They're all ready to go. It's like this is perfectly timed. This is. I can follow him. Yeah. Here we go. Are you, doing this? <laughs> you just come down here, Marissa. You okay? Welcome to our world. Wow, look at that. We're here. Welcome to our world. <laughs> look at you going. So, so, what, so Fiona, could you talk us through what we've got going on here? So we've very quickly just got Marissa into a jerkin. Um, which is a base that we usually use, which usually holds on our battery packs for our heads and our comms, so Marissa can hear once the head starts going. We've also given Marissa a harness because the head gets quite heavy and a little bit front heavy, and there is here a bungee that will take the pressure off Marissa's nose and head, hopefully. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, start getting you dressed. Brilliant. Great, okay. I'm going to come and help you. Oh, yeah, Matt, that'd be great. Thank this you. This is not usually my job, so I'm going to get it not wrong. Not Matt's job. <laughs> if you'd like to pop into there. OK, so we've got like a pair of big trousers. So this is the lower half of the padding. So this is made out of foam and a material called Spacer. It's quite lightweight. It's got a nice move to it. So, uh, so yeah, it's uh, Marissa's won't get hot and well she will get hot and sweaty but maybe not as hot and sweaty <laughs> if it was layers of wadding okay I suppose and these are all bespoke aren't they you can't buy these off the shelf no this is what we make in the fabrication this department so amongst other things we That's make it. a lot of body paddings to change the shape of a person to match the creature this is so you're going to completely change her body shape by just by covering in foam indeed That's amazing <laughs> And you've worn a lot of these kind of suits yeah. over the years, Derek. What's, what's kind of been, the, 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 are they comfortable? Are they comfortable? How, they, no, they can be comfortable. The, 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 big reason we, the big reason fabrication plays a, a large part in our, in our roles, because when you put an animatronic head on, uh, if I were to put this head on my body right now, the head would be proportioned wrong to the body. So the fabricated body pads out the head, so then everything's in proportion. But then the suits, really help the performer bring to life because Marissa will now only be able to sort of walk a certain way and it can add that weight <laughs> and that okay. movement and the way that she can move her head, her arms. So it does actually help and uh, inform the performance in the character a lot more. How are you feeling? Uh, big. Big, okay, yeah, big is good, okay, right. So, so, you, so the, now the trousers are going on. Now, do we make the costumes in-house? No, so a lot of the time we work, as fabrication, we work very closely with the costume department when we're on set, it would usually be the costume department putting these costumes on. So, costume department, forgive me if I get anything <laughs> wrong. <laughs> <laughs> now, I can see there that Marissa has also got like a radio pack. Yeah, so she'll have comms in her ears. So when these are buzzing, you can't really hear direction from the directors or anyone else. So the puppeteer who's controlling the head on the outside will have comms directly to the performer inside and they navigate their world. So that puppeteer is telling them where their eye lines are or if they're rolling or cutting because you won't hear any of that information. And if the character has dialogue in a scene, in your other ear, you get all of the dialogue from the actors. So in one ear, you're getting the dialogue from the actors so you can hear your cues. And then in your other ear, you're getting the direction from the puppeteer and your lines as well. So you're navigating. Your ear, you're navigating. How was it? What is it like having me in your ear? <laughs> yeah, <it> can't be. <laughs> it's beautiful okay. and lovely. Okay, so the, the the boots are going on there. The jacket's going on. Going are you guys all right out there? How's that going? Okay, right. That's that's that's, that's, that's going on pretty well, right? Okay, so this this looks like are these costumes hot. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you lose a lot of weight. Yeah. <laughs> when we were in uh, Jordan for three weeks, I lost six pounds. <laughs> so did I. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so we've got but we get um, uh, fabrication are amazing. So between uh, any time they call cut, they run in with Makita yeah. uh, leaf blowers that we've uh, modified. And the leaf blowers, they just blow air into the head and circulate all of that air out so that uh, you don't faint. 
Okay, so we've got enough. belts going on there. There'll be blasters sometimes. There'll be heavy oh, well, props that they carry. Yeah. And sometimes their hands don't work like human hands no. either, do they? No. Everything's timed so that we, we're strict with our time. So when I'm on set, a big part of my job is to go to the directors and say, Super Former's been inside the head for 40 minutes. You have 15 more minutes before we take the head off. Then 15 minutes later, I go back and I say, you get three more takes, then the head's coming off. We try not to keep a performer in a head for longer than an hour. Uh, but some of them, uh, some, of the, some of the older guys, Aiden, he, he, sometimes you have to make him get out. He'll just stay in all day. Um, but yeah, we were, and then we are constant contact with the performers between each take. How you doing? How you feeling? Get them a little bit of water to sip on, uh, but not too much because going pee is not an easy task in those things. <laughs> so Fiona, what kind of, how, are we, how are we doing there? We're nearly there. We're nearly there. We're nearly ready for the head. We usually go for the head before hands because that means... Marissa will be able to help us guide the head on. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think we're. Are we good? Pretty much there. Okay. So um, we should uh, we should probably put the, put the head on. Head on. You're okay. Ready? Are you are you are you ready for this? I think so. <laughs> okay. Are you are you how are you? You nervous? You just uh, you, you you found your centre and your creature. You got your creature walk ready and. Uh, Definitely. Just, okay. Right. Okay. This, here comes the head. You can't really see inside of that too well, but it's basically packed full of motors. And there's a skull cap inside, what we call, and that's going to sit on top of her head. And some straps to do up, tighten it up. So, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> okay, on it goes. Okay, Marissa, you okay? So, I'm just going to tighten the strap at the back. How does that feel? Yeah, yeah and then I'm going to do the bungee up. <laughs> she says with confidence, so I'm going to do the bungee up. Let me know when that feels good. Bit more. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's nice and tight now. Lovely. Right, I'm going to plug in the battery. I shouldn't switch on just yet. Oh, it is oh. on. Oh, we're going. We're going. Oh, hello. Mike's somewhere Mike's backstage. On it. Mike's backstage. There we go. Hello. What is going oh. on? Oh, oh look at that. <laughs> good. We're not quite done. She's still got human thumbs. <laughs> yeah, wait a minute. Something not quite right with your hands, is there? <laughs> no. <laughs> so what we're doing, we're just poppering the head on. So on set with something like this creature, we'd have a fabricator looking after the creature. We'd also have costume yep. with us. And as you can see, this one's got fur. So we'd have one of our fur technicians with so, us. So that's three people. Yeah. And then just from that, just from that perspective. And then there would be one or two performers on this, Derek? Oh, well, well, the performer inside the suit. Yeah. And, and then the an external puppeteer, depending how advanced the head is, usually it's one remote, but then sometimes <laughs> we split it out and do two so that if there's a lot of dialogue on a creature, one, one puppeteer will, will specifically work eyes and eyebrows. And the second puppeteer will solely focus on dialogue in the lips because making those shapes that we call it the ooh -ee. they have to make a nice ooh sound and the e sound and from there you can then fabric mess it up and, and create different words and sounds so okay. one will will focus directly on the dialogue and when they perform these do they do them in english or do they do them in creature language both yeah so sometimes uh, the director depending on what it, how it's scripted if the character has is speaking english they'll speak english but if they're if they're speaking alien, then those puppeteers just go full alien. <laughs> <laughs> we got a blaster. I always, I oh, always have to have a blaster. Weapons and everything. Up. I'm going to give you a blaster in your left hand, okay? That is your left hand, right? Yeah, left hand, right? Yeah. <laughs> How are you feeling? Are you, are you okay in okay. there? Lovely. There we go. Look at that. There's Marissa, ladies and gentlemen. Fully dressed up. I'm ready to go. So that, there, there you go. That's how we do creatures. That's it. That's all there is to it. It's well, easy. Like, I, in fairness, we've got Marissa suited and booted. We got Dino up here. We might as well have some fun. Well, we didn't get her dressed up for nothing, did we? <laughs> okay then, everybody places, sound speed, roll camera, cue the crawl.
call you Larry now. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. I think this is my costume. Oh, nice. I spend my whole life getting out of costumes, and this is the costume they give me. Yeah. All right. I think we <laughs> lost. I think we lost the gang leader. They're really looking for us now. We have to get into this cantina and get off this rock. Are you with me? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know the plan? Uh, yeah, we, yeah, we've got to save our rock and take our skins off. Makes sense. <laughs> All right, now look, they know me, but they don't know you. Oh. So you got to learn the password in order to get through the door. It's really easy, okay? You got to sort of balance on one foot. Yeah. You got to touch your nose twice with your finger. Ah. And you got to say, you don't need to see my identification. Ah, okay, okay. Uh, hang on. You don't need to see my identification. Uh, uh. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I thought that would be a lot harder. Okay, we'll, we'll make it harder next time. Great. All right, let's go. Yeah. Where? Oh. Hey, Quiggled. Go. Oh, no. Not you. You're trouble. <laughs> nice one, <man. laughs> Trouble? Oh. I'm not trouble. I don't get into trouble. I get into uh, misunderstandings with multiple parties at yeah. times. Yeah, I'm in trouble. No. You just on. like the sound of your own voice. Yeah, well, you sound... Why do you sound different? Blame that guy. You're nailing it, you know. <laughs> yeah, you're doing really yeah, good, buddy. Yeah. Quiggle, come on, man. I gotta get inside and meet Gruppetta, who's gonna help me get out of here. Come on. Who's the new guy? Uh, I'm his uh, cousin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is Larry. <laughs> He's my cousin. Can't you see the resemblance? Yeah. Password? Oh, yeah, password. Larry, do the, do the password. Oh, hang on. Turn Let around. Me turn around. Hang on. Let there we go. Let's just Let pretend we're the There you go, there. There Ready? you go. And Pass you don't need to see my uh, identificationisms. Yes. That's, yeah. That's, yeah. That's, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's nothing, really. Let's call it an ugly win, okay? There yeah. You go. Whatever. Okay. Just don't cause no trouble. Right. And no blasters. Oh, no blasters. No. Right. Here, uh, Larry, put yeah. your blaster in my hand. It's just directly in front of you. It's like a carnival game. Ah! Where? You got it. You got it. You got it. There, there we go. It. Hey! Yay! <laughs> Thank you. There you go. <laughs> All right, let's go. Let's go, Larry. Okay, where are we going? Now look, there's a lot of dodgy people in here, okay? So yeah. we just gotta, we just gotta meet up with Gruppetta and... I, <laughs> I've never seen your costume until now and that is ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> look, here's... Here's Gruppetta, let's go meet up with him. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man. You've got a lot of guts coming in here with the trouble you've caused. <laughs> Who's your friend? Oh, uh, I'm his uh, cousin, yeah, yes. This is, this is Larry. <laughs> Come on, man. You guys, that's so bad. <laughs> like, well, look at me, look at this. I know, look, what right, is it? Right. Look, I gotta get off this rock, and you owe me, remember, with the whole Tauntaun Twilight thing? Yeah, yeah, all, 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 all right, all right, yeah, we, 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 we'll cross over that now. Um, all right, I, I'll tell you what, um, yeah, I know, I know. Oi, R2! Uh oh. Hey! What? Hey! Woo! You come with me, right. and I'll find you a ship that'll get you out of the system without asking too many questions. You got it, I'm gonna leave you here, Larry. Now, what? You yeah. speak to the droid, and he'll download you a data slice that will get you past the planetary's defences. Oh, easy, uh, easy. You speak droid, right? Don't worry, everyone can. Uh, come on, let's, let's, go. let's get out. Uh, <laughs> wait, you're, you're, you're leaving me on my own. Oh well, I have this nice little droid. Hello, little buddy. Oh, want to be my friend? Oh, who's who's that nice little droid? Eh? Oh. Let me pat you on the dome. Let me pat you on the dome. Hey. Yes. What? What's that? What's going on? What's, what happened? What happened? He did what? You never tap an R2 on the dome when he's carrying sensitive equipment oh, and right. data. Yeah, oh, no. oh, no, we're in trouble now. It's the gang leader. What? All right, no one moves unless they want to be encased in carbonite and That's... hung behind the bar at Ogre's Cantina. That's that's how you're gonna do that. That's how you decided. That's what. All right. Anyways, that you, was... <laughs> you, 
You owe me money. Larry! You're coming with us! Larry, save me! Oh, oh I got a bad sir. feeling oh, about sir. this! Oh. You spilled my drink! Oh. What? What? The crowd, the crowd. What's happening? What's going on? Oh. What? Who's this person? Lights. Lighting. Wipe it up. Cue the lights. All of it. <gasps> Remove this slime from my presence. What? Now, who'd like a drink? What? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Ian McDermott! Thank you. <laughs> Best performance I've ever given. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Good to see you. Cut there! Heads off! Cut there! Heads off! Give me a round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Dino! <laughs> wow! How about that? Okay, while we get the head off Marissa, let's go over here. How was that, Dino? It was awesome. How about that for Dino, everybody? That was fantastic. Congratulations, <laughs> Dino. That was amazing. And while we're here, I'd also like to acknowledge, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Lee Towersy, who is not only a senior model maker in the Creature Effects Department, he's also the chairman of the UK R2 Builders Club, and he came into Star Wars from that position, and now he's here permanently. It's amazing. Lee Towsy, ladies and gentlemen. Well, Marissa, how was that? Warm. 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 Did you can feel the heat coming off, actually. Did you enjoy it? Oh, yes. It was so cool to do. That's fantastic. Oh, I'm, glad, I'm glad you had a great time. We've got so, to keep your details. It was really good. Absolutely. Now... <laughs> yeah, yeah, where's Neil? Is Neil where, where is Neil? Is he? Where's Neil? Where's Neil? Mr. It's, Scanlon. Uh, Mr. Scanlon, what do you yeah, think of that performance? I thought that performance was absolutely stunning. Thank yes. you so much. <laughs> absolutely. Come on. Absolutely. Well done. Well done. There you go. There you go. Yeah. We may have slipped into. We, you may have noticed we slipped into pantomime slightly at some point, but you know what? Well, that's a bit of a bit of uh, British tradition, isn't it? It was wonderful. So yeah, thank you all. We, we, ha we still have a few minutes, Okay. Great. so um, if we can take our creature performers in heads uh, off stage, and if anyone has, I'm going to take this off, it was delightful goggles, but if anybody has any questions they would like to ask, then if you could stick your hands up and I shall run out there, and there's, we've, we've got yep, Matt, yep, yep. we've got Derek, myself, Mike, right. Neil, uh, Tom, one of our other performers there, and also, oh, I've forgotten to mention also, some of our other cosplayers players we have on the, uh, our, our cosplay volunteers we have populating our bar. Let's give them a round of applause as well, please. Trinity was uh, mysteriously whisked away. I don't know if you noticed that, but she was whisked away. Enjoy yourself. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. So I'm going to dash out here now. Has anybody got any questions they'd like to ask Neil and the gang? OK, I'm just going to come down here now. Mm. <laughs> there we go. Come out to the front here. Thank you, sound department. You're fantastic. Hello, what's your name? Christy. Christy. And where are you from, Christy? Michigan. Michigan. States. Fantastic. And what is your question? My question is, what was the heaviest costume that an actor had to wear? Mm. He the heaviest costume that one of our performers has had to wear? Uh, probably maybe uh, little, the small beast, the lugga beast. That was like upwards of like two, three hundred pounds. <coughs> uh, me and Tom were in that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then your average animatronic head weighs a couple pounds. I think. A couple of pounds. A couple of pounds. On the rest. On the rest. <laughs> it's like having a newborn well, baby just sit on your head. Way up. About between about three kilos and five kilos, so up to ten pounds. It 10 depends pounds, on yeah. what we're doing. Yeah, they're much heavier. Yeah, much heavier. It's like a newborn baby sitting yeah. on your head. Um, <laughs> but that lugger beast that these guys oh, were, just me. you had on top of you. You'll know, bear in mind it was in Abu Dhabi, yeah, in the desert, and it was like uh, 51? 40, 42 degrees. Yeah. Yeah. in the shade <laughs> and about 70 degrees in direct sunlight and, they and Matt, let's not forget we also had Kieran Shah Kieran Shah on top of, of them as well, yeah which obviously so, yeah. adds a lot of weight 
Okay, who else has got another question? This gentleman here? Um, so, what impact does like how the suit is going to be used have on designing it and building it, like duration or weather, or like if the person's walking around or something? Did you get that? What impact does how the creature is going to be used affect the design of the suit, whether it's action or weather or how it, what terrain it's going to work on, that kind of thing? Oh, I, w I would say that that's absolutely fundamental to the start. I mean, sometimes we don't quite know what the action is going to be, but if it's ever an action that is uh, clearly going to sort of delve into the stunt world or... Um, uh, has, has a physical activity that, uh, I remember when we did uh, Rogue One with uh, Gareth Edwards in the early days, and I think I mentioned this on a little interview I did earlier, earlier which was um, idea, that, um, uh, again, Kieran Shaw in this particular case uh, had to do all kinds of things. He had to roll over, he had to do these action stunts in his own way, and it, that whole suit was designed to allow him to do that. So in many ways, the way it's designed, the hump on the back was allowed was there to try and give him support and protect him, the inside of the mask. So all of those things play a role in creating the suit. I've got a question down here from Mr. Skywalker himself. <coughs> Hello. Um, how often do you reuse suits? Like, for example, obviously you keep them in storage, but do you ever repurpose parts for new creatures? Little girl down there. Do we ever repurpose creatures for other productions? Repurpose, do we ever repurpose creatures? Sorry, yeah, because the monitors are quite different. Yeah. Sorry, the monitors are a little difficult here reverb, to hear. Yeah. yeah, we do repurpose them, to be honest, and that's where we, our relationships work so well with the programs that are being made in the States. Uh, Mandalorian, those shows, a lot of our characters go out there. We have a great working relationship with Legacy Effects. Uh, again, we all grew up together, so some of us are in the UK, some of us are in the States. And uh, we often send things over, and they will either use them exactly as they are, or they will repurpose them in some way, shape, or form. So when they did their little Babu Frick version, we sent out our Babu Frick, and then they copied that version and improved or did whatever they wanted to do to it. So absolutely, we try, we, we try to use them because in Star Wars, a species is a, is a valuable entity. It's not just you know, a piece of wallpaper. Uh, uh, Pablo, uh, who you all know, writes often backstories on these characters and they become really part of the world. So uh, it's, it's a new challenge to us because as we go into the series and the shows and we're, the demands for repurposing things, we have to do that with respect to the species that we've created, hopefully. Can I, can I just speak to the quality of the CF? I've got a mic here. The, the quality of the work that these guys do because um, for my Nine Numb character in The Force Awakens, we had the exact same costume, the same head, the same mech, even the same skin for three movies and a Disney ride over eight years or whatever, seven years or whatever. That, I've never seen that before ever, so these guys are amazing. Oh, Just wanted to add much, that. Thank you very much, Mike. I've got a, que I've got a question down the front here. Hello there. Biggest creature. What's the biggest creature? Hapabore? Hapabore was uh, in The Force Awakens and there was Five people in there? Eight, you were one of them. Yeah. yeah. One in each leg and one in the head. It was big. It was like the size of like uh, two small cars. Not Do you remember that creature, the one that's at the water, the big pig-like creature? I haven't seen that number. <laughs> You'll get there. You'll get yeah. there. When you do, that was the Shoot. biggest one we've made. <laughs> yeah. oh. Thank you for your question. That was lovely. Good question. Well, another question down here. Hello there. Um, how did... How did you connect the computer to the um, alien's head? Nice. That's, That's a, a fantastic nice. question. Nice. How do we connect Very the computer good. to the alien's head? Great question. Yeah. Uh, how the hell do we do that? <laughs> <laughs> you you said we should have rehearsed something. I'm gonna, I'm Such frauds that we are. <laughs> I'm going to go and find someone that can answer that. <laughs> uh, um, well, I've spent many years. I did electronics and software engineering as an apprenticeship before I got into the film industry, but I loved Star Wars, and uh, I wanted to work in special effects. I didn't really know there was such a thing called creature effects, but I also loved Jim Henson's Creature Shop and films like The Labyrinth. So, yeah, The Labyrinth is what inspired me, actually, to get into creatures, and, and so I realized I bought a book on industrial light and magic, and I saw they had electronic technicians that worked there, and I thought, well, I could do that. So I've spent 
many years trying to get, well, I, I got my foot in the door quite early, actually. I think I was just bra brave and, you know, kind of went in with no fear as a younger man. And then I've slowly got more and more fearful through my life. <laughs> but um, so I've spent years and years making little bespoke computers that I've, got, I've shrunk them down, like the big computers we used to use back in the 90s, which were massive. And I've shrunk them and shrunk them and shrunk them because technology has allowed me to do that. To the point now we have this little bespoke computer that which I've designed and we make them in-house even. Um, and we put that in the head and then all the motors plug into that computer. And then the computer does some very clever things inside. It makes things look kind of softer and more organic, the way the motors move, because we don't want them to look like robots. We're at, they are robots inside, but we want them to look like creatures or animals. So we do a lot of tricks in the software to take away the robot. And then we have puppeteers like Mike Quinn, myself, and lots of other people who puppeteer them with these control sticks. And that talks to the computer and tells it what we want to do, like make it smile or make it sad or make the oo or the e shape out of the mouth, and that's how we get dialogue out of them. Yeah, it's all um, about the fact, acting and expressions. It is. Yeah. It's all about expressions. In fact, I'm doing a talk on this on Monday, if you're still around. I'm actually doing a talk on, the, on my history in animatronics and how I went from computers to where we are now and all sorts of other things we used to get that emotion out of characters. In the steam room. Though. In the steam room. Sorry, it's in the steam room upstairs somewhere. So, yeah. yeah. Okay, Thank I've got you. a twilight at the front here. Hi everyone. Um, first of all, thank you all so much for what you do. The, the creatures and the droids and uh, bring like so much joy to me and all of us here. Um, the question I have is, um, when the original movies were made, obviously no one really had an idea of, of the impact that, that characters like Neum Nam or Max Rebo would have on the, the fandom. When you're creating characters for, for the new um, films and, and uh, shows now, um, does the fan reaction to characters inform how you design the character in any way? Are you thinking of their legacy when you build them now? Hmm. Um, in tr there is all, uh, of course, we are in the film business, and there is always going to be an element when we uh, generate certain characters to think about what their sort of life outside of the movie might be. But I would think, in all honesty and in, in, in all sincerity, that's probably as far as we go. Uh, it, it, it would be formulaic to believe or even try to do, you know, the perfect merchandisable or the perfect successful thing. It's surprising which characters, you know, if you look at Two Tubes, one of the characters that has zero facial motion, does absolutely nothing by most standards other than the fact that it's performed by Aiden. Um, that character has become a real yeah. popular character and has found itself into a kind of, you know, in, into the Star Wars world. And then we could try really, really hard and make something really sophisticated, and uh, it, it doesn't happen. So, absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, yeah, that's the way we go. Okay, I think, I think we've got time for maybe one more question. So, what's your, what's your question, sir? Okay, this is for the droid department. Does Chopper have the same attitude towards you guys as he does on set and, and on camera? Well, tricky question. <laughs> uh, I'm going to be honest with you. Um, today was the first time I was fortunate enough to puppeteer Chopper because Chopper's come from a US production. But um, yeah, from what I've experienced today for the Osaka panel, I don't know if anybody saw that today. But um, yeah, it was a good panel, wasn't it? It was a great panel. And um, yeah, he's, he's definitely got attitude. He's fun to drive. And um, yeah, you have to obviously um, reflect that into the droid puppeteering performance as well. So I, I, early days with that, yet. Yeah. Like I say, today was my first day, but it's, it's good fun to drive, and he's definitely got more attitude than R2. <laughs> okay, this is our last question. Here we go. Um, what coding language do you use? Crikey. Wow. Ooh. I'm loving all that. I mean, you know, yeah. definitely come to the panel tomorrow, because I can bore you way more than this. <laughs> uh, on Monday, sorry, Monday. Um, I've, I, use, I can code in several languages. Because the one you need to learn, the one you have to learn to enable you to code in lots of languages is C. C is like the base layer, and then if you can learn C, you can learn C++ and Python and all the other ones that are based on C. So I learned C as an apprenticeship, and, and uh, that's what I predominantly use. Yeah. So learn your C yeah. is the moral of that, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, um, I think we, I, can, I, can, I, can, I can't even begin to tell you how much fun I have working with these people on a regular basis. And I would just like you to give it up for the guys on stage and all the guys backstage.
And Brian too. Well done. I would like to say though. Oh, I'm not stopping that. You should have beaten the shot. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. I would like to leave you with this thought. You've seen today how many people it takes to make just one of these characters work. All those different departments and all those people working together to make one character go. Now, imagine the Canto Bike Casino where we had 56 characters up at once. That crew was absolutely huge and they're all fabulous. Ladies and gentlemen, your Creature Cantina Department. Brian. projects playing Obi-Wan Kenobi, but you might recognize him as Rogue Three or Red Two. It's the man behind Wedge Antilles, Mr. Dennis Lawson. <laughs> Wow, what a reception. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Amazing. Star Amazing. Wars celebration. We know how to party. We know how to, to say hello. You certainly do. Thank you. Thank you. It's wonderful. We know how to say welcome in. Yeah. Now, your first Star Wars celebration was a few years ago now, you were telling me. Yes. How has your experience been with Star Wars celebrations since 2017, I think, when your first one was. Yeah, 20, yeah, but yes, yes, but they're just extraordinary events and wonderful to be at. I think uh, one of the very first ones I did was in Orlando, which was the 40th anniversary, I think, but it was the second largest building in the United States after the Pentagon. I think there were 80,000 people there. It was staggering. And then at one point, these huge black drapes opened across one side of the, 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 the hall and there was a 40-piece orchestra conducted by John Williams that played the theme. Oh, my God, it just knocked you sideways. It was extraordinary, absolutely amazing. Amazing. I love seeing that your response to that panel was the same as my response to that panel, because that was my first celebration as well. All right. And my first Star Wars celebration panel that I got to attend. Okay. And I felt the same way you did. I was just, yeah, it was just amazing. a puddle. I couldn't a believe it. A human puddle. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Uh, but it must be a bit different. You know, you are in Star Wars. You have been in Star Wars since the beginning. Yes. If someone told you in 1977 that you would be reprising the role of Wedge Antilles 40 plus years later, what, what would, would you have said? I would have said, don't be ridiculous. That's what <laughs> I would have said. 40 years later, it's just insane. It's, just, it's extraordinary. Because we made the first one, as I'm sure you all know, in 1976. That's when we shot it. And we had no idea uh, what we were involved with. I think the budget was quite low. It was like a low budget sci-fi movie kind of thing. I don't even know we had full scripts at that time. Uh, we just turned up as pilots, had a, a lot of friends, uh, young actor friends, we knew each other. So that was lovely, a lot of camaraderie on the set. It was great fun. And George is a very unassuming, nice man and a genius. Obviously, so um, absolutely. But to, to look forward to this moment from there, which just insane, would have been mad, you know. And then, what was your reaction when you learned that you were coming back as Wedge for Star Wars: The Rise of Skywalker? Yeah, that was quite strange because um, it was very unusual. J.J. Abrahams himself emailed me directly. No, that doesn't happen. They get in touch with your agent, you know, and say, "Would you like to do?" But I, so I get this email from 
J.J. Abrams. And I rang my agent and said, this is a wind-up. This can't be right. <laughs> this is spam. Somebody, yeah. yeah, somebody's winding, you know, somebody's having a laugh. So, no, they checked it. No, it is JJ. So I was in direct contact with JJ, and, which was wonderful, very unusual. And at the time, um, I was very, very busy. I was in a play in the theatre and about to immediately go in and direct a play, because I direct a bit too. And so we were talking about the dates, and they wanted me for five days for, for the movie. And I said, well, this is my schedule. And he came back and said, well, we can't, I don't think we can do this. And I sort of jumped up and down and said, no, come on. We've got, we've got to be able to do something, come on. So we managed to, we managed to scrape one day out of both the sh of my schedule and theirs so that I could turn up and get back on the set. And that's why it's quite, quite a brief appearance because of that. But it was just wonderful to get back on the set. I loved it, I loved it, you know. Yeah, I know there's a lot of there's a lot of wedge fans here. Clearly, it was such a great moment in the theater to see you turn up in the Rise of Skywalker in that cameo. I was not expecting it. Yeah, and it yeah, just, yeah. Just a joy. Yeah, great. Now you've been in Star Wars. Your nephew, as we mentioned, Ewan McGregor, has been a big part of Star he Wars. He has. He has. I imagine you're quite proud. I am. And now his wife, Mary Elizabeth Winstead, is also joining Star Wars yeah. as Eris Syndulla. Yeah. <laughs> what advice would you give her about joining this galaxy? Well, I wouldn't dream of giving Mary Elizabeth advice. She's an extraordinary actor. I admire her so much. And I feel that Mary Elizabeth knows how to handle herself perfectly well. So my answer to that question is none. <laughs> okay. That's a great answer. Yeah. And she was sitting in this very chair earlier today, oh, and she was lovely. an absolute delight. Lovely. She's uh, very well received. A lot of Harris in the audience at that time, which was yeah. just yeah. wonderful to fantastic. see. Fantastic, fantastic. Now, clearly, there's a lot of love for Star Wars, you know, as you well know. Yeah. And there has been a lot of love for it for now over four decades. Yeah. What do you think it is about Star Wars, the oh. mythology, the storytelling, yeah. that continues to resonate with fans in such a big way that 40 yeah. plus years on, we can hold a Star Wars celebration yeah. and this it's, is the crowd yeah. that turns up. It is absolutely extraordinary phenomena, isn't it? But I, I would go back to one individual, George Lucas, who I would say is, yeah. Who I would say uh, is some kind of genius. I mean that sincerely. Um, the, this, the scripts he put together, that extraordinary universe he created, but then the narrative drive through that, uh, that atmosphere, that, that creation, is, is really, really strong. The, the, you know, the first three films, the, the, the narrative drive is so extraordinary. It's, wonderful. it's almost like a Greek tragedy or something. It's amazing. I, um, so I, um, um, I would put it firmly on the doorstep of George Lucas. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that is a fantastic answer. Yeah. And people still love Wedge. What do you think it is about your character, Wedge Antilles, that people still love and are, are so attached to? Oh, I've no, I've, I have no idea. I, I don't know. I, you know, I just turned up and did the best I could. You don't, and um, I, it's, it's been a wonderful surprise to me that people are attached to the character. I just... I did my, you know, I just did my best with it. And um, um, as I, I've said, you know, actually making the movie was great fun because of the, the relationships we developed, you know, Mark Hamill and myself and Ian McDermott, by the way. <coughs> I don't know if you know this, but Ian McDermott and I were amateur actors together in Scotland. I didn't know that. Yes, I met him when I was 17 at the Dundee Dramatic Society. We, we auditioned for the same day to get into Glasgow Drama School. And I, we walked outside and I shook his hand and I watched him walk up the street and I thought, I'll never see that guy again. And <laughs> we both got in and trained together and shared flats together and I've known him all these years. It's quite extraordinary, quite extraordinary, yeah. And now you're at Star Wars Celebration together. Yeah, precisely. Yeah. Precisely. You just keep running into him. Yeah, in fact, this morning, I saw him this morning, and I was digging through some old photographs, and I found 
two photographs of myself and Ian McDermott sitting on the steps outside drama school in 1969 or 70 or something like that. Yeah, yeah, it's quite remarkable. Yeah. That's fantastic. I love that. And, you know, Star Wars is all about that connective tissue, all of those amazing connections. Yeah. So whether it's you or and Ian or you and Ewan, yeah. we love to see it. And Star Wars is just one big happy family. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it was always like that, to feel, you know, and, 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 and over the, again, I'm proud to say over the, the movies, Mark Hamill and I became good friends with, and our wives, and uh, so that was a, a lovely relationship to have too. Yeah, it was great. Yeah. Well, and I love to see that translation too with you know, your characters, friends on screen, but then the two of you behind the scenes also becoming real friends. Yeah. Yeah, yeah Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Dan. Thank you. It is a joy you. to hear your story. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. And thank you for everything that you have done and now that your family has done for the lasting legacy of Star Wars. Lots more from Star Wars Celebration Live coming up. Don't you dare go anywhere. It's hard to believe that it's been 15 years since the Clone Wars first debuted. Now it's time to join Dave Filoni, Ashley Eckstein, Matt Lanter, Dee Bradley Baker, and more as they sit down to reflect on this legendary series. The 15th anniversary of the Clone Wars panel starts right now. also love a show called Star Wars The Clone Wars, yes? <laughs> Resounding. You know, we're at 15 years, and, and what I've decided to think about these anniversaries, don't do the math, number one, and think about we've had 15 years with these characters and these stories and how special it is that we get to come here to look back and have feelings and remember it all. So I really hope you'll give me, help me in giving a very warm welcome to some of our panelists, yes? Yeah, they're ready. All right, please welcome to the stage, Dave Filoni. <laughs> Athena Portillo. Matthew Wood. And Killian Plunkett. Don't do the math. No, no. So young. We were all so young. We were all so young. That's hey, a long friends. Time ago. Oh. Look at this. Look at us all together. Thank you, friends, for being here. It's very exciting that it has been a little bit. Gulp. Uh, it's fine, it's fine. So um, we thought the best way to kick things off would be to go back to the beginning. And Dave, can you talk about the origin of the show and, and how it began? Yes. Yes, I can. <laughs> what do you want to know about that? Um, I was working on a show called The Last Airbender. At <laughs> oh, they've heard of it. Also very popular. <laughs> And uh, over at Nickelodeon, and I got a call uh, from a producer from Lucasfilm named Catherine Winder, and she said, uh, we're making a Clone Wars animated series, to which I said, right, didn't you already do that? <laughs> and she says, yeah, but we're making it now, and we're making computer animation, to which I said, yeah, I don't do that, because everything I did at the time was hand-drawn, uh, still on paper, no computers yet. And... Uh, for whatever reason, she stuck with me on the call and didn't hang up, which she would have been fair. And uh, she said that they were, George wanted to make this animated series, and George recommended me. And I found that also very hard to believe. 
because um, I had, didn't think I'd done anything that he certainly would have seen. Um, and she said, well, would you like to have lunch and we could discuss it? And I said, sure, Catherine, I'd love to have lunch and discuss making Star Wars with you. And then yes. I feel like a real kind of fool. And I'm like, the guys from SpongeBob are right next door, Vince and everyone. And I know that I've been talking about Revenge of the Sith a lot. They know I'm very excited about this and that John Carl and I had our lightsabers at work and they're making fun of me. And this is a prank call. And so before Catherine hangs up, I said, look, I got to ask you, who is this really? <laughs> and she says, what do you mean? I said, I know this is a joke. There is no such show. And, and this is, you're just trying to, you know, exploit my, my love of this thing. And she says, are you Dave Filoni? I said, well, yeah. She says, do you work on The Last Airman? And I said, yeah. And she says, well, you're the guy. And I said, something in her voice told me, oh, wait, this is serious. <laughs> And the next two sentences were terrible. I said, you have no idea how much the guy I am. I'm making a Plo Koon costume in my garage. I really said this to her. And she told me later that she wanted to cancel the lunch at that point, but she didn't. There's Catherine. And uh, I mean, the rest is, uh, you know, what it is. I, I met her. We got along. I met Gail Curry, uh, who's standing in the, in the photo right next to Rob Coleman and uh, then I had to interview with George Lucas to get the job and that was a pretty quick thing and I thought the whole time they would come to their senses and realize that uh, I was completely underqualified for this job and uh, I met George met him he was super nice explained what Jedi were to me I'm like this is the coolest thing ever and uh, then he said thank you very much and I said thank you very much and I thought that was it and I have a great story for in line at the movies because I met George Lucas and then they popped their head in the door and said he likes you, you got the job. And then my first thought was, wow, they don't have any idea what they're doing here <laughs> <laughs> because I wouldn't hire me for this job. But it seems to have worked out because George wanted to tell the story of the Clone Wars way more in depth than it had been done and he wanted to be involved with the scripts and the process and uh, that's where it kind of all began right there, uh, working with him and learning the craft of uh, making a Star Wars. That's awesome. Um, my takeaway from that, yes. My takeaway, though, is, is did you finish building the Plo Koon costume in your garage after Did that? finish it. And I, so I got the job on uh, Clone Wars, and I did finish the costume, and I wore it to San Diego Comic-Con with another director of Clone Wars who later came on, Giancarlo Volpe, who I had made him a Kit Fisto costume. And so somewhere out there are people that actually have photos standing with me and Giancarlo as Kit Fisto and Plo Koon. In fact, I met one of them, a friend of mine, John Schlosser, who's in 501st, and he found a picture of him with me in costume before he knew who I was. And, and oddly, this is a strange story. I was at the Comic-Con as Plo Koon talking to Ayla Sakura, because of course, and she is talking to me and says, you know, I hear they're making a new Clone Wars uh, series. I hope that people know what they're doing, who are doing it. And I said, yeah, well, I think they're going to do their best. <laughs> you know? She had no idea. You did do your best. Welcome was being supportive Jedi Master. You know? that's, that's what he does. That's what he does. He does. He's, he's all right. Now, Athena, tell me how, how you joined this Clone Wars party. That was an interesting one. I was actually working on um, Strange Magic at the time. And, yay, Strange Magic. And um, <laughs> so I was in a room with three other coworkers and Filoni, I remember Filoni walking in and saying, are you the one with the Jedi 96 license plate? I said, yes. He's like, what does the 96 stand for? I said, oh, that's when I started working at Lucasfilm as an intern back in 96 licensing. So. And he goes, oh, okay, so you like Star Wars. Well, you know, why are you working on a show about fairies? You should be working on Star Wars with me. You should be working with me. we got to make that happen. I'm like, yes, please make that happen. <laughs> uh, and I, it, I think it was January of 2007 is when I came on board to the show. And then literally in July, he asked me to move to Singapore to set up Clone Wars at Lucasfilm Animation Singapore. And for, I think it was an undetermined amount of time, so I, I packed like crazy. I don't know, I packed like I was leaving forever. But I was there for about six months, 
And then um, Filoni said, okay, why don't you back at the ranch? You got to come back now. And I was like, okay, so. <laughs> yeah, we needed to get things done over there and you get things done. I mean, Thank you. can I be very clear? There is no Clone Wars without Athena. It's just not going to happen. It never would have happened. We had a lot of neat story ideas. But if you don't have somebody to know how, how to move the ball down the field, and she does, she makes it all work. And the, whatever idea I have, you've always come through. And, and, and you still, Bad Batch is a great show because of you. That's very <laughs> You get me all emotional now. Uh -huh. Now I need the tissues. <laughs> We have tissues if you need them. That can happen. That can happen. I love that you had a fairy tale going from fairies to Star Wars, like to the galaxy far, far away. By the way, then we could put them in Star Wars anyway because she knew all about them, so let's do that too. So it's like, it's all... It all works But I out. wanted somebody that loved Star Wars at the producer's helm, and, and that was Athena. We had, to, we had to have her on the show. Thank you so much, Filoni. You know how I feel about you. I love you so much. You're amazing. I, <laughs> See? I told you there would be feelings. Uh... Matthew, hi. Hello. Hey, tell us. Uh... <laughs> oh my gosh! I know these pictures. What Ooh. happened to my hair? It's well, it's still beautiful. <laughs> you got great hair, Matthew. Uh, tell us about your beginnings on Clone Wars. Uh, yeah. So the start of that was, let's see. Um, we had just finished uh, Revenge of the Sith, and we were getting towards the end of it. And I remember. Uh, George, and at the time there was a producer named Rick McCallum that uh, worked on the prequels, and they took me into uh, Rick's office, and they were saying, you know, we were all kind of very high off finishing uh, Revenge of the Sith, and I could see a, 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 a large weight had sort of lifted off George, and he was very happy to be, you know, done with, with the prequels, and I got this call to come in to their office that said, we're going to do this animated series. And, and, and George was like, I'm only going to do six, six to eight episodes I'm going to work on. You, can all, you should just work on six to eight episodes, and then we're going to hand it off to other people, and they're going to do it, but I don't want to, you don't have to like agree to anything, but just, we'll just do six to eight episodes. And I, and I said, of course I'll do that, you know, yes. And, and they were very like, like, don't worry, we're not going to lock you into anything like I would feel that way, but which I would never, because I love working on Star Wars, but... Um, so later on, I was in my office uh, working with uh, David Acord, who's there, my buddy right there, the co-sound designer and supervisor of the show. And uh, he's great. Love Dave. Uh, and I got this little knock at my door, and uh, in comes this gentleman right here. And he's, he was like, hey, guys, um, I've got this sequel. That me? That's young me. That's you. OK, That's cool. Young, young David. <laughs> Sound guy. Young, da young Dave comes in, he's like, I got the sequence we're working on. I think you either had it on tape or you had it on a disc or there was something that he had. And I felt like he was sneaking it over to us. Because they were, we were all on Skywalker Ranch, but they were in a different building. And he's like, we got this sequence. And uh, there's these, you know, and he, and he started showing us some storyboards and things of the, the, cliff, uh, the cliff sequence in that episode. And I was wondering if I could get your sound effects in there, if we could help me out. And I was like, yeah. And then that's kind of how it was born. And I, I always love that like George himself was like I'm only going to do eight episodes and you only have to do eight cut to like you know years later we've done a hundred episodes and because everyone just loved it so much and we loved and it was, it was such a tight-knit crew and, and George watching him because I'd worked with him on the prequels and Young Indy and all these movies uh, that we had done and watching how happy he was, George working on every single episode with you and the crew, and he was just a kid in a candy store having fun with the show, and we all did. It was an infectious, and Dave and I and Juan Peralta there, that was the core, core uh, sound team, and it was just a couple of different offices, and we did the entire show ourselves, and it was like a first for Skywalker, and I got to do a whole bunch of voice acting for it and expand my career from what had happened on the prequels, wonderful opportunities and nothing but happy, happy memories. And I'm Yeah, that's the thing. You're the battle droids. That's right. You're yeah, every yeah. single battle droid. We've blasted. Yeah, all the droids in the times. show are fun. I, they I are famous. One. Which one is it? Ro what, 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 you oh, know what it oh, is. Oh, what? Uh, yeah, like, roger, roger. There it is. Yeah. <laughs> they love it. They love it. Yeah, the, 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 I love the battle I mean, you're putting, he was just in Mandalorian last week, so I was very happy to be a uh, battle droid's back. But uh, yes, that was my experience as the start on that, and I'm, I, I'm so happy to be here and talk about it. Nice. Well, I think we're all excited. I mean, look at the size of this crowd. Clearly. 
didn't just, it wasn't just six eight episodes for a reason. Uh, Killian. Hi. Hi. I'm so glad you're here. Very loud. Uh, tell us what what were you where did you uh, hmm, what were you doing when you got brought on to Clone Wars? What was the well, if you're looking for someone to blame, it would be Henry Gilroy, because Henry was the head writer on season one of Clone Wars, and I had known Henry for a long time because I had worked in comics. So I had done a different sort of, I'd actually worked on some Star Wars comics. I worked on Shadows of the Empire um, for Dark Horse. And, and I knew Henry, and Henry had said, oh, there might be some, maybe some work on this Clone Wars thing, um, because there was a small art team in place. And, and I thought, well, this is much like Dave. This will be a fun story if this turns into anything at all. It's probably going to be like two months' work, and I might get to do, you know, a battle droid's shoe or something. I'm not going to get to do anything major. Um, and then Dave and I met, and I know we're celebrating 15 years of the show actually airing, but we met 18 years ago because it was three years before anything was shown to the public that we started. It's a long time ago. Um, and yeah, so, so we met in a food court, I think in Sher Sherman Oaks or somewhere. It was not very glamorous, it was not very cool, and then we went to KB Toys and saw what cheap Star we Wars did, guys, yeah. you know. <laughs> That's what you did back then, when there was KB Toys. Yeah, it doesn't exist anymore. Um, and it was, yeah, it was very much the sort of thing where I thought, well, this would be fun, but I guess it's only going to last for, a, you know, a little bit, and I'll, and I'll do that and see what happened. And then I ended up being on the entire run, all the way from the very first episode to Vader lighting up Ahsoka's lightsabers. It was crazy. Yeah. I like how you all thought, like, oh, this is just going to be a, we'll just do this for fun. Like, we're just going to do it, and we'll have a few things, and it'll be great, what a memory, and here we are. There was nothing minute. like it at the time. Like, there was, there was the micro-series, which was fantastic, but there wasn't anything on the scale that George wanted to do. And, like, just on Killing, it's like, I needed somebody that understood the intricacies of all the design, you know, Roger Christensen and everyone had done Ralph and Corey in Star Wars. And so there are people that know when Vader's helmet is different or his costume is different or his lightsaber is different, and what those choices are, and you don't have time to explain it to everybody. And so you look at Killian's drawings, and he <laughs> understands all that. In fact, he'll debate you on it. And, and one, we would have all these debates, and a guy that worked for us named Gary Shepke, they got in a big debate with me about Wedge Antilles' helmet, because I knew it was green on the front, and they were saying it was gray. And so we arranged a trip to the archive building on the ranch, Just which so you're only like, supposed to do for research. But we acted like it was going to be doing for research. And we went down there. Remember this? Oh, yeah, we yeah. But the, the thing is, we, would, we always had very intense research. It was like every week we'd find right. we wanted, something but we were very re important. Sometimes researching, but this time it was over a wager. And we wanted to see this helmet. So we got the helmet out, and then they looked away. And I was like, yes, it's green. And then we acted like very professional. But uh, that's how I got to see Plo Koon. Yeah. And we had to see yeah. all And we actually this. turned it into an award for, for whenever someone referenced something from the movie. The green helmet it wrong. Award. It was the green helmet. It was like, yeah, you've done it again. Because a lot of things helmet. on film look a different color than they actually are, uh, you know, when you see it in person. And, and that was like, it's like the Adat driver. He's a, it's a completely different color uh, uh, armor than what we all grew up with, as we found out. But I still like the white helmet, to be honest with you. But still, very, very, very light gray is also cool. So, Which you learned on one of your research trips. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, because they don't have one. Oh. That, they found the Atta Driver helmet was recovered several years ago. But I don't, I, don't think we, I don't know if we have one at Lucasfilm, to be honest with you. I have one, though, but well, it's not real. Well, I was going to say, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not official, but it's, it's pretty darn close. Of course it is, of I'm course. Just saying. Of course, of course. Um, so Athena, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, you said you got, you know, you had to go back. He called you back to work at the ranch, and that was something unique about the show. You worked at Skywalker and at Big Rock, like, day in and day out. What was that environment like and just being so close to collaborate all the time? So what's interesting is after the four years in licensing, I was exposed to visual effects at ILM, and I told myself that I wanted to do visual effects for a bit, but with the intention of always coming back to Lucasfilm, 
primarily because of its culture, because of everybody I had an opportunity to work with. It's a family unit. It's everyone cares about each other truly. Everyone's honest with each other. It's just, um, it was an amazing feeling that you don't really necessarily get anywhere else. So I went away for a little bit to learn visual effects and I did come back and I'm staying here. <laughs> as long as Filoni keeps me and you know, trust me, um, I don't wanna go to any other company. And I just love what we built at Lucasfilm Animation and it is still this way. And it's just amazing that even through the three years of pandemic, we were still able to have that family unit, even if we were working from afar and we, it's just, it's just great, it's very unique, very hard to explain, but um, every Friday we have deliverables and we would call them Broadway Fridays at Big Rock where we would crank up the music and listen to Broadway tunes up until like midnight or 1 a.m., however long it took for us to finish all of our deadlines for that evening and it would be that kind of, you know, environment. So it was just a lot of fun and um, we had something called Nerd of the Week that Gary Shepke put together. Apparently I won three times, um, <laughs> which I was like, oh yeah. Just three? Just three. Um, yes, yeah, actually we did have a, a contest as well for Nerd of the Year. Um, we had an event called Pushanika. Uh, one of our artists was named Pushan and we would just have, you know, holiday parties, Filoni would dress up as Santa Claus and he would, you know, share production samples with us that we had. Um, it's just is special. So. You know, I had access to a bunch of uh, Star Wars merchandise because there would be overflow and I would uh, collect it all year and I would store it in a big closet. And then at Christmas, I, it was the only day that we opened up our doors to everybody and their families and we had a big the potluck. And uh, I would then just raffle it all off to the crew because I'm like, if the people making this stuff aren't getting it for free, who should? Like, so I wanted the crew to, to have the results of all of their effort. And we give away a bicycle and action figures and anything we get our hands on, Lego I, sets. I think it's just because you had run out of space in your office for any more stuff. <laughs> so you always have this particular point of view, don't you, down there? Yeah, maybe a little bit true. I would keep the Plo Koon stuff. Yeah. To be honest, yeah, there's there's the group. Look at that. Say, is this a is this a Big Rock? That is Big Rock Ranch, yeah. 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 What was it like? I mean, you worked. You know, George did not also just work for it, on it for six to eight episodes. He he was very closely involved for a while. And and Killian, what was your experience with that? With working with George and, and working with working with George was. Well, it was kind of like an out-of-body experience sometimes because you would be sitting there going, that's George Lucas and he's saying to do stuff, you know. <laughs> um, but it was, it was really, it was, it was very much like you say. George knew exactly what he wanted to do at all times. That's the thing that struck me was that uh, he is, you know, he seems very easygoing and laid back and he is until he's working and then... He's just on, and the decision making was so fast and so precise. It was it was just very cool to see. I mean, it was it, it, he knew exactly what he was doing at all times, and you just had to execute. No pressure. No, no, no. It's fine. It's fine. It all worked out. We're all here. Yeah. Good job. My favorite were the full color days when we knew that Filoni or when George would come for full color. That's when we review lighting up to the point that we had it before final. And if it was a George day, we would all get there like at least an hour in advance just to make sure, because sometimes he would come extra early and we wanted to make sure that he wasn't waiting for anybody. We just respect him so much. And even if he came early, it's not like he asked us like, can we start now? He really like would take his time and we would find him like reading the newspaper, you know, like in the hallway. And then we'd say, oh, George is here, everybody. And then we're like, we gotta go into the screening room and start the full color, you know? but we're just always being prepared. And I, we always believed in, you know, first one in, last one out when it comes to production. If your, you know, supervisors are coming in and you're part of production, you gotta get there before they do, have everything situated, and then you're the last ones out, like after your supervisors have left. It's always been that kind of, you know, mentality, even to this day. Now we got the show done. See what I mean? Yeah, animation moves on a pretty aggressive tight. schedule, it seems like. Fantastic, yeah. And he was an early riser, George. It was hard to beat him in. And he would stay late. 
He's a hard worker. That's something you learned. And he's not afraid to experiment, move things in the cut editorially. <clears throat> he would sit with us all day, and we'd be in the editorial room working on the story, rewriting the lines like anything. It was amazing, and I think it instilled in all of us a, a really good work ethic and drive. Uh, that's Jason Tucker up there leaning on the rail. He was our editor, uh, head editor for all of uh, the Clone Wars, and just uh, he's the only person I ever saw go cinematically with movie knowledge right toe-to-toe -to -toe with George. He knew everything George was talking about. And another big reason why the show was so amazing uh, was Jason right there, because he was a live-action editor, and so he spoke George's language. And uh, it, that made all the difference early on, because the way we shot Clone Wars was completely different than anything animated at the time. You hear a lot of talk about virtual production now in live action films, but George had us doing virtual production in 2005, <clears throat> which means that if you saw, you know, a bunch of gunships on a, a landing zone and clones running around, you know, he taught us to stage it like we're in a big stage, a sound stage, and move all the pawns and the figures and, you know, simply animate them and get the camera coverage down and how you would cover camera angles. And then you, you would roll the cameras, so you could put like 30 cameras in the scene and roll it. Normally, you'd have storyboard panels, which are static images, pose to pose to pose. This gave you flow, it gave you movement, and it gave the editor uh, a whole bunch of coverage to cut with as you would cut live action footage. And Jason knew how to do that. And, and the way George taught us that, it is the only reason that, that I later was able to make the leap into live action, because I realized that's exactly what George had taught me. So when I got on set with John and Greg Frazier at the time uh, to do Mandalorian, I was like, this is just pre but with real people. And so, you know, it was a, a really kinetic moment for me because I kind of came the other way. And, and George went to animation and I went to live action, but that's, that's all thanks to George, really. Now, Matthew, I want to go back to your battle droids. Yeah. The, oh, by the, the way, that battle droid earlier, amazing. Yeah. I don't know where you are, but it great was work. So good. Uh, funniest characters in Clone Wars, I think, the battle droids, just the one-liners. Yes. Um, so you got to, <laughs> you're like, no, absolutely, yes, they were my lines. I love it. He comes up with some of that stuff, too. He that, just puts it in. The, the, the advantage to doing it, because normally when you do voice acting, uh, it's, you know, you, you do it, and a year later you see it and it's done. But I had the opportunity of working in post-production as well, so I could see how the lines actually fit into the show a, as they are. And luckily for me, the battle droids do not have a moving part when they, move, you know, talk. So at one point I would, I would squirrel some lines in there that I thought were funny, and I was, you know, I didn't, I was kind of testing the waters with Dave, and he was like, okay, you can leave those in there when you play it back for me. And if I laugh at them, keep them in there. Yeah. So I was like, okay. So I, I didn't go over. I mean, some, yes, sometimes we went overboard and those are on the cutting room yes. floor. Yes. <laughs> but but uh, I just loved that idea that we could, we could play like that. And there was a lot of funny moments of just, you know, I guess it's almost improv in a way, which you don't really get to do with animation. So uh, I, I just, yeah, that show just hit so many uh, uh, moments for, for the whole crew, just feeling completely inspired by the, all the different jobs we got to do, and it was, it was just three of us. And, and then coming through Clone Wars, a lot of the people that now, that have come up through that, the ranks, if you say that you worked on Clone Wars at Lucasfilm, it's, it's very much like, or at Skywalker Sound, it's very much like you've been through it, you know how to do a show, you can do it efficiently, and you, and, and you're close-knit with the director, so obviously you're, you're easy to work with. And I, I just i am so proud of all the people that have come through Clone Wars and made it in, into live action and onto really big careers. We have a lot of folks that have come through there, and it's a real badge of honor to, work, to have worked on the show uh, in so many different ways. So it's a, that's another good memory about that, yeah. Aww. Warm and fuzzy feelings all over. And you know, we, we talked about behind the scenes a little, but of course, uh, the show, we love these characters. Part of the reason we love these characters so much is, is because of the people who, who give them voices, the talented voice actors. So 
I think I think we should bring some of them out here, yeah? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> All right, please, please, welcome to the stage, D. Bradley Baker. <laughs> here, taking up space. I love this for us. Gosh, uh, 15 years. How y'all feeling about that? Holy cow, look at that. <laughs> I remember when we started Clone Wars. <laughs> I had darkened hair. Oh my gosh, look. Look at wow. that. Young There's that my fine. child. She's now a grown old person as I, I am. <laughs> <laughs> I love that part of this panel is just like scrapbook time and we're all like, oh, look at that. Remember, remember when... Um, so all of you went on quite the journey with the show, with your characters, and uh, Dee, I'd love to start with you, and, and really, I mean, look what you've done for the clones, sir. Like, just... Can, can you take us back to the beginning and getting that brief, like, you're, you're playing everyone. Ugh. It's amazing to look back and to, to think of, uh, of just the kind of blue sky expectation and just not knowing what this was or what it, where it was going to go, having no idea. And, and, and here we are, how it's fulfilled and, and found so many different stories. And it's, it's, it's so incredible. I'm, I'm just, it just really knocks me out. Yeah, the, the stories have gone on and on. It's been really awesome. Uh, and Ashley. Yeah, <laughs> Ashley, yeah. <laughs> Ashley goes, boom, yeah. <laughs> Y'all, I don't know if, these, if, they, if they have any fun together. I can't <laughs> tell. I don't know. Uh, Ashley, you know, Ahsoka, so many of us have connected with her, and it started with your work, and... We met Ahsoka, such a different character than where she, you know, we all know, right? Ahsoka, well, she was Snips, and it just, I'm going to cry because I love Very, very <laughs> so snippy, <bad>. wasn't she? <laughs> she really was. Yeah. She really was. Um, take us back to your origins with Clone Wars. Oh, my goodness. Um, and, and Dave, I don't even know if you remember this. Uh, maybe you do. But, you know, in the beginning, you wanted Ahsoka to have an Icelandic accent. Oh, I know. Yeah. I and know. I couldn't do it. And so somehow I managed to get a call back. Um, and you told me to practice my Icelandic accent. Yeah. It seemed like a good idea at the time. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I... I did, and I went, I found like the top dialect coach in all of LA, and I studied and studied and studied, and I thought, as I say this in a room full of people, many of whom probably have really good Icelandic accents, um, and <laughs> I thought I mastered it, so I so proudly go to the callback, and I say my first line in Icelandic, and you tell me, you're like, no, can you make it sound more Icelandic? And I was like baffled. And I did something I normally would never do. And I raised my hand and I was like, I'm sorry, I am doing Icelandic. I don't know what you want. And it can, that can happen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I, you know, I heard it and then it's like, nah. <laughs> but I, I mean, look, there's no other way to say it. I liked your voice. <laughs> that was the better one. So um. why do Icelandic? You know. Well, uh, thank you. I I was shocked when I found out I got the part, and I was like, "Do they want me to do Icelandic?" And I it's all a clever up. directing ploy. 
to see what, no, I don't know. I, th I guess I thought I knew what Icelandic was, and it's not that I think <clears throat> you did it poorly. You just beat it with yourself. I mean, there's, it's wonderful. The, like I've always said, it just sounded right to me, and that was the character. You know it when you hear it. There you were. Thank you. Well, I just remember, thank you. I, re I remember showing up the first day of work and they were like, no, Dave was like, just be you, be yourself, use your own voice, bring your own personality to the character. And so it took about, I feel like six months, I feel like until we really found her. But um, I will be forever grateful that you allowed me to just create this character with you. Thank you. Oh, super cool. You were gonna need the tissues, is what's, I feel like this is where this is headed. Everybody's just like, remember when? We all love each other. Um, <laughs> we do. Matt, uh, tell me about. The chosen one! Uh, tell me about your process in, in getting to be a Sky Guy, Anakin. Anakin, we love. Yeah, when I, uh, <laughs> when I uh, went into audition, it was, um, Dave was in the booth, um, Catherine Window was in there. Um, I went in and it was a big secret. They told me it was a, a character, Deke Starkiller. So I tried to do my, my research and I didn't find much. So I went in there and I remember Dave just saying, uh, do whatever, here's a scene, do whatever you think Luke and Han kind of sound like together. And I remember the scene was with R2 and I did it. And that was kind of it. And I think I went home and Within a couple of days, I got a call that, oh, you got a job. And oh, by the way, it's for Anakin Skywalker. And oh, by the way, he's one of the leads on the series. So um, it was uh, pretty quickly then up at Skywalker Ranch. Um, I don't know if a lot of people know this, but I was actually recast. We, we had a, an Anakin previously that had done a couple episodes, I think. He was Icelandic. <laughs> yeah. <The> original. <laughs> and uh, it just didn't Seemed sound like right. like a good idea at the time. <laughs> So yeah, quickly I was up at, up at the ranch um, chatting with George and up there with Dave, uh, just kind of walking me through this, this Anakin and, and how this Anakin was gonna be a little you know, different, I guess, a little more heroic, a little more bravado. We kind of got a chance to develop the character and show him as this hero that we heard about, but we didn't really get to see that the transition from you know, attack to Sith was so quick. And um, I'm just honored that we, that we, to be a part of uh, fleshing out this character even, even more and, and really made him into a hero. That way you guys care about him and we care about him. So when he falls, yeah. Yeah. So when he, when he falls, it's, it's so sad and it's so much more tragic because it's, it's a guy you, you, you don't want to fall. So, yeah. I certainly didn't want him to. Oh. You're my brother! <laughs> no, you know what? I told James that when he says that line in that voice, it makes me have feelings, and you did it. That's why I did it. You used it against me. <laughs> makes me have feelings, too. Here, wait. I, I hate you! You are my brother, Anakin! I loved you! I have the high ground! For you, Amy. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sure anyone who knows me knows I have, I, I really love Clone Wars. It is my Star Wars. So being up here and I just, the tissues are gonna need, they need to happen. Um, thank you for that, James. And James, I mean, Obi-Wan, Plo Koon, I just. Oh, I'm sorry, really quickly though, let's all appreciate this picture. Cause. Oh yeah. Oh man, what a time capsule that one is. Um, that was a very wrinkled shirt. <laughs> <laughs> that was Star Wars Celebration 4. Joel Aaron took those photos. Joel. Aww. Yeah, Joel. Very important person for our show. The Eventually. render, the king, the wizard of photography and lighting. And fire. Yeah. <laughs> fire. And fire, um, snow, whatever we needed, Joel. <laughs> okay, back on track. Sorry, I got distracted. I, I had to. Uh, James, tell us about 
coming to the show and, and finding, you know, this, this Obi-Wan. Right. Well, my journey with uh, Obi-Wan began actually 20 years ago for the micro series of the Clone Wars. So I don't know if you guys know that. But back then, I always joked it took longer to park my car at Cartoon Network and walk than it did to record the lines, because it was always like, that was Anakin. Anakin? Anakin. Okay, James, we're done. And that was it. <laughs> How many ways could you say Anakin, you know? And so then uh, they brought me in for the Revenge of the Sith video game, and it was game. when we were doing the scenes. Might be uh, David Collins, tremendous voice actor and director yeah. and talented composer was directing us in the game, and he said, I've got this scene I gotta show you, and it was like strapped to his wrist with a handcuff, you know, this green screen or blue screen stuff of Ewan McGregor doing the scene. And they said, can you match this? Because it was the game had to match it. And it was at that point that they kind of went, okay, I think we got, because I was able to find those, he's got that wonderful texture, you know, to his voice when he, come to your senses, what would Padme do if she was in your position? You know, he's got that way of doing those things, right? He's over in the other space. Okay, bigger, bigger, better Obi-Wan over there, but uh, you can, uh, but no, uh, no, come on, I'm kidding. Thank you, thank you, thank you, that's very kind. Thank you. But, so it was just a, it was a great honor, and it is a great honor, and then getting to meet Dave, and get to work, and Henry Gilroy, and all of them, it came in, and so I was just very blessed to be able to be a part of all of it. And then uh, Plo Koon, uh, just one of my absolute favorite characters, too. Dave said one word, he said Gandalf, and we thought, oh yes, Gandalf, yes. <laughs> so you see that actually it's Matthew Wood is part of Plo Koon as well, because I do it like this, Ahsoka, little Ahsoka, yes, got who you are. And then he takes it and pitches it down yeah. and puts it through a processor and makes it Kotoya, yes. But didn't we like, I started watching the second season yeah. and I was listening and I'm just a mimic. I just, whatever I hear, I repeat. And so I heard Plo lower. We got it, an endless loop of going low because you kept doing it as low as we bet it, we'd make it lower, then you'd do it lower. <laughs> and then I'd have, I, when do I stop processing this? We're going to be down like, oh, oh, yeah. you know, like humpback whales are going to start beaching themselves. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know how to follow that. I don't know. I don't know. Um, Y'all are trouble is what I know. Uh, Dee, and something I, I always loved anytime I've talked to you all is hearing about, you know, you recorded together uh, and that does not always happen and... Dee, what was your experience over the years recording with, because now I'm wondering how you got anything done. It was the last half an hour of a four-hour session is where we got things done. <laughs> we, we had a lot of fun together, and, and it was such a, an enjoyable experience to, to read through the entire play uh, of the story of an episode, which is how we used to record it. Um, we, we essentially, you take it scene by scene, and you'll redo the scene a couple of times before you get all the details right before you move on, but you're essentially reading the entire story with the ensemble there, which is, for an actor, that's the most satisfying way to do it. Uh, and of course, now things are recorded piecemeal since COVID and with the way technology is, but, um, but, but what an ensemble, what, a, what an amazing group, uh, even, even for characters that weren't there all the time, you know, with, uh, with Ian, who was there, and um, a lot of other really interesting guest stars, uh, but to do it in studio uh, was, was, was really very special, a wonderful experience. Yeah, I, I think I can imagine you getting the job done, of course, but that you all had. It was a, a bonding thing, and I'm sure it only strengthened your performances and the relationships between all of your characters. <laughs> Yeah. Oh no, what, what were you going to say? Oh, you got to tell the, I know where you're going, right? You got to tell the story about what? when you oh, first no. met. When you guys oh, met. Oh my gosh. Well, Dave, I don't know if you remember this. Oh no. So. It could be any number of things <laughs> and I'm worried about it. No, this isn't bad. This isn't bad. But for the first like six months before Matt was cast, you kept telling me, just so you know, fans are going to wonder if there's something going on between Ahsoka and Anakin and there's nothing going on there. And, um, and so when Matt came in, it was his first day My worry is increasing. Yeah. What? 
my worry is increasing. You've done nothing Not to mic. stop my worry. Continue. Let's see where this goes. So, so Matt comes in. And I'm like, we say hi, nice to meet you. I'm not sure if you said hi, nice to meet you. Oh. <laughs> I think you might have just said, Ahsoka and Anakin are nothing, they're very platonic, they're just friends, nothing's gonna happen. I was like, just so you know, there's nothing going on here. <laughs> and then I think I, I think I said, okay, I'm Matt. <laughs> well, you had to set the, like, you did the record straight just from the beginning. Yeah, but you know, we all, are very much like our characters. I mean, truly, uh, you know, Matt and I are truly like Sky Guy and Snips. And Dee and James, I mean, they were just veterans in the voiceover world. And so, you know, if like, if I go up to Dee and, you know, say, uh, um, so if you're a captain and I'm a Jedi, then technically I outrank you, right? Well, in my book, experience outranks everything. I'm done. Bye. So we're we're all really close because Matt and I learned a lot from Dean James and everyone else on the cast. We pay them to say that. Well, and I do want to point out, of course, we have uh, some key members of cast too, who, can't, who aren't here in London, and, uh, including, of course, Kat Tabor's Padme and Tom yes. Kane's Yoda. Yes. It just, again, what a treat to see more of those characters and to have richer stories and to see more of Padme and Anakin. Yeah. Uh, what was it like developing you know, their relationship working with Kat? Yeah, I mean, that was a lot of fun. One of my favorites is with, with Clovis. There's a Clovis out there today, by the way, uh, which was really great. The photo op was really fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, 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 uh, Kat's amazing. Um, always has been. And uh, yeah, it, it, was, it was a pleasure for sure. Nice. And I also um, really want to remember, and I would love a round of applause for Ian Ab Amber <laughs> Amber Crombie, our wonderful, wonderful emperor. I mean, oh not usually a, a, a wonderful Ian. emperor. It was worth it in the lobby. Every time we were waiting to get in for the studio, Ian would be out there and he would be telling us stories. You remember, he always had colorful socks and he would tell his stories, but, and he would say those were his Seinfeld socks. I don't know if you all know him from Seinfeld, as Mr. Pitt. And he loved acting, he loved performing, and he loved being a part of all this. He was just such a joy to be around. And he, it, it's oh. really interesting to be around somebody who's so good that it just becomes effortless what they do. And it's, 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 it's almost frightening to see this, this gentle, sweet man suddenly switch into Palpatine. It, it, it was a remarkable thing to see uh, an actor of that caliber do his thing. Yeah. Really, really wonderful. One of my favorite things about him was that uh, <clears throat> he would always wonder how evil to go. Yeah. And he would have read the whole script and be very prepared. And then I would be there early and sit down with him and we would go over it all. And for me, you know, George really insisted that I... A lot of times there's a voice director. It's different than the director of the animation, but George insisted that I be the person directing the actors. He wanted me to learn that skill. George insisted that the thing was done ensemble, so I would learn to deal with multiple people at one time. And you can see, it is something to deal with these multiple people at one time. And <laughs> it's like throwing super balls in a room with a bunch of cats. But you learn certain skills, but definitely from, you know, Ian, you know, he, he was, like you said, so veteran, I think he really took my interest in directing and, and fostered it and was teaching me better ways to communicate with actors, which is, a, which is a key skill. And every actor needs kind of a different method of input. But in all honesty, on Clone Wars, it's very spoiled because you guys are all so talented. I learned so much from getting to direct you. I felt I only needed to guide you uh, through the galaxy and you would all heroically get there and uh, just to be clear, I mean, for everybody up here, it's hard for me because I fully recognize everything I'm doing now 
at Lucasfilm and Star Wars, it's based on the bedrock of so many people, and these are just some of them. And I, I, I so appreciate all of you and your skills and talents, and uh, I take you with me on every project I'm ever on. It, it, you're so meaningful to me, and I'm so grateful uh, for your hard work and what you've given to Star Wars and myself. So thank you guys so much. <laughs> Well, we wouldn't be here without Dave Filoni. We wouldn't have Lucasfilm Animation without Dave Filoni. So we thank you for everything. You're going to get me all emo now, and I'm going to not get emo, but <laughs> thank you for everything. <laughs> yes. We you know, just to, uh, to cheer things up a little, Dave, um, I'd love to go back to the recording room with all of you, and I don't, you know, it's it's been a minute, we're talking 15 years, so I, but I am going to ask you to dig back and, and share some of your favorite moments, either in the recording room or even since. I know you all do a lot of conventions together, and it's like, it's, it's like we still get Clone Wars in a way, and I love it. Yeah, like Matt was asked that earlier on the live stage, like what was it like getting back into the skin of Anakin or Obi-Wan? And as Matt said, I'm taking your, your answer. Yeah, sure, go um, ahead. <laughs> because we're family, we really are, and we still see each other all the time, which is fantastic. And there's always been, you know, Lego projects or games or other things um, that we've been able to be involved. So we've never really left the characters, and they're always with us. And I think that that's the beautiful part about it. And, we, and so we still get to do the fun voices every once in a while. <laughs> and say hello there. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, it's something that I, I, I feel like I never put down. You know, Anakin's a part of me. I've, we've been doing it now for 17 years ago, I think, when we started. Or, yeah. you know. And so um, like I, it, I had Star Wars at my wedding. These guys were at my wedding. Like, it's just, it's a part of me. And I, I don't think that, it's, that I'll ever, you know, feel like I'm not a part of Star Wars anymore. And, and, and a lot of that also is because of you guys and the acceptance and the love that you've given us into the Star Wars you know, universe, um, and, and that's, um, thank you for that. And you know, something I'd love to know, um, Killian and Matt, is if, you know, as the years went on and you worked with them closely, how did that, how did their work, bringing those characters to life, inform each of your, you know, roles with with the art and the sound going forward. And Killian, let's start with you. Um, well, I do know that when it came to season seven of Clone Wars and we knew that we were gonna finally sort of make Bad Batch, um, just after hearing, yeah. <laughs> um, Boom. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think after sort of hearing D for so long, I actually sort of felt we should change the Bad Batch faces to look more like it. Because originally the designs for each member of Bad Batch were quite pushed and Hunter looked, you know, remarkably different to Crosshair. And there was a point where they began to not really resemble Rex anymore. And I felt that there should be some of Rex in every Bad Batch member's face it's because D's voice is so much that character now that I just heard his voice all the time whenever I was looking at any member of Bad Batch and thought we should capture a little bit more of, of what Rex is and I think it works really well. I think you sort of believe that they are unique but they're still part of you know the, the sort of Django DNA and I think for me now I just sort of hear Dee's voice. They are different anytime. but they are similar. <laughs> That's awesome. How about, how about you, Matt? Gosh, like, I think uh, when we got to the, the scene where uh, the, the confrontation uh, between Ahsoka and Anakin and, uh, and the, the cracked mask scene, which was so uh, pivotal, that was always just such a, a moment where w the culmination of everything was happening at once. We had this beautiful design of the shots. We're all in widescreen. It's got a full orchestral score going on and world-class voice actors going and all that. And it, it felt like these arcs that we were doing were like miniature movies and we treated them as such. 
and to come from something that we had to, at the beginning, we couldn't, we, there was, how many years went by that we couldn't even talk about that it existed? It was so long, yeah, it was like three years of just not even being able to talk about what we were working on, and we got to this, this culmination of making these miniature movies with a world-class cast, and, uh, and it was just such an incredible place to be, and to be here now, to think about that now, and all these people here that love it, and we came from this small little thing at Skywalker Ranch. It's just, it's such a beautiful moment to be here up on stage with everybody, but yeah, that, that definitely informed uh, the, the sound and how we went forward and, and, um, and to contribute to this thing that's, you know, 50% of the experience of sound is what George likes to say and Kevin Kiner's music, which we have to mention that. <laughs> Incredible work by Kevin and he just kept bringing it every week, every week and the themes that he, he, he kicked in there and he's so enthusiastic for the show, such a, an amazing part of the show that everything just clicked that way and it was, um, yeah, every week was like working on miniature Miniature movies. I mean, they were movies. I mean, they're incredible. Yeah. Yeah, and it's wild. This is, you know, really the final Star Wars thing that George Lucas worked direct, like so directly on. Yep. Which, and you, you were all a part of that. Yeah. That's. Yeah, that was cool. <laughs> but that, that happened. It did. It did. George, uh, you know, he created it. So yeah. That's cool. That was cool. I'm glad to have some thoughts did that? about that. George is the best. Remember when we did that, right? It was, it was, it was cool. It was cool. Yeah, it was all right. He still gives me notes. <laughs> <laughs> and it never ends. No, he's good. He's good. You know, and I would um, like to talk about we're here today for Clone Wars and we have all these memories and it still, you know, has left such a legacy behind. Um, the show has informed, you know, quite a bit of what you're doing in live action. And that's, that's also wild. Yes. <laughs> and, yeah. 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 <laughs> Can you of talk course. about? Uh, of you course. Know. Yeah. I mean, I like these characters, so I've been, you know, with them in my mind. I see them all the time. I'm working on the story all the time, and they're just my favorite. I mean, it's weird in Star Wars to say your favorite characters are ones you've been a part of creating, but they are. And you know, uh, as I learned from George, I wanted to get into some new challenges and do different things. Once I you know, had the opportunity to uh, finish the Clone Wars, which thanks to Carrie Beck, you know, I really got to do that. So you all got to thank uh, her. Uh, she produces yeah. Carrie Beck. with us along with Athena. And it was her idea for us to, to go back and do uh, a final series. That, that last season of Clone Wars really benefited actually from my experience working with John Favreau on uh, Mandalorian season one because I finally, like I said in the beginning, was able to put the, all the math and teachings together that, that George had taught me in, into the real practical sets and, and how it worked. So when I went to do the final season, especially the last four episodes on Mandalore, I understood what the job was to do there. And it had always been, you know, my dream to interweave it with uh, Revenge of the Sith, and, and to be delicate about, you never want to influence or change anything in those movies, but to use them as a place to show you where in time these characters actually were, which was so vital, and by doing that, you know, Link, the two, so you understood these characters always were there, and uh, yeah, it's probably my favorite thing that we ever got to do, uh, and I love that, that ending series, and just, you know, just to work with you guys again, so, I mean, and as that goes, and of course, I've done other stuff with it now in live action, and, you know, and it's beautiful, and I'm excited about what we're doing. But I kept watching Bad Batch, because I'm still involved with that. And Brad and Jen do a great job with Bad Batch, and now I teach them like George taught me, and so I understand how difficult I must have been. And George is very patient with me now, I understand that. And, but they've done a wonderful job, and they've made a wonderful show. And... Um, I love it, and it looks amazing. I'm like, well, I, w I wish season one of Clone Wars looked like this. So, but it, you know, it was a long time ago, a long, long time ago, evidently, according to you. And, um, but I, it made me think, wow, this, I would like to play with that animation that we're doing now. And so on the airplane, when I would travel back and forth to uh, 
do the shoot on Mandalorian, I would write short stories uh, that were like little fables that I thought, well, this would be cool. This will explain why she's capable of battling off all these clones when other Jedi weren't able to. And, and that, that would make sense to me. Because I could understand where people are like, how could she battle all of that off and, and Plo Koon couldn't? Because, of course, Plo Koon could have done it. what? Jake. If he wasn't in that fighter, he would have been fine. But Well, I think... <laughs> that's if, my story, if, and I'm sticking to it. If Obi-Wan can cut Darth Maul and happen, he can survive. Plo Koon can survive Order of I've made that case. I've made that case to George. I've made that case to him directly and got a no. But anyway... Um, <laughs> But anyway, uh, so I started writing these little stories, and uh, I especially liked one, after I wrote that one, uh, Practice Makes Perfect, I wrote the story about Ahsoka and her mom, and uh, that was particularly uh, kind of special to me, and so I, of course I show it to you and Carrie Beck, and <laughs> Carrie says what, what she always does, she says, would you like to make these? And I'm like, hmm, <laughs> last time I did it, I ended up having to make a whole animated season. Um, <laughs> yes? And then she disappears and she comes back and she finds the money with you. And then we had to make a whole season of Tales of the Jedi. Um, and apart from them just being fun little, you know, fables that I just wanted to, you know, I was always curious about Dooku, so I wrote what I thought was my version of things and, and kept it simple. I'll be honest, like, I just... I really just wanted to hang out with everyone, so I made sure these characters were involved so we would get to be in a session because my life is so scheduled now, but it, it made you all have to show up. <laughs> and that was awesome. Even though like Obi-Wan was only in the one for a short time, I made sure you were in there because I wanted to see how you were doing, and we made an animation, right? Can, can I... I don't know if you remember this. Uh oh! You start everything <laughs> off that way. It always goes great, though. It's this, fine. It's this fine. is my Very theme twisty. of the panel. But I just, I just want to say, seriously, in the beginning, the number one question the fans would ask me is, "How is Ahsoka going to die?" Because she has to die before Episode Three. And you always told me that. Well, no, actually, no, you didn't. This is why I'm wondering if you remember. Yeah. But I would always say, "Well, does she?" Does she have to die? And you would always tell me theories of how Ahsoka would die. And I remember, <laughs> seriously, I kid you not, it's like after the first season. Pretty funny. And <laughs> it's after the first season, and he's like, hey, hey, come here. So let me tell you, I came up with the storyline of how Ahsoka dies. And he tells me, and I'm was like. At the time it was Darth Vader, because that one was really cool. Well, not. I mean, you gotta admit, that, that would have been gripping but, television. D <laughs> Do you remember, actually, that one time... No, I don't know this one. It was... Probably not worth sharing. It was... <laughs> well, I can share it because it didn't happen, but it was... Is that true? It was Ventress. At oh, one Ventress. Point, That's a good one, you too. You had Ventress. Oh. oh, I do remember that. Yes. 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 You had Very Ventress good. Very good. Very good, one. Yes. And it, I had to deal with this, the emotional turmoil of hearing... But it really like, got you someplace in the scene. You know, it really got you there. It, well, you did, but at some point the tide turned and no one asked me how Ahsoka was going to die. They all said, Ahsoka lives, right? Ahsoka lives, right? Yeah, people started to get worried. They did, they started that to get That was interesting. Worried. And then at some point you stopped sharing theories of how Ahsoka died and I was like, yes, Dave is going to make her live. And then he started talking about Satine. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, that one didn't work out so well. That was a surprise that day. James, it was never going to work out, I hate to tell you. In my head, it Not did, Not like you though. wanted it to. I would have shaved my beard. In my head, Obi-Wan and Satine are living so many, so many happy, happily ever afters in my head, but it's not star happily ever after. Star Wars, so I accept it. I don't like it. Yeah. You do that a lot. Yeah, that yeah. was tough. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> One day I look back at it, and I'm like, what was wrong with us? That doesn't matter. One day you're, you're rolling in flowers on Naboo, the next day... It can, anything can know. happen. You, you got a little know. possessive, Matt. 
That's not a good thing. That's an attachment. Yeah. Oh boy, oh You boy. let your yeah. fear overcome you. Attachments are for Jedi. Well, look at that second. I'm record. no Jedi. Oh. Well, I have a bad feeling about this. It's all going downhill. I, I, I do. I have a bad feeling, too, because I, I have to be the one who gets us out of here. So. Yeah, because we're over time. Oh, this is yep. where the fun no, begins. No. Oh. Oh. Oh, I, I actually could do this all they day. They can do this all day. Yeah, trust I, me. I, I've seen I, I'm it. I'm on board. This is how we went over thing. budget a couple times. Ask her. But... <laughs> we. You too. You as well. You do have something you can share. I do, yeah. You usually I mean, don't get to do that, but... Well, Tales of the Day was so fun the first time, I decided to do some more. <laughs> but there are more. Yes, there are more. <laughs> so, that'll be fun, and... Because what's, what's become apparent to me is like there's a very important thing the Jedi have to do. It's they have to pass on what they've learned. And so though I've gotten progressively busy in other aspects, I do take time to, to teach all of my uh, youngs and Padawans the animation. So I'm, I'm using the Tales of the Jedi and I'm telling some stories and I'm giving some people there an opportunity to uh, step up and, and direct, step up and write step up and try to learn the ways of the force as George taught me is now I hopefully will teach them so Lucasfilm Animation will be strong for years and years to come and that's what we're gonna do. Yes, because we want to keep getting more stories. We want to keep having 15th anniversaries of shows we love. So please give it up for our incredible, incredible panelists. Thank you all for coming. Thank you all. And I hope you have an amazing rest of celebration. Thank you. Lucasfilm Publishing is about to unveil what's to come in the remainder of Phase 2 of Star Wars The High Republic, as well as a sneak preview of what's to come in Phase 3. The High Republic panel starts right now. you guys I'm so excited we got to stop meeting like this just kidding we should do it all the time how are you guys doing thank you so much for being here you're not gonna regret it hello celebration and welcome to the high republic panel and welcome to everyone watching the live stream at home <laughs> I'm Christine Ariel and I'm the host of Star Wars the high republic show and I will be your host for the next hour, where we will discuss all things related to the High Republic. We've got lots and lots of news and reveals. And, of course, my favorite, we got some exclusives. So let's get started. First and foremost, let's welcome to the stage our luminous authors. Give it up for Claudia Gray, Lydia King, George Mann, Daniel Jose Older, Kevin Scott, Charles Soule, and from Lucasfilm. We have SVP of the Franchise Story Team, James Wong, and Publishing Creative Director, Michael Sinclair. so good to see you all. Now, panelists, if you would say hello, greet your adoring fan base. Hello, hey, London. Hey. Yes, yeah. incredible. Look at this audience. The light of life. 
Now, James, let's start with you. Ooh, what was that one? I like it. <laughs> now, James, let's start with you. From a franchise perspective, why is the higher public so important? Why is it so important? I, I can give you the franchise answer, but I mean, look at this. This is why. Yeah. No, I'm serious. I, we, this was a bold initiative. This initiative really was a big experiment to start. And the fact that there's this much fandom, that there's this much cosplay roaming around the halls, that's why it's important. You all have given us the, the sort of license to be able to say, let's do more. Uh, this is a space that people want us to invest in. From the franchise perspective, I would, uh, you know, this is a bold new era. It's an era of exploration. It's an era where we actually get to see the Jedi at the height. You've heard us all say that so many times, but there are so many stories that have yet to be told, yet to be defined. Um, and that's really uh, what this is about, and there's so many more to go. Now, there's a lot going on in the High Republic, but before we dig into the publishing side of things, we have to talk about animation. Oh, yeah. Woo! Yeah. Woo! Look at that. Now, since we last met, oh, we got Nubs <laughs> back nubs in the house. Cheer? That's a Nubs cheer. I love that Nubs already has like a whole fandom behind it. I want to see Nubs Claus play next year. I literally walked over to the kids' area just to get a picture with the picture of Nubs. <laughs> now, since we last met, the era of the High Republic has expanded into an animated series for kids. Now, James, what can you tell us about Young Jedi Adventures and Nubs? <laughs> well, I, I think you, you could hear me ramble about this, but I think it might even be better just to make sure that everybody knows at 3 o'clock in this room, we're going to be screening the first two episodes uh, of Young Jedi Adventures. I think it's a show that a lot of people, a lot of really passionate people put a lot of love and care into. Um, and I think one of the things that's been most fun is it's a show that takes place in the High Republic. And it's, a, it's, a, it's reflective of that era. You're going to see vectors. You're going to see kids in these costumes. You're going to see characters you might know. Um, so it's been an exciting palette, and what a fantastic time uh, to, uh, what a fantastic era to tell a story about Jedis in the making. And now there are books based on the animated series, which is based on books, and that's very meta. <laughs> it is. Uh, <laughs> these are just some of our launch titles for Young Jedi. We have little golden books, we have readers, we have picture books, and this is really the, uh, the tip of the iceberg for us. Uh, so there'll be a lot more Young Jedi content to come, so stay tuned. Uh, I will say that we watched the three shorts, me and my son, and he goes, Mom, can we watch Nubs again? Can we watch Nubs again? And so we are a Nubs household all the way through now. Well, the, yes. The, the other great thing about Nubs is it's played by D. Brad, he's played by D. Bat Bradley Baker, <laughs> who's just incredible. He, there's nothing he can't do. All right, now let's talk about phase two titles. Claudia, Charles, and George. You each have comics that focus on specific Jedi. Charles, talk to us about Porter and Barash. So, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so, uh, Porter Engel and his sister, Barash Sylvain, appear in a comic book in phase two called The Blade. Um, I hope some of you have checked it out. It's, it's one of my favorite things I've written. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's one of my favorite things, too. I really loved it. Uh, the, the story of that is you have Porter Angle, who we met in phase one of the High Republic. He's a, he's a, a lightsaber badass. I, I said it. He is. Uh, he's, a, he's a saber he's slinger. Um, and in the phase two, when he's much younger, he goes around the galaxy with his sister, Barash. Uh, she is very forced focused and is very sensitive. And so she kind of like susses out what to do. And Porter then goes and, you know, handles it with his lightsaber, basically. And in the story in the blade, they go on an adventure that has kind of a, it's kind of a tragedy. Uh, and then they sort of are left in a very different place than they began. But the thing that I really loved about writing Barash and Porter is that they, they are brother and sister, but they are brother and sister in a found family way as opposed to like a, a biological way. And I thought that that was such a powerful part of Star Wars that I was really happy to be able to bring into a story that I wrote. And can you tell us what's next for them? Well, uh, so at the, I'm going to spoil a little bit of, of the end of the blade if you haven't read it, but Barash takes what's called the, Bar what becomes known as the Barash vow. So she goes off and she's kind of doing her thing uh, in the galaxy, so we'll have to see if or when she pops up again. And Porter, poor Porter, is bereft. Uh, he's kind of 
on his own. He's a, he's a wandering, you know, saber master. Uh, but as we saw at the end of, of The Blade, we talked about another story called The Broken Blade, which we'll have to see when, when we'll, we'll tell that story. So stay tuned. Like the story of a broken man? The Broken Blade. It's like a blade, but broken. I know, but he's the blade, so he'd be like a bro. Yeah, he's, it's rough. It's real rough for him. Don't make me cry. <laughs> well, maybe skip that next one then. <laughs> now, Claudia, can you tell us about Barnabas Vince? No. <laughs> Laryngitis. Oh, no. Yes. We will defer down to Siglade. Yeah, no, unfortunately, uh, Claudia has laryngitis. Um, but she still wanted to be here, so thank you for being here. <clears throat> I will be a, uh, a poor substitution for the moment. Uh, Quest of the Jedi is a one-shot coming out from Dark Horse Comics that focuses on legendary Jedi Knight Barnabas Vim, who, uh, let's see, what's the best way to describe him? He is concerned with the more mystical side of the Force. Um, and I'm going to leave it at that. So it sounds like a very standalone adventure. Uh, yes and no. It is, it is very much a standalone adventure if you want just a, a cool Jedi story. Uh, however, as with everything in the High Republic, everything is connected. So I would pay attention to this one. Oh. And I do, Claudia. Is that good? Do you approve? I get a thumbs up. Now, George, this is our first time getting to do this in person, and I'm so excited to see you. So exciting. <laughs> you. Oh, yeah, give it up for George Mann at our first panel. Now, George, you get to write a Padawan, a master, and a council member in the Nameless Terror, but I get a sense that not everyone is going, I get a sense that not everyone is going to make it out alive. Can you tell us about it? Well, would it really be a High Republic story if everyone made out alive? No. I mean, um, so it's a four-part comics uh, story following a Pathfinder team. Um, poor old Rock Burren. Anyone who's read um, Quest for the Hidden City will know Rock's been through a really hard time recently. You could say between a rock and a hard place. Um, and um, <laughs> these Pathfinders have crash-landed on a, a planet after colliding with a ship that's being flown by the path of the open hand. Um, but there's something on the planet. Um, and as you can see from the, the cover, I think that's the cover of issue four that's up there, there's nameless eggs on the ship. And um, what do eggs have a habit of doing? Hatching. So um, they're in for a pretty tough time. Look <laughs> at that face. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you all for bringing me into the most sad era of Star Wars. My poor heart can't take it, but it can, so let's keep going. Michael, can you tell us about the next novel release? Sure. So this is a, this is a big week for us, but uh, before I, I get into the, the novels, I just want to say there's a couple folks who aren't here today who deserve a round of applause, and that is Zoraida Cordova, Tessa Groton, and Justina Ireland. Um, unfortunately, they could not be here uh, today. They are with us in spirit. Um, <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, they're, they're back in the States at the moment, so uh, hopefully we'll get them to the next show. Um, but yeah, this is a really big week for us for High Republic. We had uh, Tessa's middle grade novel, Quest for Planet X, come out. Um, and we also had uh, Lydia's novel, Cataclysm, come out. And, you know, the, the cool thing about these two books is that they are both direct sequels to the novels that came before them, but just like the High Republic, everything is connected, so they do connect to the, to the larger initiative. And that was something that was a little different that uh, we did in phase two. It was, in a way, a little bit of a smaller phase um, in that everything was a bit more standalone. The middle grades were a little more standalone, the adult titles were a little more standalone, um, but still equally thrilling. And I think if, you, if you've read George's and Tess's and any of them's really, you'll see that uh, it still packs quite a punch. Now, Lydia, you pull together a lot of threads for Cataclysm without giving away any spoilers, because I talked to someone who was legit reading it on the train. <laughs> what can you tell us, or what do you want fans to know about Cataclysm? Um, well, first of all, I just want to say um, Star Wars Celebration is maybe the best book release party I could have ever had. So, 
thank you guys so much. Like, it's been amazing. Um, yeah, writing Cataclysm has been amazing. There have just been so many different threads and just fantastic characters that have been woven together. And I can't say too much, but you know, Axel's there and he's gonna cause you some strife. <laughs> Love the Axel stands. And Gela and Master Yaddle. So get ready for a ride. And for the people who keep asking me whether or not they're gonna feel some deep emotions when they read Cataclysm, <laughs> The title's Cataclysm. <laughs> That's all I have to say. So read the book. Thank you guys so much. Uh, Lydia, I don't know if you know this, and I don't know if they made it in here, but there is a Gela here. <gasps> oh my God, come find me later. I need to see you. Yeah. We, will, we will find you, Gela. For light and life, we will find you. <laughs> now, Kevin, you've got Path of Vengeance coming out in, what, just about a month? Uh -huh. What can you tell us about it? So, Path of Vengeance, I mean, that's not an ominous title in any way whatsoever. I don't know why they gave it to me. Um, it basically tells the story of three young women. There's Yana Ro, <laughs> Marda Ro, <laughs> and a young Padawan called Matty. <laughs> and it's obviously Marda and Yana's story, but this is really the story we've been leading to with Matty. This is Matty's book. Um, as she and another Jedi from Dona have to go and explore what's going on with the mother. Um, and it's an, it, it's going to, indeed it will be. Um, in, it's going to be a road, all roads lead to Dana. It's going to be a road that's going to change all of them. Daniel? Yes. Oh, Daniel. Everybody give it up for the bad boy. <laughs> You have the last title of this phase with the manga Edge of Balance precedent. Look at that cover. That's a Wookiee right there. That's a Wookiee. Oh, what can you tell us about this? Man, where to begin? Uh, precedent was so much fun to write. Tomi Ogata is amazing. The art is incredible. This story is much more connected to the larger narrative of the High Republic than the previous two mangas in ways that I cannot say because Mike will shoot me. But. Um, trust me that it is an amazing story. We go really deep. Uh, we get into, I think we get to, so, can we show some art? Yeah, yeah we can show some art. Let's look at some of those interior of pages. Yes. So there we have a Wookiee Arkoff. Arkoff, when he was younger, when he was, uh, you know, at the prime of his Jedi knighthood, and we get to see him in action. That is the Battle of Dalna that we get to see. And we also get to meet someone really cool who's very close to him. Um, this amazing character named Master Ravna, who is Arkov's master, and she's a little old lady. And she will destroy you. <laughs> she is the toughest little old lady you will ever meet. <clears throat> so I'm excited for y'all to meet her, and I, I think we have one more image we could show from this book. Let's see. Should we show one more? One more. I, I think we should. Okay. Oh, we've got, yeah, we've got one more to show, but without any Context. I don't think we have to tell them what I don't think means. we have to talk about it at all. I think we could just show this and... Too much? <laughs> oh, not enough. Oh, my God. Not enough. You'll be all right. Uh, I will say, uh, if I may jump in, you're not ready for this one. Uh, Daniel uh, and uh, Tomio have done an incredible job. Uh, this directly connects to the Battle of Dalna. It also connects to phase one uh, at the very start and potentially at the very end. So uh, don't miss this one. Hey, look at me. Not cool. <laughs> I'm just doing my job. I like your job. I like it, all right. So as phase two comes to an end, do you have anything else that you want to add? Dan, you want to talk about uh, High Republic Adventures? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, there is a lot of excitement coming up for High Republic Adventures. It also ties very deeply into one of my favorite audiobooks of all time, The Battle of Jeddah. I mean, like, scene by scene deeply. Keep an eye out for that. Um, but to find out more about it and see some really, really cool art, come to the Dark Horse panel tomorrow where we'll be doing some more reveals. But there's a lot in store for Sav and the crew. And, sorry, one more thing. Therm Scissor Punch. And George, I don't know if you want to 
quickly speak to uh, Tales of Enlightenment. Yeah, so um, it's obviously, if anyone's been following the series, it's, just, it's following the regulars of the Bar Enlightenment um, during the Battle of Jeddah. So we started before the battle, we follow through the battle, we see how the battle impacts those guys. Me and Cav work pretty hard to make sure there's an interesting crossover between what's going on with his characters and the characters in the bar. So you're going to see that coming up as well. Um, and recently turned in the, the final story, which is called Last Orders, to give you a, a bit of a tease there. Uh, Michael, can you click to that next one for me? Do you want me to go to the next one? Yeah. Sure. Uh, okay. Why do you do this to me? Go to the next one. I want to just get it over. Oh. There's something in the eyes there, or a couple of people, kind of a family affair. No! Look at the eyeballs! <laughs> <laughs> so that's not intimidating. But no, hang on, Olivia, no. something happened to... No, hang on, no. No, no. I have a question from the audience. First of all, how dare you? But to everyone on the stage, what do you have to say for yourselves? <laughs> we know We're what sorry? we did. I guess because it is the night of sorrow. We're just sorry. We're so sorry. <laughs> you know what? We need a palate cleanser. Ooh, so let's talk about what everyone's been working on. Tales of Light and Life. Hey. Yes. Hey. Michael, yeah. what can you tell us about this title? Uh, I'm really, really excited about this title. This is uh, a title that covers every phase. Um, there's stories set before phase one, after phase one. Um, it really is a, a, it's an incredible title because it, it covers so much and it's such a, a, a big title and the initiative honestly has grown so large that, you know, we had to bring another author in and I'm really thrilled that our family is growing uh, and it is growing with this title. And our family has grown so much that we decided to bring our, the rest of them in. And they're here right now. Give it up. Let me introduce our 10th luminous author, Alyssa Wong. Welcome to the High Republic. Oh my God. <laughs> Alyssa, what's it been like to join the crew? Was it intimidating at all? Uh, yeah, it was wild. It was so cool. I mean, I was just so, I was so excited and so honored that you guys were down to have me aboard for this crazy ride. We're lucky to have you. Now, let's talk more about Tales of Light and Life. In fact, Let's reveal what everyone is writing for this one. Sure. All right, I want to know which characters you're all writing and when your stories are set. Mike, start the clock on the slides and go. All right, so uh, since Zoraida cannot be here, I will speak on her behalf. Uh, she's writing the Queen's Bloom, which is a story set pre-phase one and is focused on Axel Greylark. And the mother. Ooh. <laughs> Love this crowd. Isn't this, isn't this wild? Yeah. Uh, London's the best, I'm telling you. You wouldn't say that. For the second story, since Tessa, unfortunately, is not here, I can say that Tessa is writing A Closed Fist Has No Claws. And that focuses on Marta but I cannot tell you when it takes place. But it's really good, like really good. Because I wouldn't let him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and this time you won't let me say something. All right, George, can you tell us about the book you're writing or the title you're writing? Yeah, I, um, I guess the title, Shield of the Jedi, might give something away there. Um, but, <laughs> but yeah, Salandra's show is back, um, along with Rupa Natani. Um, <laughs> 
we're several years after the end of phase two and Rupa is going through her Jedi trials. Hi, Daniel. Hi. What, don't look at me like that. I'm super nice. I know you're super nice. We've right. been friends for a long time. This is a really Tell me about your story. Okay. <laughs> Two words. Ramalama Jomarama. Yes. <laughs> but also, this is, a, this is a really sweet story about his friendship with Zine. And, and um, it takes place right in the middle of phase one. Michael, can you... One day after the fall of Starlight, <laughs> Effie, the arts, she owed. Whoa! <clears throat> that was worth. <laughs> was worth. <laughs> I'll uh, I'll go one better on that though. Um, yes, it's Effie. It's the arts. It's owed. It is uh, one day after the fall of Starlight one week after the fall of Starlight, and one month after the fall of Starlight. Ooh. Why don't you just keep telling us about Justina's time? Sure, why not? I'm already talking. Uh, so Justina, the Force provides. Justina is writing an emotional story about uh, Jedi Knight Vernestra Rowe. Yes. And it is Vernestra dealing with the aftermath of the fall of the Starlight Beacon. But there might be some cool lightsaber whip action. And that's all I can say about that one. Charles Soule Esquire? That's me. Hey, let's go. Uh, so All Jedi Walk Their Own Path is actually two stories because that's, I just can't stop writing stories. Um, the first story is set just before phase one and it features Belzetafar. <laughs> but not just Belzetafar, it also features Loden Greatstorm because, because I miss, I miss Loden very much. I miss those two characters very much and I really wanted to tell another story with them. So you got that. But the second story is set right after phase three and it's Bell, look. No, no, not, not after phase three. No, no. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Jeez, right before Don't phase blow three. The ending. Right before phase three. It's right after phase That's one. Better. And it's Bell, uh, who is very distraught about a fallen comrade, not Loden, a different one, Buriaga. So why did you say that? And, and he, he wants to find him. He wants to know what happened to him, thought, just like you guys all do. I thought he didn't survive the fall of Starlight. Well, he doesn't, he doesn't know. Bell needs to know in his heart. I see. Because there was another time when he assumed somebody was dead, and it caused a real problem for him. True. And so this time, he's not gonna, it's not going to go that way. He, he's not going to let it go that way. Okay, so you, said assumed, you said assumed. You said assumed someone was dead. Yeah. That was Loden. Yeah, Loden. Yeah. But you're saying that there's still Loden's a dead. No, Loden's, Loden's alive. Loden okay. Loden made back. it, everybody. Anyway, Talking it's a good party. story. You're gonna like it. We're getting wrapped up. We got a lot to talk about. But wait, so so I mean, what about Burry? Should we should we should we tell him what happens to Burry? Uh, oh. I mean, <laughs> the the point of the story is Bell's looking for him. I don't know if we want to blow that. Okay. Yeah, we will find out on September. Yeah, you got to get the book. You got to get the book. Sorry. <laughs> All right, Kevin, how's it going? It's going well. It's going well. Um, Light in the Darkness is set just prior to Phase Three, and it stars Jedi Master Keeve Trennis, <laughs> who is on the edge of the Republic fighting an insurgent from another force on board her ship, the Geos. Lydia. Yes. <laughs> All right. So the call of Coruscant takes place right at the end of phase one um, after the, the, the fall of the uh, Starlight Beacon. And it actually has two new characters. So we have Master Lox and Padawan Amadeo Azazo. And they are getting called back to Coruscant for reasons. And you get to meet them for the first time. And you might be able to read more about them later. We'll see. And Alyssa. Uh, my story is called Rogue Element. I'm writing a brand new Jedi, um, a brand new mysterious masked vigilante, and Crash Angwa. Um, 
right after the events of Midnight Horizon. <laughs> All right, nothing, let's talk. Nothing happens in this book. None of <laughs> this these is, This book no, is no, huge. No, 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 no. It's got it all. Like, this is what you want. It's really good. Oh. And I will say just very quickly, um, Alyssa's story is actually in the Barnes & Noble edition uh, of the title. So just so everyone is aware. I also just want to make it known to Mr. Charles Soule that I have permission to badger you about Burry. <laughs> I'm sorry, you've commissioned a what? I have permission to badger you about Burry, because this is Burry Watch 2023. Yeah, well, okay. It's, uh, it's going to be good. Everybody's, we're going to be good, everybody. It's going to be great. All right, all right. Ugh. Let's talk about phase three. Hey. Now, Michael, what can you tell us? We've already revealed Alyssa's involvement and our YA stories, but I would like some more. All right, what can we say about phase three? Phase, uh, so... Context. We've said that the High Republic will have a story for everyone, and we still mean that, and we still strive for that. Uh, we said that uh, you can read any part of the story, or you can read all of it, uh, and you should still get a, a fulfilling and exciting experience from that. That is still true. Um, and we told you this is going to be big and epic, and that is still true, and that is especially true of Phase 3. So Phase 3 is called Trials of the Jedi. It begins this fall. It is set one year after the fall of Starlight Beacon. And the Jedi have been recalled to Coruscant, and the Nile have effectively won. Yeah, things get a little, a little worse for, uh, for our favorite heroes. Um, but since it's celebration, and since everyone is here, we've been so secretive for so long about this initiative that we thought it would be fun to pull the curtain back a little bit more and reveal the stuff that we've got coming up for Trials of the Jedi, specifically for the titles that we've got coming out uh, for wave one of the initiative, which again begins this fall. So uh, George, would you like to kick us off? I'll kick you off, I'll kick you off by saying, ride the storm. Yeah. So yeah, I'm writing the, the first adult novel of Phase 3. Um, it's a story about the triumph of Marky and Roe. Um, it's, it's got Avar and Elzar. Hey, hey, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> yeah, I better stop we're, we're, we're good, we're good. <laughs> All right, we're going to move over to Alyssa and Daniel. What are you working on? Yeah. Uh, two words. Ramalama, Jama Rama. <laughs> and then I'll let Alyssa, you know. We're going back to Valo, baby. I'm so excited. Um, we were going to get to meet a bunch of new kids, a bunch of new Jedi, perhaps. Um, and I, there's some other things I'm really excited to share with you, but um, I don't know if I'm allowed That's to. Prob it's probably pretty good. It's yeah. probably okay. <laughs> This is so hard for Mike. He's just sitting there going, they can't say a thing. <laughs> uh, well, and, 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 you know, since two of our uh, Luminous authors aren't here, I will take the next one again and say that uh, Tessa and Justina are once again reteaming for our first YA called Defy the Storm. And uh, I will say that Vernestra plays a, a critical role in this one. Avon plays a, a critical role in this one. And I wonder what happened. What happened to Emery? We never found out what happened to Emery. I this might go into that a little bit. Hey? I can't tell you what happened to Emery. <laughs> I hope he's okay. I really do. I don't know. Now let's talk about magazines and comics. Sure. Cap? Uh, first, I think we're going to go to... Lydia. Oh, Lydia, let's go. Hello. Hello, hi. So I am so excited. I'm going to be writing some of the serialized fiction in the Star Wars Insider magazine. So if you're not subscribed, you should subscribe now. And uh, I, yeah, I get to talk about some of the tales happening from the Nile air, uh, controlled areas, which is going to be um, pretty tense, but awesome. So that's what I'm doing. Check it out. Now, Kevin. Hello there. 
um, the High Republic Marvel comic. Yeah. Um, as I said, Keeve Trennis has had a bit of a battlefield promotion. She is now a master. She is helping the people of the Republic who are coping with an incursion from another major cartel who are taking advantage of what's going on. Maybe coming face to mask with a former Tempest runner. Um, and she's grieving, but she's grieving in a very Jedi way. Whereas Tarek. Yeah, uh, uh, okay. We're, we're good. All will be revealed. We're good. Sorry. <laughs> oh, Daniel, is there anything you'd like to add? The High Republic Adventure! <laughs> um, if you want to see the first art from this, you have to come to the Dark Horse panel tomorrow. Um, but I will say that Missing and Presumed did. <laughs> the search continues. That's all. Cool. <laughs> not cool. Cool, cool, cool. cool. Like, now, not cool. How about we not take cool. a look at all of our upcoming Wave 1 titles? Certainly. So. Huh. Wait a minute. To be yeah. right. What's that thing? Oh, we can't tell them everything. We just told them like 18 novels that, that was yeah. That was a lot of content. Um, but what you, what, come on, you guys got a lot of reveals here. Um, you're never going to, you're, you're not getting that one, trust me. It's a good one, though. But my point is, we are revealing a lot of content, but we are purposely not revealing everything because we still want you guys to be surprised down the line, right? What you will notice from the release schedule is that we are uh, moving everything out a little bit more, giving everyone a little more room to catch up if they do want to read everything, right? It was important for us to start the initiative with uh, as much content as we could. And now that we've established it, and now that we can fill a room this size, which is unbelievable and incredible, uh, we want to make sure that if you guys do want to read everything, that you have enough time to read everything. So we've shifted the novels, so there's a little more space in between them. And uh, the comics will be ongoing for both Marvel and Dark Horse. And you'll have uh, serialized content in Insider. And then you'll have things like that to be revealed, um, you know. You don't see I don't know, a comic miniseries on this slide. You don't see audio or manga or nonfiction. You're depressing. But, but wait, like... I'm not depressed. Look, all right, you want, you want. Michael. Yes. The wise prophet Britney Spears once said, <laughs> gimme, gimme more, gimme more, gimme, gimme more. All right, okay, all right. What do you think? You want, you want more? Yeah. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think they do. Uh, yeah, that's, so there's a lot of people out there. Can you um, do that again, one more time? But louder. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's all right, okay, all right, pretty so, clear. It's like being in the room with the Nile. It's like, you know. No, we are all the Republic, man. Hey, okay, good. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Ride it. All right, so uh, we've always said that we're playing the long game with High Republic. We've always said that everything's connected. So if you want more, how about we reveal all of the novels for the rest of phase three? <laughs> that work? Just do it. All right. Do it. So George kicks things off with the Eye of Darkness. And then Tessa is writing Temptation of the Force. And then Mr. Soul? I'm going to be writing Trials of the Jedi, uh, which is, is an, like, it feels incredible to have started this with Light of the Jedi, and then I'm going to be, be finishing, I mean, not finishing, finishing, but, but, you know, bookending it with Trials of the Jedi. Uh, it's an incredible... You know, it feels like an incredible responsibility. What a privilege. I'm extremely thrilled about it. Um, I'm in particular thrilled because, Christina, you know I have a, you mentioned it before, you know I have a legal background, right? Yes. Right. So I figured it was time to bring that in. And so Trials of the Jedi, they're going to open a law firm, you guys. <laughs> Woo! Yeah. That's what you want. I know you. Actually, no, they don't do that. Um, it, is, it is the payoff to, to everything 
you've been you've been so excited about for years. The journey that we've all been going on is going to be, you know, in wave three of of the high, of phase three of the High Republic. You're going to get everything you want, everything we've been building to. It's really beautiful, uh, and we can't wait to see what you think. I wish spring 2025 were right now. Not really. Not we're, we're not yet, done. But... We're not done. I haven't written the book yet, but but we're getting there. We're getting there. So there you go. Hi, Michael. Hi, Christina. What you doing? Nothing. How's it going? You want to make them more happy? Sure. How about, how about all of our young adult novels? So again, we kick things off with Tessa and Justina with Defy the Storm, and then Mr. Mann. Tears of the Nameless. Um, I don't know which I can really say about this, but you know, there's some nameless in it, perhaps. Um, Do they cry? <laughs> there's going to be a lot of tears, put it that okay, way. Okay, fair enough. It is the High Republic after all, so. And. Oh, right. So, Claudia. <laughs> Come on, Mike. Is writing Into the Light, which will be our final YA of, uh, of this initiative. I want you to insert you the Kylo one, gift one, here. I, more! One more? Okay. Uh, so, our middle grade novels. So, you've already heard. Daniel and Alyssa are teaming up for Escape from Ballow. Uh, Tessa will be writing, excuse me, Zoraida will be writing uh, Beware the Nameless. And then Justina returns with a valiant vow. Um, so the, the nice thing about this is that there is some, some, first of all, this is it, right? These are all of our novels through uh, uh, spring, summer 25. Um, and all of the folks who started it are ending it with the exact same formats. So Charles started it with Light of the Jedi, you're ending it with the uh, Trials of the Jedi, and so on and so forth. Uh, Cav and Daniel are still writing the comics throughout all of this, so lots and lots and lots of content to come. Well, we said there were a lot of reveals. Michael, you guys, is there anything is there anything you want to say to the fans that are here today that came from all parts of the world? I'll start this. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. We, uh, everyone on this stage and everyone that you don't see here, everyone back at Lucasfilm, um, from Story Group to uh, 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 folks in the art department, Troy Alders, Phil Shostak, Pablo, Matt, Emily, everybody, Really, Kelsey, they all go above and beyond. The whole editorial team, all of our partners at Marvel, at Dark Horse, at, at Titan, at Viz. Um, we really do this for, for all of you. This means the world to us. We do not take any of this lightly. Um, being able to be in a room this size and fill it for folks that, as Cav was saying to me earlier, these are people who read books and comics. And it's amazing. It's amazing. So, you know, thank you to all of you. Thank you to everybody back at the, at the office, certainly to Kathy. Um, truly, truly, truly incredible. So I'll shut up now. Somebody else talk. I, 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 what he said, you are amazing. I also want to say we have to shout out Mike. He is incredible. Absolutely. He, he is the hardest working man in this whole industry. He is killing it. And this is happening because of his hard work. And you have to understand how much he does and how much love he puts into this. It's amazing. Thank you, Daniel. That was very kind. And Anybody I'm else want to chime in? I, Charles? I, well, no, let Lydia go. Lydia, I talk all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say, as one of the newer members of the High Republic, to thank you, everybody in the High Republic family, you guys have been amazing and wonderful and brilliant. I'm sure Alyssa's feeling the same way right now, and thank you guys so much, and thank you. They told me the fans were amazing, and they did not lie. You guys are amazing. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. So, so I'll talk now, though, if you want. Go, um, go, go, please. So the, the thing about this uh, that I think you know, because many of you, like, you know, 
talk to us on social media or, or you sort of see how we are together. Like a big part of this initiative has not just been the stories, but it's, it's kind of been, been us too. And not just for the way we present ourselves to you, but the way that we are together. And, and this group up here, like we were so excited not just to be in front of you, but to be together here because we would get to spend time together. And, and that is true of, of you know, the original folks, it's true of the, the, the newer folks, like all of it. Like we, we kind of love each other and it's a, it's a beautiful thing. Uh, and so the fact that it's reflected when we're in a room like this and we all really are all in this, we really are all the Republic, if that's not the cheesiest thing in the world, I don't think it is because it's true. So, so that's what this feels like to us here and here. And so that's what I'm really grateful for because this is special, you don't get this in, in creative careers all the time. This is really unique, so thank you so much. And this is just the beginning. Let's be honest, this is the beginning, and again, like I said earlier, it's because of this fandom. There are so many things we wanna do with the High Republic, so many platforms and creators that are diving in and seeing the potential and, and wanting to carve out new spaces and tell new stories. It, so this is, this is just the start. I'm just excited. When we get to these last books, and then people get the chance to look back at all the books and realize the things that have been dropped along the way, oh, you know, and, yeah. and, and the things that have been dropped along the way, which won't mean anything at the end of these books. <laughs> <laughs> That's enough, Cav. <laughs> I also just want to say, Christina Ariel! Oh, yes. yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. The face of the High Republic! I love you guys so much. I love you guys so much. The community, all of you, the hugs I've gotten this weekend, the tweets that you guys send every day, the conversations that we have, they don't go unnoticed. You guys mean so much to all of us, and we are so grateful for the heart that you put into this community. The people are at home. We adore you, we, you are with us in spirit. We are just so grateful for the family that we have in the High Republic. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Oh. Oh, well, it's never the end. The future of the High Republic is, oh no, Dr. Kang. Oh. <laughs> the future of the High Republic is gonna be epic. Panelists, is there anything else you'd like to add? Can we show one more teaser? Oh, please. So the trials begin. I told you it wasn't good for the Jedi. The trials Fire begin. And yes, Ember survived. <laughs> We're not gonna tell you who those other Jedi are. You're gonna have to figure that one out on your own. Is one of them Buryaka? You gotta ask Charles. You gotta ask Charles. You can't ask Charles because he's not gonna <laughs> tell me. Uh, I'll just send you the story, okay? I'll email you the story. Oh, yeah, I like that. All right. I'll take that. So that's a wrap for our panel. That's a wrap thank for the Thank you for all the incredible content. Thank you to everyone who has read, supported the initiative, and thank you to everyone watching at home for joining us. For Light and Life! What a way to end the second day of Star Wars Celebration Europe. Jamie, what were some of your favorite things that you saw today? The panels, of course, and also I've been spending a lot of time walking the hall, stopping at the various booths, chatting to fans, not fans of me, but fans of Star Wars, of course, and also we had an Ahsoka cosplay gathering at the steps, which was oh, pretty cool. That's cosplay's wonderful. Cosplay's amazing. Yeah, that gathering is always huge, and it's wonderful to see. How about you, Kristen? I got a hug from Andy Serkis, and that was a pretty great moment for me. Pretty great moment. A gem of a human being, a wonderful interview subject. Lovely, lovely. And then I just met Dennis Lawson, now Amazing. an old friend. It's, it's been a good two days. Absolute legend. Great time. What about for you, Anthony? Oh, I mean, speaking of legend, I don't mean to brag, but I, I, did, get, I did get to talk to Ming-Na Wen, which is something I've been wanting to do for a very long time. Oh my gosh. I thought you were gonna say Anthony Daniels there. That's what I thought the next one oh, was. Oh, no, no, no. That would not be the answer ever. Uh, but hey, 
we left people hanging. We left like people hanging that. about a poll. It's time for the poll results. Get excited for poll results. Yeah! There it is. There it is. Earlier today, we asked you what you would rather catch a ride on. A Blurg, an Eopi, a Tauntaun, or a Bantha. And 43.5% of you said Bantha, which was the correct answer. You'll all be receiving your prizes in the mail, followed closely by the Tauntaun at 37.9%. Pulling up the rear, Eopi and Blurg. Now, if you missed your chance to vote on this one, we're gonna have another poll going up tomorrow for your voting pleasure. Thank you so much for watching. We'll be back tomorrow with day three of Star Wars Celebration Live presented by Star Wars Jedi Survivor. May the Force, the force be with you. With you.